Harper Collins and Harper Audio present How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom by Matt Ridley. Read for you by the author. Introduction The Infinite Improbability Drive. Innovation offers the carrot of spectacular reward or the stick of destitution. Joseph Schumpeter I am walking along a path on the Inner Farn, an island off the coast of northeast England. By the side of the path, amid the sea campion flowers, sits a female eider duck, dark brown and broody, silently incubating her clutch of eggs. I stoop to take a picture of her with my iPhone from a few feet away. She's used to this. Hundreds of visitors come here every day in summer, and many will take her picture. For some reason, an idea pops into my head as I click. A riff on the second law of thermodynamics, based on a remark by my friend John Constable. The idea is this. The electricity in the iPhone's battery and the warmth in the Eiderduck's body are doing roughly the same thing, making improbable order, photographs, ducklings, by expending or converting energy. And then I think that the idea I've just had itself, like the Eider duck and the iPhone, is also an improbable arrangement of synaptic activity in my brain, also fueled by energy from the food I have recently eaten, of course, but made possible by the underlying order of the brain, itself the evolved product of millennia of natural selection acting on individuals, each of whose own improbabilities were sustained by energy conversion. Improbable arrangements of the world, crystallized consequences of energy generation, are what both life and technology are all about. In Douglas Adams's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Zaphod Beeblebrox's starship Heart of Gold, a metaphor for wealth, is powered by a fictional infinite improbability drive. Yet a near infinite improbability drive does indeed exist, but here on planet Earth, in the shape of the process of innovation. Innovations come in many forms, but one thing they all have in common, and which they share with biological innovations created by evolution, is that they are enhanced forms of improbability. That is to say, innovations, be they iPhones, ideas, or Ida ducklings, are all unlikely improbable combinations of atoms and digital bits of information. It is astronomically improbable that the atoms in an iPhone would be neatly arranged by chance into millions of transistors and liquid crystals, or the atoms in an Ida duckling would be arranged to form blood vessels and downy feathers, or the firings of neurons in my brain would be arranged in such a pattern that they can, and sometimes do, represent the concept of the second law of thermodynamics. Innovation, like evolution, is a process of constantly discovering ways of rearranging the world into forms that are unlikely to arise by chance, and that happen to be useful. The resulting entities are the opposite of entropy. They are more ordered, less random, than their ingredients were before. And innovation is potentially infinite, because even if it runs out of new things to do, it can always find ways to do the same things more quickly, or for less energy. In this universe, it is compulsory, under the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy cannot be reversed locally unless there is a source of energy, which is necessarily supplied by making something else even less ordered somewhere else. So the entropy of the whole system increases. The power of the improbability drive is therefore limited only by the supply of energy. So long as human beings apply energy to the world in careful ways, they can create ever more ingenious and improbable structures. The medieval castle at Dunstanborough, I can see from the island, is an improbable structure, and its partial ruin after 700 years is more probable, more entropic. The castle in its prime was the direct consequence of the expenditure of lots of energy, 
in this case mainly in the muscles of masons who were fed with bread and cheese that was made from wheat and grass that was grown in sunlight and eaten by cows. John Constable, a former Cambridge and Kyoto academic, points out that the things we rely on to make our lives prosperous are, all of them without exception, physical states far from thermodynamic equilibrium, and the world was brought, sometimes over long periods of time, into these convenient configurations by energy conversion, the use of which reduced entropy in one corner of the universe, ours, and increased it by an even larger margin somewhere else. The more ordered and improbable our world becomes, the richer we become, and as a consequence, the more disordered the universe becomes overall. Innovation, then, means finding new ways to apply energy to create improbable things and see them catch on. It means much more than invention, because the word implies developing an invention to the point where it catches on because it is sufficiently practical, affordable, reliable and ubiquitous to be worth using. The Nobel Prize-winning economist Edmund Phelps defines an innovation as a new method or new product that becomes a new practice somewhere in the world. In the pages that follow, I will trace the path of ideas from the invention to the innovation, through the long struggle to get an idea to catch on, usually by combining it with other ideas. And here is my starting point. Innovation is the most important fact about the modern world, but one of the least well understood. It is the reason most people today live lives of prosperity and wisdom compared with their ancestors, the overwhelming cause of the great enrichment of the past few centuries, the simple explanation of why the incidence of extreme poverty is in global freefall for the first time in history, from 50% of the world population to 9% in my lifetime. What made most of us, not just in the West, but in China and Brazil too, unprecedentedly rich, so the economic historian Deirdre McCloskey says, was innovationism, the habit of applying new ideas to raising living standards. No other explanation of the great enrichment of recent centuries makes any sense. Trade had been expanding for centuries and colonial exploitation with it, and these alone were unable to give anything like the order of magnitude of improvement in incomes that happened. There was no sufficient accumulation of capital to make such a difference, no piling of brick on brick or bachelor's degree on bachelor's degree, in McCloskey's words. There was no sufficiently great expansion in the availability of labour, nor was the scientific revolution of Galileo and Newton responsible. For most of the innovations that changed people's lives, at least at first, owed little to new scientific knowledge, and few of the innovators who drove the changes were trained scientists. Indeed, many, such as Thomas Newcomen, the inventor of the steam engine, or Richard Arkwright of the textile revolution, or George Stevenson of the railways, were poorly educated men of humble origins. Much innovation preceded the science that underpinned it, the Industrial Revolution, therefore, was in effect, as Phelps has argued, the emergence of a new kind of economic system that generated endogenous innovation as a product in itself. I will argue that some machines themselves made this possible. A steam engine proved to be autocatalytic. It drained the mines, which cut the cost of coal, which made the next machine cheaper and easier to make. But I am getting ahead of myself. The word innovation is invoked with alarming frequency by companies trying to sound up to date, but with little or no systematic idea about how it occurs. The surprising truth is that nobody really knows why innovation happens and how it happens, let alone when and where it will happen next. One economic historian, Angus Madison, wrote that technical progress is the most essential characteristic of modern growth and one that is most difficult to quantify or explain. Another, Joel Mokia, said that scholars know remarkably little about the kind of institutions that foster and stimulate technological progress. Take sliced bread, for example. Best thing since and all that. Looking back, 
it is obvious that someone would invent a way of automatically pre-slicing bread to make uniform sandwiches. It is fairly obvious that this would probably happen in the first half of the 20th century, when electrical machines were all the rage for the first time. But why 1928? And why in the small town of Chillicothe, in the middle of Missouri? Lots of people tried to make bread slicing machines, but they either worked poorly or they led to stale bread because it was not well packaged. The person who made it work was Otto Frederick Rowedder, who was born in Iowa, was educated as an optician in Chicago, and set up shop as a jeweller in St. Joseph, Missouri, before moving back to Iowa, determined, for some reason, to invent a bread slicer. He lost his first prototype in a fire in 1917, and had to start all over again. Crucially, he realised that he must invent automatic packaging of the bread at the same time, lest the slices go stale. Most bakeries were not interested, but the Chillicothe Bakery, owned by one Frank Bench, was, and the rest is history. What was special about Missouri? Beyond a general mid-20th century American affection for innovation and the means to make it happen, the best guess is that it was a slice of random luck. Serendipity plays a big part in innovation, which is why liberal economies, with their free-roving experimental opportunities, do so well. They give luck a chance. Innovation happens when people are free to think, experiment and speculate. It happens when people can trade with each other. It happens where people are relatively prosperous, not desperate. It is somewhat contagious. It needs investment. It generally happens in cities, and so on. But do we really understand it? What is the best way to encourage innovation? To set targets, direct research, subsidize science, write rules and standards? Or to back off from all this, deregulate, set people free? Or to create property rights in ideas, offer patents and hand out prizes, issue medals? To fear the future or to be full of hope? you will find champions of all these policies and more, fervently arguing their case. But the striking thing about innovation is how mysterious it still is. No economist or social scientist can fully explain why innovation happens, let alone why it happens when and where it does. In this book, I shall try to tackle this great puzzle. I will do so not by abstract theorising or argument alone, though there will be some of both, but mainly by telling stories. Let the innovators who turn their or other people's inventions into useful innovations teach us, by the examples of their successes and failures, how it happened. I tell the stories of steam engines and search engines, of vaccines and vaping, of shipping containers and silicon chips, of wheeled suitcases and gene editing, of numbers and water closets. Let's hear from Thomas Edison and Guglielmo Marconi, from Thomas Newcomen and Gordon Moore, from Lady Mary Wortley Montague and Pearl Kendrick, from Al Quarizmi and Grace Hopper, from James Dyson and Jeff Bezos. I cannot hope to document every important innovation. I have omitted some very important and well-known ones for no particular reason the automation of the textile industry, for example, or the history of the limited company. I've left out most innovation in art, music and literature. My main examples are drawn from the worlds of energy, public health, transport, food, low technology and computers and communications. Not all the people whose stories I tell are heroes. Some are frauds, fakers or failures. Few worked alone, for innovation is a team sport, a collective enterprise, far more than is generally realised. Credit and authorship are confused and mysterious, if not downright unfair. Yet unlike most team sports, innovation is not usually a choreographed, planned or managed thing. It cannot be easily predicted, as many a red-faced forecaster has discovered. It runs mostly on trial and error the human version of natural selection. And it usually stumbles on great breakthroughs when looking for something else. It is heavily serendipitous. 
I will plunge back in time to the very start of human culture to try to understand what triggered innovation in the first place and why it happens to people but not to robins or rocks. Chimpanzees and crows do innovate by developing and spreading new cultural habits, but very occasionally and rather slowly, and most other animals not at all. In the ten years since I published The Rational Optimist, arguing unfashionably that the world has been, is, and will go on getting better, not worse, human living standards have grown rapidly higher for nearly everybody. I finished that book as the world was plumbing the depths of a terrible recession. But the years since have been ones of faster economic growth for much of the poor of the world than ever before. The income of the average Ethiopian has doubled in a decade. The number of people living in extreme poverty has dipped below 10% for the first time in history. Malaria mortality has plummeted. War has ceased altogether in the Western Hemisphere and become much rarer in the Old World too. Frugal LED lights have replaced both incandescent and fluorescent bulbs. Telephone conversations have essentially become free on Wi-Fi. Some things have got worse, of course, but most trends are positive. All this is due to innovation. The chief way in which innovation changes our lives is by enabling people to work for each other. As I have argued before, the main theme of human history is that we become steadily more specialised in what we produce and steadily more diversified in what we consume. We move away from precarious self-sufficiency to safer mutual interdependence. By concentrating on serving other people's needs for 40 hours a week, which we call a job, you can spend the other 72 hours, not counting 56 hours in bed, drawing upon the services provided to you by other people. Innovation has made it possible to work for a fraction of a second so as to be able to afford to turn on an electric lamp for an hour, providing the quantity of light that would have required a whole day's work if you had to make it yourself, by collecting and refining sesame oil or lamb fat to burn in a simple lamp, as much of humanity did in the not-so-distant past. Most innovation is a gradual process. The modern obsession with disruptive innovation, a phrase coined by the Harvard professor Clayton Christensen in 1995, is misleading. Even when a new technology does upend an old one, as digital media has done to newspapers, The effect begins very slowly, gathers pace gradually, and works by increments, not leaps and bounds. Innovation often disappoints in its early years, only to exceed expectations once it gets going, a phenomenon I call the Amara hype cycle after Roy Amara, who first said that we underestimate the impact of innovation in the long run, but overestimate it in the short run. Perhaps the most puzzling aspect of innovation is how unpopular it is for all the lip service we pay to it. Despite the abundant evidence that it has transformed almost everybody's lives for the better in innumerable ways, the knee-jerk reaction of most people to something new is often worry, sometimes even disgust. Unless it is of obvious use to ourselves, we tend to imagine the bad consequences that might occur far more than the good ones and we throw obstacles in the way of innovators on behalf of those with a vested interest in the status quo, investors, managers and employees alike. History shows that innovation is a delicate and vulnerable flower, easily crushed underfoot, but quick to regrow if conditions allow. This strange phenomenon of innovation and the resistance to it was eloquently celebrated more than three centuries ago, before the start of the Great Enrichment, by an innovator, though he would not have used that word. William Petty went from being a teenage cabin boy on a ship who was marooned on a foreign shore with a broken leg, to getting a Jesuit education and becoming secretary to the philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Then, following a spell in Holland, he began a career as a physician and scientist, before emerging as a merchant, an Irish land speculator, a member of parliament, then a wealthy and politically influential pioneer of the study of economics. 
He was a better innovator than inventor. Early in his career, while a professor of anatomy in Oxford in 1647, Petty invented and patented a double writing instrument by which he could produce two copies of the first chapter of Hebrews in one go in 15 minutes, as well as a scheme for making a bridge with no supports on the riverbed and an engine for planting corn. None of them seemed to catch on. With feeling, Petty later wrote this lament about the lot of the inventor in 1662. Few new inventions were ever rewarded by a monopoly. For although the inventor, oftentimes drunk with the opinion of his own merit, thinks all the world will encroach and invade upon him, yet I have observed that the generality of men will scarce be hired to make use of the new substances which themselves have not thoroughly tried, and which length of time hath not vindicated from latent inconvenience. So as when a new invention is first propounded, in the beginning every man objects, and the poor inventor runs the gaunt loop of all petulant wits, every man finding his several flaw, no man approving it unless mended according to his own device. Now not one of a hundred outlives this torture, and those that do are at length so changed by the various contrivances of others that not any one man can pretend to the invention of the whole, nor well agree about their respective share in the parts. And moreover, this commonly is so long a doing that the poor inventor is either dead or disabled by the debts contracted to pursue his design, and withal railed upon as a projector or worse by those who joined their money in partnership with his wit, so as the said inventor and his pretenses are wholly lost as vanished. Chapter 1. Energy Whenever you see a successful business, someone once made a courageous decision. Peter Drucker Of Heat, Work and Light Perhaps the most important event in the history of humankind, I would argue, happened somewhere in northwest Europe, sometime around 1700, and was achieved by somebody or somebodies, probably French or English, but we may never know who. Why so vague? At the time, nobody would have noticed or realised its significance, and innovation was anyway a little valued thing. There is confusion too about whose contribution among several candidates mattered most. And it was a gradual, stumbling change with no eureka moment. These features are typical of innovation. The event I am talking about is the first controlled conversion of heat to work the key breakthrough that made the Industrial Revolution possible, if not inevitable, and hence led to the prosperity of the modern world and the stupendous flowering of technology today. Here I use the word work in its more colloquial sense as controlled and energetic movement rather than in the broader way physicists define it. I am writing this on a laptop powered by electricity aboard a train also powered by electricity and with the help of electric light. Most of that electricity is coming down wires from a power station in which enormous turbines are being spun at high speed by steam generated by the burning of gas or boiled by the heat of nuclear fission. The purpose of a power station is to turn the heat of combustion into the pressure of water expanding into steam and thence into the movement of the blades of the turbine, which moves inside an electromagnet to create the movement of electrons in wires. Something similar happens inside the engine of a car or a plane. Combustion causes pressure which causes movement. Virtually all the gigantic amounts of energy that go into making my life and yours happen come from the conversion of heat to work. Before 1700, there were two main kinds of energy used by human beings, heat and work. Light came mainly from heat. People burned wood or coal to keep warm and cook food, and they used their muscles, or those of horses and oxen, or rarely a water wheel or a windmill, to move things, to do work. These two kinds of energy were separate. Wood and coal did no mechanical work. Wind, water and oxen did no warming. A few years later, 
albeit initially on a small scale, steam was turning heat into work, and the world would never be the same again. The first practical device for doing this was the Newcomen engine, and Thomas Newcomen therefore is my first and most promising candidate for the innovator of the heat-to-work transition. Notice I do not call him an inventor. The difference is crucial. We possess no portrait of Newcomen, and he's buried in an unmarked grave somewhere in Islington, North London, where he died in 1729. Not far away, though again we do not know where, lies the unmarked grave of one of his rivals and a possible source of his inspiration, Denis Papin, who simply faded from view around 1712 as a pauper in London. Only slightly more favourably treated by his own world was Thomas Savory, who died in 1715 in nearby Westminster. These three men, neighbours for a few years and near contemporaries, Papin was born in 1647, Savory probably around 1650, and Newcomen in 1663, all played crucial roles in the heat-to-work transition, but they may never have met. They were not the first to notice that steam has the power to move things, of course. Toys built to exploit this principle were used in ancient Greece and Rome. And from time to time, throughout the centuries, clever engineers would build devices to use steam to push water about for fountains in gardens or some such trick. But it was Papin who first began to dream of harnessing this power for practical purposes rather than entertainment. Savory, who turned a similar dream into a machine, albeit one that proved impractical, and Newcomen, who made a practical machine that actually made a difference. Or so goes the conventional narrative. Dig deeper and it gets more confusing. Was the French Papin robbed by one or both the Britons? Did Savory or Newcomen pinch his insights from the other? Was Papin perhaps inspired by Savory as much as the other way round? And was Newcomen even aware of the work of the other two? Although he died in the most obscurity, Denis Papin was the star in terms of intellect and fame in his lifetime. He worked with many of the great scientists of the age. Born in Blois, on the Loire, he studied medicine at university. He was recruited by the great Dutch natural philosopher and president of the Academy of Sciences in Paris, Christian Huygens, as one of his assistants in 1672, along with another clever young man destined for even greater renown, Gottfried Leibniz. Three years later, Papin found himself exiled in London to escape anti-Protestant persecution in Louis XIV's France. There, presumably with an introduction from Huygens, he became Robert Boyle's assistant, working on an air pump. Robert Hooke then hired him briefly before Papin left for Venice, where he spent three years as a curator of a scientific society, before returning to London in 1684 to do the same job for the Royal Society. Somewhere along the line, he invented the pressure cooker for softening bones. By 1688, he had become a professor of mathematics at the University of Marburg, before moving to Kassel in 1695. There is either a sense of restlessness or that nobody could stand his company for very long. Huygens had employed Papin to explore the idea of a machine driven by a vacuum created by the explosion of gunpowder in a cylinder, an idea that is distantly ancestral to the internal combustion engine. But he soon realised that the condensing of steam might work better. Sometime between 1690 and 1695, he even built a simple piston and cylinder in which steam could condense on cooling, causing the piston to plunge, thereby lifting a weight by a pulley. He had discovered the principle of the atmospheric engine in which it is the weight of the atmosphere that does the work once a vacuum has been created under the piston. It is a machine that sucks rather than blows. In the summer of 1698, Leibniz exchanged letters with Papin about the latter's designs for engines that could raise water by the use of fire. Pumping water out of mines was the chief problem to be solved. 
for it was the one place where horses were difficult to use and where fuel was abundant. Wet mines were safer than dry ones because the fire risk was lower, but flooding kept foiling the miners. Yet Papa was already dreaming of powering boats by steam. I believe that this invention can be used for many other things besides raising water, he wrote to Leibniz. In regard to travel by water, I would flatter myself to reach this goal quickly enough if I could find more support. The idea was that steam from a boiler would push a piston, ejecting water through a pipe onto a paddle wheel. The piston then returned through a combination of new water being readmitted to the piston chamber and the condensation of the steam. In 1707, Papa actually built a boat with a paddle wheel, though he does not seem to have got it working by steam, but by manpower instead, to demonstrate the superiority of paddle wheels over oars. He trundled down the River Vesa in it on the way to England. The professional boatman took umbrage at this competition and destroyed the craft, Luddites before Lud. The historian L.T.C. Rolt concludes that Papin could have done more than he did. Tantalizingly, having reached the very brink of practical success, the brilliant Papin turned aside. He returned to steam when Leibniz told him about Thomas Savory's patent on the use of fire for raising water, a patent granted in 1698 on the very day that Papin boasted to Leibniz that he knew how to make such a machine. Papin then built a different steam engine, which, from the diagram he drew, is clearly a modified version of a savoury engine. Yet it is surely possible that Savory had heard of Papin's designs from the various letters Papin sent to former colleagues at the Royal Society, though his machine is quite distinct from Papin's. Who was copying whom? The coincidence of timing is strange, but quite characteristic of inventors. Again and again, simultaneous invention marks the progress of technology, as if there is something ripe about the moment. It does not necessarily imply plagiarism. In this case, the combination of better metalworking, more interest in mining, and a scientific fascination with vacuums had come together in northwestern Europe to make a rudimentary steam engine almost inevitable. Captain Savory may have been a military engineer, or the rank may have been an honorary one, but he is almost as mysterious a figure as Newcomen. There is no portrait of him, and the date of his birth is unknown. Like Newcomen, he came from Devon. What we do know is that on the 25th of July, 1698, the very day that Papin wrote to Leibniz about designing steamships, Savory was granted a 14-year patent on raising water by the impellent force of fire. The next year, the patent was extended for 21 more years till 1733, a rich gift to Savory's undeserving heirs, as it turned out. Savory's machine worked as follows. A copper boiler over a fire sent steam into a water-filled tank called a receiver where it expelled the water up a brass pipe through a non-return valve. Once the receiver was full of steam, the supply from the boiler was shut off, and the receiver was sprayed with cold water, collapsing the steam inside and creating a vacuum. This sucked water up from below through a different pipe, and the cycle began again. In 1699, Savory demonstrated a version at the Royal Society with two receivers, and at some point he seems to have partly automated the mechanism of a combined valve that could fill either receiver, so the thing worked continuously. In 1702, an advertisement said Savory's demonstration model could be inspected at his workhouse in Salisbury Court, London, against the old playhouse, where it may be seen working on Wednesdays and Saturdays in every week from three to six in the afternoon. He certainly sold some to the nobility, and he installed one at York Buildings, now just off the Strand but then on the banks of the Thames, where London got water from the river. But it was a failure. Mine owners were not interested. It raised water only a short distance, needed far too much coal to fuel it, leaked from its joints, and blew up too easily. Failure is often the father of success and innovation. 
By 1708, Papin, presumably having crossed the channel in a conventional sailing craft rather than his own paddle boat, was in London, hoping to get support to build his steamboat. We do not know if he met Savory. His hopes of being recognised as the genius of steam in England were quickly dashed. His increasingly desperate letters to Hans Sloan, Sir Isaac Newton's secretary at the Royal Society, fell on deaf ears. That he was a friend of Leibniz hardly helped. Newton's furious feud with Leibniz over who invented the calculus, they both did, but Leibniz's version was neater, was at its height, and no doubt had poisoned poor Papin's reputation by association at the Royal Society. There are at least six of my papers that have been read in meetings of the Royal Society, and are not mentioned in the register. Certainly, sir, I am a sad case, wrote Papin to Sloane in January 1712. After that, nothing more is heard from him. He just fades away, and historians assume that he must have died that year, too poor to leave a will or a record of burial. Savory would die three years later, less obscurely, but hardly a national hero. He left behind one important legacy, his patent on using fire to raise water, which would force Newcomen to partner with Savory's heirs for many years. So it is that neither of these men of science, wearing their long wigs as they mixed with grandees, managed to change the world. That was left to a humble blacksmith from Dartmouth in Devon, Thomas Newcomen. He was an ironmonger, which in those days meant something more like an engineer or a blacksmith, who went into business with a glazier or plumber, John Calley, in 1685. Beyond that, we know almost nothing of how he arrived at his fully-fledged design of a steam engine in 1712, the year that Papin died. Over the centuries, many historians, reluctant to believe that a humble blacksmith could have succeeded where cerebral professors failed, have postulated ways in which Papin's and Savory's ideas could have reached Newcomen, including a conspiracy theory once popular in France that somebody handed Newcomen some of Papin's letters to Sloan. There is also speculation that he saw a Savory machine in a Cornish tin mine, but none of this has stood up to careful scrutiny and it remains possible that he knew nothing of the work of the London savants. Indeed, one source insists that he was at work on his first designs before 1698, the year of Savory's patent and Papin's letter to Leibniz. That source, the only one who actually knew Newcomen, was a Swede named Morten Trevolt. He worked with Newcomen and Cali and then built several early engines in Newcastle before taking the technology back to Sweden. He describes Newcomen as experimenting with steam for a long time before getting a workable machine, and he identifies an accidental breakthrough when the injection of cold water into the cylinder was discovered. For ten consecutive years, Mr Newcomen worked at this fire machine which never would have exhibited the desired effect unless Almighty God had caused a lucky incident to take place. It happened, at the last attempt to make the model work, that a more than wished-for effect was suddenly caused by the following strange event. The cold water, which was allowed to flow into a lead case embracing the cylinder, pierced through an imperfection which had been mended with tin solder. The heat of the steam caused the tin solder to melt and thus opened a way for the cold water, which rushed into the cylinder and immediately condensed the steam, creating such a vacuum that the weight attached to the little beam, which was supposed to represent the weight of the water in the pumps, proved to be so insufficient that the air, which pressed with a tremendous power on the piston, caused its chain to break and the piston to crush the bottom of the cylinder as well as the lid of the small boiler. The hot water which flowed everywhere thus convinced even the very senses of the onlookers that they had discovered an incomparably powerful force which had hitherto been entirely unknown in nature. Newcomen's design collapsed the steam in a cylinder by means of this cold water injection and it transmitted the energy of the vacuum collapsing under the weight of the atmosphere via a piston and a beam lever to a pump, 
a mechanism safer and stronger than in Savory's design. It is probable that some full-scale versions were first built in Cornish tin mines near where Newcomen worked, but no firm evidence has survived. The first working Newcomen engine in the world that we know of, for certain, was built in 1712 near Dudley Castle in Warwickshire. According to Trevald, it could pump 10 gallons of water 12 times a minute, lifting the water 150 feet out of the coal mine. An engraving of it by Thomas Barney in 1719 shows the beautiful complexity of the machine, in sharp contrast, Rolt argues, to Savory's crude pump or the scientific toys of Papin. He goes on, Seldom in the history of a technology has so momentous an invention been developed by one man so rapidly to so developed a form. Yet at first it was a horribly inefficient device. A Newcomen engine is, by today's standards, a monster. The size of a small house, it smokes and clanks and hisses ponderously, wasting about 99% of the energy in its coal fire. It would be decades before the separate condenser of James Watt, the flywheel and drive shaft, and other improvements, turned it into something that could be of use in any field other than coal mining, where fuel was cheap. I have a personal connection to this story. My ancestor, named Nicholas Ridley, got into the mining business around the end of the 1600s. Leaving a farm in the South Tyne Valley in Northumberland, he became a partner in a lead mining business and tried to smelt silver from the lead ore. He then moved to Newcastle and somehow got into coal mining. By the time of his death in 1711, he was a prosperous coal merchant and mine owner on the north bank of the Tyne and mayor of the town, then the third largest in England. His son Richard ran the mines in a buccaneering fashion, gaining a reputation as the stormy petrol of the coal trade for his propensity to get into fights and break price-fixing cartels, even trying to murder a rival at one point while the second son, Nicholas, seems to have been mostly in London, presumably receiving and marketing the coal. Coal supplied half of England's energy as early as 1700. The younger Nicholas recruited the teenage Sam Calley, son of Newcomen's partner John, to come north and build an engine at Biker, probably around 1715 or 1716. This might have been the third or fourth such machine in the world, if the engineer John Smeaton is to be believed. The Ridleys paid an enormous £400 a year in royalty to Savory's heirs to be allowed to use this design, and laid out around £1,000 on building the first engine. This was to drain a mine whose flooding had ruined two previous owners. We know this because Nicholas Jr. persuaded Newcomen's friend Morton Trevald to go north and oversee the youthful Cali. The Swede left an account of his dealing with the Ridley brothers. With the success of the first one, the Ridleys ordered more engines built, and by 1733, when the Savory patent expired, there were two at Biker, three at Heaton, one at Jesmond, and one at South Gosforth. I like to think that Richard and Nicholas Ridley must have met Newcomen. The Newcomen steam engine was the mother of the modern world, ushering in an era when technology could begin to amplify the work of people into fantastic productivity, freeing more and more people from the drudgery of the plough, the scullery and the workhouse. It is a key innovation, yet the way that it emerged is mysteriously obscure. Was it because of the advance of science in Britain and France, exemplified by Denis Papin? Perhaps a bit, but Newcomen apparently knew nothing of that. Was it because of improvements in metallurgy in the late 17th century so that large brass cylinders and pistons could now be built? Partly. Was it because of the dramatic expansion of the coal mining industry driven by the rising price of wood as British forests shrank and with it the demand for pumping equipment, to some extent? Was it because of the expansion of trade in Northwest Europe, begun by the Dutch and leading to the creation of capital investment and entrepreneurs. Surely, yes, in part. But why did these conditions not come together in China, or Venice, or Egypt, or Bengal, 
or Amsterdam or some other trading hub. And why in 1712 rather than 1612 or 1812? Innovation seems so obvious in retrospect, but is impossible to predict at the time. What what wrought? In 1763, a skilled and practical Scottish instrument maker by the name of James Watt was asked to mend a model Newcomen engine belonging to the University of Glasgow. The thing barely worked. In trying to understand what was wrong, Watt realised something about Newcomen engines in general that should have been spotted much earlier. Three quarters of the energy of the steam was being wasted in reheating the cylinder during each cycle after it had been cooled with injected water to condense the steam. Watt had the simple idea of using a separate condenser, so that the cylinder could be kept hot while the steam was drawn off for condensing in a cooler container. At a stroke, he had improved the efficiency of the steam engine, though as usual it took months of work to get the metal working right to make his ideas into practical devices. After demonstrating the principle in a small test engine, Watt went into partnership with first John Roebuck to acquire a patent and then the entrepreneur Matthew Bolton to build full-scale versions. They unveiled the machine on the 8th of March 1776, a day before the publication of The Wealth of Nations, written by another Scot, Adam Smith. Bolton wanted Watt to develop a method of converting the up-and-down motion of the piston into a circular motion capable of turning a shaft for use in mills and factories. The crank and flywheel had been patented by James Pickard, which stymied Watt for a while and forced him to develop an alternative system known as the Sun and Planets Gear. Pickard, in turn, had got the idea of the crank from a disloyal and drunken employee of Bolton's own Soho factory, leaving the origin of this simple device mired in confusion. Despite this example of patents getting in the way of improvement, as Savory's had for Newcomen, Watt himself was an enthusiastic defender of his own patents, and Bolton was adept at using his political contacts to acquire long-lasting and broad patents on Watt's various inventions. Just how much Watt's litigiousness delayed the expansion of steam as a source of power in factories is a hotly contested issue, but the ending of the main patent in 1800 certainly coincided with a rapid expansion of experiments and applications of steam. Indeed, one source of steady and incremental improvement in the efficiency and penetration of steam engines came as a result of the publication of a journal, Lean's Engine Reporter, founded by a Cornish mining engineer named John Lean, which acted like an open software movement, disseminating suggestions for improvement among many different engineers. My point is simple. What, brilliant inventor though he undoubtedly was, gets too much credit and the collaborative efforts of many different people too little. Five years after Watt died in 1819, there was a subscription to build a monument to him, unusual in those days when monuments were mostly to those who had won wars. The editors of a journal called The Chemist had this to say, rather perceptively. He is distinguished from many other public benefactors by never having made or pretended to make it his object to benefit the public. The unpretending man in reality conferred more benefit on the world than all those who for centuries have made it their especial business to look after the public welfare. Thomas Edison and the Invention Business Some time later came an energy innovation that stands symbolically for the whole field of invention, the light bulb. As a patriotic Northeasterner, I cannot resist pointing out that one of the light bulb's innovators lived within a few miles of the River Tyne in Gateshead. His name was Joseph Wilson Swan. It was at the Literary and Philosophical Society in Newcastle on the 3rd of February 1879, in front of an audience of 700 people, that he first demonstrated that he could illuminate a room for his lecture with an evacuated glass bulb containing a carbon filament through which a current passed. Electricity was already providing light by then, in the form of arc lights. The problem was that it could only be very bright. 
The subdivision of light was the problem Swan was trying to solve, splitting a current into small flows to produce lots of sources of modest light. The realization that a glowing wire or filament did not burn up if electrified in a vacuum was critical. Creating a sufficiently empty vacuum inside blown glass and finding a material that would work reliably as a filament were the two problems Swan was trying to solve. For more than 20 years, after his first prototype in 1850, he made only slow progress. But hang on, didn't Thomas Edison invent the light bulb? Yes, he did. But so did Marcelin Jobard in Belgium, and so did William Grove, Frederick de Mollins, and Warren de la Rue, and Swan in England. So too did Alexander Lodigin in Russia, Heinrich Goebel in Germany, Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin in France, Henry Woodward and Matthew Evans in Canada, Hiram Maxim and John Starr in America, and several others. Every single one of these people produced published or patented the idea of a glowing filament in a bulb of glass, sometimes with a vacuum, sometimes with nitrogen inside the bulb, and all before Thomas Edison. The truth is that 21 different people can lay claim to have independently designed or critically improved incandescent light bulbs by the end of the 1870s, mostly independent of each other, and that is not counting those who invented critical technologies that assisted in the manufacture of light bulbs, such as the Sprengel mercury vacuum pump. Swan was the only one whose work was thorough enough and whose patents were good enough to force Edison to go into business with him. The truth is that the story of the light bulb, far from illustrating the importance of the heroic inventor, turns out to tell the opposite story, of innovation as a gradual, incremental, collective, yet inescapably inevitable process. The light bulb emerged inexorably from the combined technologies of the day. It was bound to appear when it did, given the progress of other technologies. Yet Edison, frankly, deserves his reputation, because although he may not have been the first inventor of most of the ingredients of a light bulb, and although the tale of a sudden Eureka breakthrough on the 22nd of October 1879 is largely based on retrospective myth making, he was, nonetheless, the first to bring everything together, to combine it with a system of generating and distributing electricity, and thereby to mount the first workable challenge to the incumbent technologies of the oil lamp and the gas lamp. So much more impressive, all told, than a blinding flash of inspiration. But vanity, vanity, people prefer to be thought brilliant rather than merely hard-working. Edison was also the one who made light bulbs almost reliable. Having hubristically claimed to have made a light bulb that would reliably last a long time before failing, he began a frantic search to prove his boast true. This is known today in Silicon Valley as fake it till you make it. He tested more than 6,000 plant materials in his bid to try to find the ideal material for making a carbon filament. Somewhere in God Almighty's workshop, Edison pleaded, there is a vegetable growth with geometrically powerful fibres suitable to our use. On the 2nd of August, 1880, Japanese bamboo was the eventual winner, proving capable of lasting more than 1,000 hours. Thomas Edison understood better than anybody before, and many since, that innovation is itself a product, the manufacturing of which is a team effort requiring trial and error. Starting his career in the telegraph industry and diversifying into stock ticker machines, he then set up a laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, in 1876 to do what he called the invention business, later moving to an even bigger outfit in West Orange. He assembled a team of 200 skilled craftsmen and scientists and worked them ruthlessly hard. He waged a long war against his former employee, Nikola Tesla's invention of alternating current electricity, for no better reason than that Tesla had invented it rather than he. Edison's approach worked. Within six years, he had registered 400 patents. He remained relentlessly focused on finding out what the world needed and then inventing ways of meeting the needs, rather than the other way round. 
The method of invention was always trial and error. In developing the nickel iron battery, his employees undertook 50,000 experiments. He stuffed his workshops with every kind of material, tool, and book. Invention, he famously said, is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Yet in effect, what he was doing was not invention so much as innovation, turning ideas into practical, reliable and affordable reality. And yet for all the gradual nature of the innovation of the light bulb, the result was disruptive and transformational change in the way people lived. Artificial light is one of the greatest gifts of civilization, and it was the light bulb that made it cheap. A minute of work in 1880, on the average wage, could earn you four minutes of light from a kerosene lamp. A minute of work in 1950 could earn you more than seven hours of light from an incandescent bulb. In 2000, 120 hours. Artificial light has come within the reach of ordinary people for the first time, banishing the gloom of winter while expanding the opportunity to read and learn, plus incidentally reducing fire risk. There was no significant downside to such innovation. The incandescent bulb reigned supreme for more than a century, being still the dominant form of lighting, at least in domestic settings, well into the first decade of the 21st century. When it gave way to a new technology, it did so under duress. That is to say, it had to be banned because its replacement was so unpopular. The decision by governments all over the world around 2010, lobbied by the makers of compact fluorescent bulbs to phase out incandescence by fiat in the interests of cutting carbon dioxide emissions, proved to be a foolish one. The compact fluorescent replacements took too long to warm up, did not last as long as advertised, and were hazardous to dispose of. They were also much more expensive. Their energy savings did not make up for these drawbacks in most consumers' eyes, so they had to be forced onto the market. The cost to Britain alone of this coerced purchase and the subsidy that accompanied it has been estimated at about £2.75 billion. Worst of all, had governments waited a few more years, they would have found a far better replacement coming along that was even more frugal in energy and had none of the disadvantages. Light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. The reign of the compact fluorescents lasted just six years before they too were rapidly abandoned and manufacturers stopped producing them because of the falling cost and rising quality of LEDs. It is as if the government in 1900 had forced people to buy steam cars instead of waiting for better internal combustion vehicles. The whole compact fluorescent light bulb episode is an object lesson in misinnovation by government. As the economist Don Boudreau put it, any legislation forcing Americans to switch from using one type of bulb to another is inevitably the product of a horrid mix of interest group politics with reckless symbolism designed to placate an electorate that increasingly believes that the sky is falling. LED lights have actually been waiting in the wings for a long time. The phenomenon behind them, that semiconductors sometimes glow when conducting electricity, was first observed in 1907 in Britain and first investigated in 1927 in Russia. In 1962, a general electric scientist named Nick Holonyak stumbled on how to make bright red LEDs of gallium arsenide phosphide while trying to develop a new kind of laser. Yellow ones soon followed from a Monsanto lab. And by the 1980s, LEDs were in watches, traffic lights and circuit boards. But until Shuji Nakamura, working for Nichia in Japan, developed a blue LED using gallium nitride in 1993, it proved impossible to make white light, which kept LED lights from mainstream lighting. Even then, it took 20 years to bring the price of this solid-state lighting down to reasonable levels. Now that has happened, however, the implications are remarkable. LED lights use so little power that a house can be well lit while not on the grid, perhaps using solar panels, a valuable opportunity for remote properties in poor countries. They have put bright flashlights inside smartphones. 
They emit so little heat that they make indoor vertical farming of lettuces and herbs possible on a grand scale, especially using tunable LEDs to produce the wavelengths best suited to photosynthesis. The Ubiquitous Turbine If Newcomen was from humble origins, poor and illiterate in his younger days, the same cannot be said of another key name in the story of steam. Charles Parsons was the sixth son of the wealthy Earl of Ross, an Irish peer. He was born and raised at Burr Castle in County Offaly, Ireland, and given private tuition in place of school before going up to Cambridge University to read mathematics. But this was no typical aristocratic household. The Earl was an astronomer and engineer. He encouraged his sons to spend time in his workshops rather than libraries. Charles and his brother built a steam engine with which to provide the power for grinding the reflector on his father's telescope. When he left university, it was not for a comfortable berth in the law, politics or finance, but for an apprenticeship in an engineering firm on the Tyne. He proved a brilliant engineer, and in 1884, he designed and patented the steam turbine that would prove to be, with very few modifications, the indispensable machine that gave the world electricity and that powered the navies and liners of the sea and later the jets of the air. To this day, it is basically Parsons's design that keeps the lights on, navies afloat and airliners aloft. A turbine is a device that spins on its axis. There are two ways to use steam or water to make something turn, impulse or reaction. Directing the steam from a fixed nozzle at buckets on a wheel will turn that wheel, and squirting the steam at an angle out of nozzles on the outsides of the wheel itself will also turn the wheel. A spinning sphere driven by steam shooting out of two angled nozzles had been built as a toy by Hero of Alexandria in the 1st century AD. Parsons concluded early on that impulse turbines were inefficient and stressful to the metal. He realised too that a series of turbines, each turned by some of the steam, would gather more of the energy more efficiently. He redesigned dynamos to generate electricity from turbines, and within a few years the first electric grids were being built with larger and larger Parsons turbines. Parsons set up his own company, but had to leave behind the intellectual property in his original designs, and he spent five years trying to build radial flow turbines before he was able to revert to parallel axial flow turbines. He tried and failed to interest the Admiralty in the devices as a way of powering ships. So in 1897 he sprang a cheeky surprise on the Royal Navy. Parsons, who was fond of boats and yachting, had made a sleek little ship, Turbinia, powered by steam turbines turning a screw propeller. The first results were disappointing, mainly because of the propeller, which caused cavitation in the water, small vacuum pockets behind the screw blades that wasted energy. Parsons and Christopher Leyland went back to the laboratory, trying many designs to find one that might solve the cavitation problem. It was trial and error. They stayed up all night at times and were still at the water tank when the housemaids arrived in the morning. It was frustrating work, but by 1897, Parsons had replaced the single radial flow turbine with three axial flow ones and the single propeller shaft with three shafts, each armed with three screws. He knew by now from sea trials that his little craft with nine propellers could achieve 34 knots much faster than any ship of the time. He even gave a public talk about it in April 1897, which the Times newspaper reported, concluding dismissively that turbine technology was in a purely experimental, perhaps almost in an embryo stage as far as ships were concerned. How wrong they were. As the Grand Fleet assembled at Spithead on the 26th of June, in the presence of the Prince of Wales, to mark the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria, Parsons was planning an audacious stunt. Over 140 ships were drawn up in four lines over 25 miles long in all. Between them steamed a royal procession of ships. 
Victoria and Albert, carrying the Prince of Wales, the P&O liner Carthage, with other royal guests aboard, Enchantress, with the Lords of the Admiralty, Danube, with members of the House of Lords, Wildfire, with colonial Prime Ministers, the Cunard liner Campania, with members of the House of Commons, and finally, El Dorado, carrying foreign ambassadors. A line of invited foreign battleships included the König Wilhelm, with Prince Henry of Prussia aboard. Defying the rules and evading the fast steamboats on picket duty, Parsons took Turbinia between the ranks of battleships at full speed, and then steamed up and down in front of the Grandees, pursued in vain by Royal Navy vessels, one of which almost collided with the little greyhound of the sea. It was a sensation. With surprisingly little umbrage, it helped that the Germans were there to witness the episode, and Prince Henry of Prussia took care to send a congratulatory message to Parsons. The Navy took the hint, and by 1905 had determined that all future warships would be turbine-powered. HMS Dreadnought was the first. In 1907, the vast liner, Mauritania, powered by Parsons turbines, was photographed alongside her little predecessor, Turbinia. The spithead moment is in some ways misleading. The history of turbines and electricity is profoundly gradual, not marked by any sudden step changes. Parsons was just one of many people along the path who incrementally devised and improved the machines that made electricity and power. It was an evolution, not a series of revolutions. The key inventions along the way each built upon the previous one and made the next one possible. Alessandro Volta made the first battery in 1800, Humphrey Davy made the first arc lamp in 1808, Hans Christian Ersted made the connection between electricity and magnetism in 1820, Michael Faraday and Joseph Henry made the first electric motor in 1820, and its opposite, the first generator in 1831. Hippolyte Pixie made the first dynamo in 1832. Samuel Varley, Werner von Siemens and Charles Wheatstone all came up with the full dynamo electric generator in 1867. Zenobe Graham turned this into a direct current generator in 1870. Parsons's turbine was about 2% efficient at turning the energy of a coal fire into electricity. Today, a modern combined cycle gas turbine is about 60% efficient. A graph of the progress between the two shows a steady improvement with no step changes. By 1910, using waste heat to preheat the water and the air, engineers had improved the efficiency to 15%. By 1940, with pulverised coal, steam reheating and high temperatures, it was near a 30%. In the 1960s, as the combined cycle generator effectively brought a version of the turbojet engine in alongside the steam turbine, potential efficiency had almost doubled again. To single out clever people who made the difference along the way is both difficult and misleading. This was a collaborative effort of many brains long after the key technologies had been invented, innovation continued. Nuclear power and the phenomenon of disinnovation The 20th century saw only one innovative source of energy on any scale. Nuclear power. Wind and solar, though much improved and with a promising future, still supply less than 2% of global energy. In terms of its energy density, nuclear is without equal. An object the size of a suitcase, suitably plumbed in, can power a town or an aircraft carrier almost indefinitely. The development of civil nuclear power was a triumph of applied science. The trail leading from the discovery of nuclear fission and the chain reaction through the Manhattan Project's conversion of a theory into a bomb to the gradual engineering of a controlled nuclear fission reaction and its application to boiling water. No individual stands out in such a story unless it be Leo Zillard's early realisation of the potential of a chain reaction in 1933, General Leslie Groves's leadership of the Manhattan Project in the 1940s, or Admiral Hyman Rickover's development of the first nuclear reactors and their adaptation to submarines and aircraft carriers in the 1950s. 
But as these names illustrate, it was a team effort within the military and state-owned enterprises, plus private contractors, and by the 1960s it had culminated in a huge programme of constructing plants that would use small amounts of enriched uranium to boil enormous amounts of water reliably, continuously and safely all over the world. Yet today, the picture is of an industry in decline, its electrical output shrinking as old plants close faster than new ones open, and an innovation whose time has passed, or a technology that has stalled. This is not for lack of ideas, but for a very different reason. Lack of opportunity to experiment. The story of nuclear power is a cautionary tale of how innovation falters and even goes backwards if it cannot evolve. The problem is cost inflation. Nuclear plants have seen their costs relentlessly rising for decades, mostly because of increasing caution about safety. And the industry remains insulated almost entirely from the one known human process that reliably pulls down costs, trial and error. Because error could be so cataclysmic in the case of nuclear power, and because trials are so gigantically costly, nuclear power cannot get trial and error restarted. So we are stuck with an immature and inefficient version of the technology, a pressurised water reactor, and that is gradually being strangled by the requirements of regulators acting on behalf of worried people reacting to anti-nuclear activists. Also, technologies pushed on the world by governments, before they are really ready, sometimes falter, where they might have done better if allowed to progress a little more slowly. The transcontinental railroads in the United States were all failures, resulting in bankruptcies, except the one privately funded one. One cannot help thinking that nuclear power developed in less of a hurry and less as a result of a military spin-off might have done better. In a book published in 1990, The Nuclear Energy Option, the nuclear physicist Bernard Cohen argued that the reason we stopped building nuclear plants in the 1980s in most of the West was not from fear of accidents, leaks or the proliferation of atomic waste. It was instead the inexorable escalation of costs driven by regulation. His diagnosis has proved even more true since. This is not for want of ideas for new kinds of nuclear power. There are hundreds of different designs for fission reactors out there in engineers' PowerPoint presentations, some of which have reached working prototype design in the past and would have gone much further if offered as much financial support as the conventional light water reactor. Liquid metal and liquid salt reactors are two broad categories. The latter would work using salts of thorium or uranium fluoride, probably with other elements included, such as lithium, beryllium, zirconium or sodium. The key advantage of such a design is that the fuel comes in liquid form rather than as a solid rod, so cooling is more even and the removal of waste easier. There is no need to operate at high pressure, reducing the risks. The molten salt is the coolant as well as the fuel and has the neat property that the reaction slows down as it gets hotter, making meltdown impossible. In addition, the design would include a plug that would melt above a certain temperature, draining the fuel into a chamber where it would cease fission, a second safety system. Compared with, say, Chernobyl, this is dramatically safer. Thorium is much more abundant than uranium. It can, in effect, breed almost indefinitely by creating uranium-233. It can generate almost 100 times as much power from the same quantity of fuel. It does not give rise to fissile plutonium. It generates less waste with a shorter half-life. But although a submarine with sodium coolant was launched in the 1950s and two experimental thorium molten salt reactors were built in the 1960s in the United States, the project eventually expired as all the money, training and interest focused on the light water uranium design. Various countries are looking at how to reverse this decision but none has really taken the plunge. Even if they did, it seems unlikely that they would achieve the notorious promise made in the 1960s that nuclear power would one day be too cheap to meter. The problem is simply that nuclear power is a technology ill-suited to the most critical of innovation practices 
learning by doing. Because each power station is so big and expensive, it has proved impossible to drive down the cost by experiment. Even changing the design halfway through construction is impossible because of the immense regulatory thicket that each design must pass through before construction. You must design the thing in advance and stick to that design or go back to square one. This way of doing things would fail to bring down costs and raise performance in any technology. It would leave computer chips at the 1960s stage. We build nuclear power stations like Egyptian pyramids as one-off projects. Following the Three Mile Island accident in 1979 and Chernobyl in 1986, activists and the public demanded greater safety standards. They got them. According to one estimate, per unit of power, coal kills nearly 2,000 times as many people as nuclear, bioenergy 50 times, gas 40 times, hydro 15 times, solar 5 times, people fall off roofs installing panels, and even wind power kills nearly twice as many as nuclear. These numbers include the accidents at Chernobyl and Fukushima. Extra safety requirements have simply turned nuclear power from a very, very safe system into a very, very, very safe system. Or maybe they have made it less safe. Consider the Fukushima disaster of 2011. The design at Fukushima had huge safety flaws. Its pumps were in a basement, easily flooded by a tidal wave a simple design mistake unlikely to be repeated in a more modern design. It was an old reactor and would have been phased out long since if Japan had still been building new nuclear reactors. The stifling of nuclear expansion and innovation through costly over-regulation had kept Fukushima open past its due date, thus lowering the safety of the system. The extra safety demanded by regulators has come at a high cost. The labour that goes into the construction of a nuclear plant has hugely increased, but mostly in the white-collar jobs, signing off paperwork. According to one study, during the 1970s, new regulations increased the quantity of steel per megawatt by 41%, concrete by 27%, piping by 50%, and electrical cable by 36%. Indeed, as the ratchet of regulation turned, the projects began to add features to anticipate rule changes that sometimes did not even happen. Crucially, this regulatory environment forced the builders of nuclear plants to drop the practice of on-the-spot innovation to solve unanticipated problems, lest it lead to regulatory resets, which further drove up cost. The answer, of course, is to make nuclear power into a modular system with small, factory-built reactor units, produced off production lines in large quantities and installed like eggs in a crate at the site of each power station. This would drive down costs as it did for the Model T Ford. The problem is that it takes three years to certify a new reactor design and there is little or no shortcut for a smaller one, so the cost of certification falls more heavily on a smaller design. Meanwhile, it is now likely that nuclear fusion, the process of releasing energy from the fusion of hydrogen atoms to form helium atoms, may at last fulfil its promise and begin to provide almost unlimited energy within the next few decades. The discovery of so-called high-temperature superconductors and the design of so-called spherical tokamaks have probably at last defused the old joke that fusion power is 30 years away and has been for 30 years. Fusion may now come to commercial fruition in the form of many relatively small reactors generating electricity, maybe 400 megawatts each. It is a technology that brings almost no risk of explosion or meltdown, very little in the way of radioactive waste, and no worries about providing material for weapons. Its fuel is mainly hydrogen, which it can make with its own electricity from water, so its footprint on the Earth will be small. The main problem fusion will still have to solve, as with nuclear fission, is how to drive down the cost by mass production of the reactors, with the ability to redesign from experience along the way so as to learn cost-cutting lessons. Shale gas surprise 
One of the most surprising stories of the 21st century has been the rise of natural gas, a fuel that just a decade ago was thought to be on the brink of running out and is now both cheap and plentiful. It is mainly the story of the innovation that led to the production of gas from shale. Right up till 2008 or so, it was conventional wisdom among energy experts that cheap natural gas supplies would be exhausted to all practical extent fairly early in the 21st century. Oil and coal would last longer. This prediction had been made before, repeatedly. In 1922, the US Coal Commission, set up by President Warren Harding, interviewed 500 people in the energy industry over 11 months and came to the conclusion that already the output of gas has begun to wane. In 1956, the oil expert M. King Hubbard predicted that natural gas production in the United States would peak in 1970 at 38 billion cubic feet per day and decline. In fact, it was 58 BCF a day then, and still rising. Today it is over 80 BCF per day. These predictions proved gloriously wrong for two reasons. First, in America, strict price regulation of gas in the 1970s, based on the theory that it was scarce, effectively halted gas exploration in its tracks. Companies flared off or shut down gas as a nuisance and pursued oil instead. This did indeed produce a peak in production, which many mistook for the beginning of exhaustion of reserves. Incredibly, the US government passed several measures in the 1970s to forbid the generation of electricity by oil or gas in any utility that could get access to coal and forbade the building of plants that could not use coal. Deregulation of the gas industry under President Reagan led to a surge in production. The second reason for the gas glut of the second decade of the 21st century was innovation. Throughout the United States, gas and oil exploration companies set out to find ways to squeeze more out of each field and to squeeze gas and oil out of tight rocks, whence it did not flow naturally. This resulted in the serendipitous discovery of slick water hydraulic fracturing in the 1990s in Texas, which, combined with the new ability to drill round corners and thus go horizontally within seams of rock for miles on end, made tight shales, where most hydrocarbons are stored, into huge sources of gas and oil. Add in offshore gas plus the ability to liquefy gas for transport by sea and it becomes clear why the world now has ample supplies of gas, the cleanest, lowest carbon and safest of the fossil fuels. The key location of the slick water fracking breakthrough was the Barnet Shale near Fort Worth, where an entrepreneur named George Mitchell, born to a Greek goat herd father, had grown rich supplying Chicago with gas. He had a good fixed-price contract. If he moved elsewhere, he would have to drop his price. So he was desperate to squeeze more from the Barnet Shale, where he had lots of drilling rights. By the late 1990s, output was dropping, and so was Mitchell Energy's share price, which was causing Mitchell personal difficulties because of commitments he had made to philanthropy, backed by loans against his shares. His wife had Alzheimer's, and he had prostate problems. By rights, the 78-year-old multimillionaire should have been reasonable, should have given up on America as the oil majors were already doing, and cut his losses. The future of gas lay offshore, or in Russia and Qatar. But Mitchell, like many innovators, was not reasonable, so he kept trying to get the gas to flow. The Barnet Shale was known to be rich in hydrocarbons, but they would not flow easily, so the rock needed to be cracked deep underground, and the microscopic cracks propped open. The technology to do this was well known and relied on gels to prop open the cracks and let the gas out. It worked well in some rocks, but not in shale. Mitchell sank $250 million into trying to make it work in the Barnet field without success. One day in 1996, a Mitchell employee named Nick Steinsberger noticed an odd result. He was employing contractors to pump a stiff gel with large amounts of sand in it down the well. But since gel and sand were expensive, he'd been forcing the service companies to lower the amount of gel and chemicals in the mixture pumped down the hull 
in an attempt to lower costs and pump less of the viscous material into the shale. On this day, the gel was so dilute that it would not gel properly. Steinsberger pumped it down the hole anyway and noticed the well produced a decent surge of gas. He tried some more wells with similar results. Attending a baseball game with a friend from another company, Mike Meyerhofer, he heard a similar story. Water with a little lubricant and much less sand was working well in a different kind of rock, in this case tight sandstone in East Texas. So in 1997, Steinsberger then began deliberately using a more watery liquid, basically water mixed with less sand and a very small quantity of ordinary kitchen sink chemicals, bleach and soap, essentially, instead of gel. He tried this on three wells, but it did not work. The pressure went up too high, forcing me to terminate the pump job because the slick water wouldn't carry the sand in shale like it would in much more permeable tight sands. In early 1998, getting pretty desperate and with his bosses ready to give up on the Barnet shale, he convinced management to let him try three more wells. This time, he pumped a lot more slick water but increased the sand from extremely low concentrations to higher over the course of the job. The first well, S.H. Griffin Estate 4, produced a surge of gas and kept on doing so for weeks and months. He realised he had stumbled on a formula that was not just half as expensive but twice as productive. A flash in the pan? No, the other two wells had similar results. Steinsberger's breakthrough transformed the last years of George Mitchell's life turning him into a billionaire when he sold his company. It turned the Barnet Shale into America's largest gas producer. Copied elsewhere and steadily improved by further innovation, it had the same effect in shale after shale, in Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Arkansas, North Dakota, Colorado, then Texas again. Soon, the same technique was being adapted to get oil out as well. Today, America is not only the world's biggest producer of gas, it is also the world's biggest producer of crude oil, thanks entirely to the shale fracking revolution. The Permian Basin in Texas alone now produces as much oil as the whole of the United States did in 2008, and more than any OPEC country except Iran and Saudi Arabia. America was building huge gas import terminals in the early 2000s. These have now been converted into export terminals. Cheap gas has displaced coal in the country's electricity sector, reducing its emissions faster than any other country. It has undermined OPEC and Russia, leaving the latter frantically supporting anti-fracking activists to try to defend its markets, with much success in innovation-phobic Europe, where shale exploitation has been largely prevented. A cheap gas, cheap oil glut brought on deliberately by OPEC in 2015 to try to bust the frackers, had the opposite effect, killing weaker companies but forcing the survivors to work out how to remain competitive at $60, $50 and $40 per barrel of oil. The availability of cheap hydrocarbons gave American manufacturing an edge, resulting in a rapid reshoring of chemical industries to the United States and a surge of chemical companies leaving Europe. The energy policies of a dozen countries like Britain predicated on ever-rising high fossil energy prices to make wind and nuclear look expensive became expensive follies almost overnight. Why did this revolution happen in America, an old, played-out and well-explored oil and gas region? The answer lies partly in property rights. Because of mineral rights belonging to local landowners rather than the state, and because oil companies had never been nationalized, as they were in so many other countries, from Mexico to Iran, America had a competitive, pluralistic, and entrepreneurial oil-drilling mindset, manifested in a wildcat industry, backed by deep pockets of risk capital. The early frackers spent vast sums of borrowed money before turning cash positive. As one account of the story by the key innovators put it, Small companies often have the upper hand in leasing mineral rights from landowners as their interactions with landowners is generally more personalised. Shale production was hotly pursued by many small companies 
resulting in a multitude of varied drilling and completion methods being implemented and tested across multiple basins. These laboratories have resulted in continuous improvements and fostered economic success. So trial and error was vital to innovation in fracking. Steinsberger made a series of lucky mistakes, failing many times along the way. And when he had found the formula, he did not know why it worked. A seismology expert, Chris Wright, soon explained it. Wright, an engineer whose company Pinnacle was using new tilt-meter devices to help track the progress of fractures underground for Mitchell, figured out that slick water fracks created large networks of multiple fractures. He had developed a model of simultaneous growth of multiple fractures in the early 1990s, which was widely derided by all the old-timers in the frack world as they insisted multiple fracks would always rapidly coalesce into a single frack. It turned out Wright was right. The pressurised water was creating cross-cutting fractures in the rocks, greatly increasing the surface area exposed to the sand. Fractures were propagating a mile or more in one direction, but spreading hundreds of metres either side of this axis too. In this case, science came in behind the technology rather than vice versa. Recent attempts to credit the federal government with starting this innovation mostly miss the point. Yes, lots of research was done at government laboratories, but much of it under contract to the gas industry, and largely because there were entrepreneurs like Mitchell and Wright, now one of the industry leaders, creating the demand for such research. At first, environmentalists welcomed the shale gas revolution. In 2011, Senator Tim Wirth and John Podesta welcomed gas as the cleanest fossil fuel, writing that fracking creates an unprecedented opportunity to use gas as a bridge fuel to a 21st century economy that relies on efficiency, renewable sources and low-carbon fossil fuels such as natural gas. Robert Kennedy Jr., head of the Waterkeeper Alliance, wrote in the Financial Times that in the short term, natural gas is an obvious bridge fuel to the new energy economy. But then it became clear that this cheap gas would mean the bridge was long, posing a threat to the viability of the renewable energy industry. Self-interest demanded a retraction by Kennedy, which he duly provided, calling shale gas a catastrophe. In the heartlands where fracking began, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas and North Dakota, there was little opposition. A lot of empty land, a long tradition of oil drilling and a culture of can-do enterprise ensured that the shale revolution prospered unhindered by much, if any, local protest. But when it spread to the East Coast, to Pennsylvania and then New York, suddenly shale gas began to attract enemies and environmentalists spotted an opportunity to fundraise on the back of opposition. Recruiting some high-profile stars, including Hollywood actors such as Mark Ruffalo and Matt Damon, the bandwagon gathered pace. Accusations of poisoned water supplies, leaking pipes, contaminated wastewater, radioactivity, earthquakes and extra traffic multiplied. Just as the early opponents of the railways accused trains of causing horses to abort their foals, so no charge was too absurd to level against the shale gas industry. As each scare was knocked on the head, a new one was raised. Yet despite millions of frack jobs in thousands of wells, there were very few and minor environmental or health problems. The Reign of Fire One of the flaws in the way we recount stories of innovation is that we unfairly single out individuals, ignoring the contribution of lesser mortals. I have chosen to tell the stories of Newcomen, Watt, Edison, Swan, Parsons and Steinsberger. But they were all stones in an arch, or links in a chain. And not all of them ended up wealthy, let alone their descendants. There is no foundation named after any of them today, and funded by their wealth. It was the rest of us who reaped most of the benefit of their innovations. Yet energy itself does deserve to be singled out. It is the root of all innovation, if only because innovation is change, and change requires energy. 
Energy transitions are crucial, difficult, and slow. For the vast majority of history, argues John Constable, the supply of energy from wheat and wind and water was just too thin to generate complex structures on a sufficient scale to transform people's lives. Along came the heat-to-work transition of 1700, and suddenly it became possible to create ever more improbable and complex material structures from the harnessing of fossil fuels with their huge energy yield on energy invested. The fossil fuel dependence of the modern world is roughly the same today at about 85% of primary energy as it was 20 years ago. The vast majority of society's need for energy is supplied by heat. What will eventually depose the impellent use of fire? That strange link between heat and work that came into the lives of humanity around the year of 1700 and is still vital to the world. Nobody yet knows. Chapter 2. Public Health An operation invented not by persons conversant in philosophy or skilled in physic, but by a vulgar, illiterate people, an operation in the highest degree beneficial to the human race. Giacomo Pillarini on Smallpox Inoculation, 1701 Lady Mary's Dangerous Obsession in the same year that Thomas Newcomen was building his first steam engine, 1712, and not far away, a more romantic episode was in train, and one that would indirectly save even more lives. It was much higher up the social scale. Lady Mary Pierpoint, a well-read, headstrong young woman of 23, was preparing to elope in order to escape the prospect of a dull marriage. Her wealthy suitor, Edward Wortley Montague, with whom she had carried on a voluminous correspondence characterised by furious disagreement as well as outrageous flirtation, had failed to agree a marriage settlement with her even wealthier father, the Earl, later Duke, of Kingston. But the prospect of being forced by her father to marry instead a pecunious dullard, the Honourable Clotworthy Skeffington, persuaded Mary to rekindle the romance with Wortley, as she called him, she proposed elopement, and he, despite thus missing out on her dowry, and in a fit of uncharacteristic impetuosity, agreed. The episode turned to farce. He was late. She set off for the rendezvous alone. He overtook her at an inn, but did not realise she was there. But after further mishaps, they found each other and married on the 15th of October, 1712, in Salisbury. After this romantic start, the marriage was a disappointment. Wortley proving a cold and unimaginative husband. His bride, learned, eloquent and witty, cut a swathe through literary London, writing eclogues with Alexander Pope in the style of Virgil and befriending the literary lions and social tigers of the day. Joseph Spence would later write, Lady Mary is one of the most extraordinary shining characters in the world, but she shines like a comet. She is all irregular and always wandering, she is the most wise, most imprudent, loveliest, disagreeablest, best-natured, cruelest woman in the world. Then smallpox marked her skin and made her reputation. This vicious virus, humankind's greatest killer, was constantly a threat in early 18th century London. It had recently killed Queen Mary and her nephew, the young Duke of Gloucester, the last Stuart heir to the throne who was not Catholic. It had almost killed the Electress of Hanover, Sophia, and her son George, destined to be the next King of England instead. It killed Lady Mary's brother in 1714, and very nearly killed her the next year, leaving her badly scarred and lacking in eyelashes, her beauty cruelly ravaged. But it was smallpox that would bring her lasting fame, for she became one of the first and certainly one of the most passionate champions in the Western world of the innovative practice of inoculation. In 1716, her husband was sent as ambassador to Constantinople, and Lady Mary accompanied him with her young son. She did not invent inoculation, 
she did not even bring the news of it for the first time. But being a woman, she was able to witness in detail the practice among women cloistered in Ottoman society, and then to champion it back home among mothers, terrified for their children, to the point where it caught on. She was an innovator, not an inventor. Two reports had reached the Royal Society in London from Constantinople of the practice of engrafting as a cure for smallpox. According to the correspondents, Emmanuel Timonius and Giacomo Pilarini, both physicians working in the Ottoman Empire, the pus from a smallpox survivor would be mixed with the blood in a scratch on the arm of a healthy person. The reports were published by the Royal Society, but dismissed as dangerous superstition by all the experts in London. More likely to spark an epidemic than prevent it. An unconscionable risk to be running with people's health. An old wives' tale. Witchcraft. Given the barbaric and unhelpful practices of doctors at the time, such as bloodletting, this was both ironic and perhaps understandable. It seems that the Royal Society had been told of the practice even earlier, in 1700, by two correspondents in China, Martin Lister and Clopton Havers. So there was nothing new about this news. But where these doctors failed to persuade the British, Lady Mary Wortley Montague had better luck. On the 1st of April, 1718, she wrote to her friend Sarah Chiswell from Turkey with a detailed account of inoculation. The smallpox, so fatal and so general among us, is here entirely harmless by the invention of engrafting, which is the term they give it. There is a set of women who make it their business to perform the operation. When they are met, commonly fifteen or sixteen together, the old woman comes with a nutshell full of the matter of the best sort of smallpox and asks what vein you please to have opened. She immediately rips open that you offer her with a large needle, which gives you no more pain than a common scratch, and puts into the vein as much venom as can lie upon the head of her needle. There is no example of any one that has died in it, and you may believe that I am well satisfied of the safety of the experiment, since I intend to try it on my dear little son. I am patriot enough to take pains to bring this useful invention into fashion in England. Lady Mary did indeed engraft her son Edward, anxiously watching his skin erupt in self-inflicted pustules before subsiding into immunised health. It was a brave moment. On her return to London, she inoculated her daughter as well and became infamous for her championing of the somewhat reckless procedure, a sort of version of the trolley problem so beloved of moral philosophers. Do you divert a runaway truck from a line where it will kill five people to another line where it will kill one? Do you deliberately take one risk to avoid a greater one? By then, some doctors had joined the cause, notably Charles Maitland. His inoculation of the children of the Prince of Wales in 1722 was a significant moment in the campaign. But even afterwards, there was furious denunciation of the barbaric practice. Misogyny and prejudice lay behind some of it, as when Dr William Wagstaff pronounced... Posterity will scarcely be brought to believe that an experiment practised only by a few ignorant women amongst an illiterate and unthinking people should, on a sudden and upon a slender experience, so far obtain in one of the politest nations in the world as to be received into the royal palace. In America, the practice of inoculation arrived around the same time, through the testimony of an African slave named Onesimus who told the Boston preacher Cotton Mather about it, possibly as early as 1706, who in turn informed the physician Zabdiel Boylston. For trying inoculation on 300 people, Boylston was subject to fierce criticism and life-threatening violence, abetted by rival physicians, to the point where he had to hide for 14 days in a secret closet, lest the mob kill him. Innovation often requires courage. In due course, inoculation with the smallpox itself, later known as variolation, was replaced by the safer but similar practice of vaccination. That is to say, using a related but less dangerous virus than smallpox, an innovation usually credited to Edward Jenner. 
1796, he deliberately infected an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps, with cowpox from blisters on the hands of a milkmaid called Sarah Nelms, who had caught it from a cow called Blossom. He then tried to infect Phipps with smallpox itself and showed that he was immune to it. This demonstration proof, not the vaccination itself, was his real contribution and the reason he had such an impact. The idea of deliberately giving people cowpox to immunise them against smallpox was by then already 30 years old. It had been tried by a physician named John Fuster in 1768 and by several other doctors in Germany and England in the 1770s. It was already probably in use among farmers before that date. So, yet again, innovation proves to be gradual and to begin with the unlettered and ordinary people before the elite takes the credit. That is perhaps a little unfair on Jenna, who, like Lady Mary Wortley, deserves fame for persuading the world to adopt the practice. Napoleon, despite being at war with Britain, had his armies vaccinated on the strength of Jenna's advocacy and awarded Jenna a medal, calling him one of the greatest benefactors of mankind. Pasteur's Chickens Vaccination conquered smallpox so comprehensively that by the 1970s the disease, once the greatest taker of human lives on the planet, had died out altogether. The last case of the more deadly strain, variola major, was in Bangladesh in October 1975. Rahima Banu, then three years old, survived and is still alive. The last case of variola minor was in October 1977 in Somalia. Ali Maumalin, who was an adult when he caught it, also survived, working for most of his life on the campaign against polio and dying in 2013 of malaria. Vaccination exemplifies a common feature of innovation that use often precedes understanding. Throughout history, technologies and inventions have been deployed successfully without scientific understanding of why they work. To a rational person in the 18th century, Lady Mary's idea that exposure to one strain of a fatal disease could protect against that disease must have seemed crazy. There was no rational basis to it. It was not until the late 19th century that Louis Pasteur began to explain how and why vaccination worked. Pasteur proved that germs were microscopic organisms by boiling a fermented liquid and showing that it remained inert and could not generate further fermentation unless exposed to germs carried in on the breeze. His final blow was to leave the liquid open to the air, but only through a narrow swan-necked vessel whose shape ensured that bacteria did not pass through. He boasted in 1862, Never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow of this simple experiment. If contagious diseases were caused by microbes, the distinction between bacteria and far smaller viruses was still to be made, then could inoculation be explained by a change in the character of the microbe and a change in the human body's vulnerability to it? Pasteur's explanation came about as a result of a serendipitous accident. In the summer of 1879, he went on holiday, leaving his assistant, Charles Chambellan, to inoculate some chickens with cholera from an infected chicken broth as part of a series of experiments to understand the nature of the cholera bacterium. Chambellan forgot and went on holiday himself. When they returned from holiday and did the experiment, the stale broth proved capable of making the chickens ill, but not killing them. Acting perhaps on a hunch, Pasteur now turned to a virulent cholera strain that normally killed chickens easily and injected it into these now recovered and long-suffering birds. It failed even to sicken them, let alone kill them. The weak strain of cholera had immunised them against this stronger strain. Pasteur began to realise that vaccination worked by a less virulent organism, triggering an immune response that worked against a more virulent one. Not that he understood yet the slightest thing about the human immune system. Science was beginning to catch up with technology. The chlorine gamble that paid off. The scene is a courthouse in New Jersey, 
and the year is 1908. On trial is the Jersey City Water Supply Company, which had lost a previous case in which it had been proved that the company was not supplying pure and wholesome water to the city as specified by its contract. The problem was that upstream of the city's reservoir, more and more people were building homes and discharging sewage from their privies directly into the streams that fed the reservoir. Deaths from typhoid were far too common in the city. Despite removing more than 500 such privies since 1899 and filtering the water, the company could not prevent the contamination of the water supply happening two or three times a year after heavy rain. Given three months to rectify the situation by the court, the company's sanitary advisor, Dr John Leal, came up with the idea of dripping chloride of lime, a disinfectant, into the water supply. By the 26th of September, three days before the second trial began, the plant was built, operating, and continually chlorinating 40 million gallons of water a day. It emerged during the trial that Leal had sought nobody's permission to conduct this experiment on the citizens of Jersey City, at a time when there was widespread revulsion at the idea of putting chemicals into drinking water. The idea itself of chemical disinfection is repellent, thundered the suitably named Thomas Drown of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, echoing the views of others in the establishment. Dr. Leal's decision was brave and risky. In court, the city's lawyer therefore objected to the notion that the company could meet its responsibility to provide clean water with a quick chemical fix of unknown risk to the population, which had not been asked for its consent. He requested the judge refuse even to hear the evidence about whether chlorination had helped. The judge disagreed and allowed the company to present its case. Under cross-examination, Leal said of chlorination, I think that it is the safest, the easiest and the cheapest and best method for rendering this water pure every day in the year and every minute of every hour. He added, I believe the water supply of Jersey City today is the safest in the world. Question, any ill effect on the health of the people there? Answer, not the slightest. Do you drink the water? Yes, sir. Habitually? Yes, sir. After a lengthy trial, the judge eventually ruled that the company had met its responsibilities by this innovation. The Jersey City case proved a turning point, a clean watershed. Cities all over the country and the world began using chlorination to clean up water supplies as they do to this day. Typhoid, cholera and diarrhoea epidemics rapidly disappeared. But where did Dr. Leal get the idea? From a similar experiment in Lincoln, in England, he said at the trial. Like most innovators, he did not claim to be the inventor. The city of Lincoln had seen death rates from typhoid decline after the installation of a sand filtration plant for its water supply. But in 1905, it was struck by a bad outbreak. 125 people died. The city called in Dr. Alexander Cruikshank Houston, a bacteriologist with the Royal Commission on Sewage Disposal. Within two days of arriving in February 1905, Dr. Houston had jerry-rigged a device for dripping chloros, sodium hypochlorite, by gravity into the water with immediate results on the rate of new typhoid infections. But where did Dr. Houston get the idea? Perhaps from an Indian Army Medical Services officer by the name of Vincent Nesfield, who published a paper in 1903 suggesting exactly how to make and use liquid chlorine to disinfect water supplies. Nesfield's technique is close to what is used today and well ahead of its time. Whether and where he ever used it is unknown. And where did Dr Nesfield get the idea? Perhaps from a typhoid outbreak in Maidstone in Kent in the autumn of 1897, in which... 1,900 people caught the disease and about 150 died. Here, under the supervision of Dr. Sims Woodhead, acting on behalf of the water company, the reservoir and mains of the Farley area of water supply at Maidstone were on Saturday night disinfected with a solution of chloride of lime. By December, the outbreak was over. And where did Dr. Woodhead get the idea? 
probably from the use of chloride of lime as a disinfectant of sewage, which was by then a well-known technique. Chloride of lime had also by this time caught on as an antiseptic among surgeons, though they were disgracefully slow as a profession to realise that they should be washing their hands at all, let alone with strong bleach. During London's cholera epidemic of 1854, chloride of lime was used so liberally in Soho that, as one magazine reported, the puddles are white and milky with it, the stones are smeared with it, great splashes of it lie about in the gutters, and the air is redolent with its strong and not very agreeable odour. At the time of that London epidemic, Dr John Snow was trying, largely in vain, to persuade the authorities that cholera was caused by dirty water, not smelly air, the miasma theory then in vogue. He had shown that those getting their water supplies from the Thames estuary were far more likely to catch cholera than those getting their supply from rural streams, and he famously removed the handle from a water pump in Broad Street in Soho, around which a cluster of cholera cases had developed. But he was widely ignored, and chlorine was being spread in the streets for the wrong reason, to combat the supposedly dangerous smell, not to kill waterborne germs. In the great stink of 1858, when parliamentarians were so disgusted by the smell from the River Thames that they at last authorised the construction of modern sewers to carry the sewage out to sea, chloride of lime was applied to the window blinds in Parliament to mask the smell. So the source of the invention of chlorination, like that of vaccination, is enigmatic and confused. Only in retrospect can it be seen as a disruptive and successful innovation that saved millions of lives. It evolved rather slowly, probably from serendipitous beginnings, in largely mistaken ideas. How Pearl and Grace Never Put a Foot Wrong in the 1920s, the most lethal disease to affect American children was whooping cough or pertussis. It killed about 6,000 children a year, more than each of diphtheria, measles and scarlet fever. There were vaccines for whooping cough available in some places, but they were almost useless. The only preventive was quarantine, and even this worked poorly, since nobody knew how long it was necessary to isolate the victims for. It was this problem that drew a pair of ordinary but extraordinary women, both of whom had begun their careers as teachers, into research on the disease. Pearl Kendrick from New York State had studied bacteriology in 1917 at Columbia University while working as a teacher. By 1932, she was at the Michigan State Public Health Laboratory in Grand Rapids, busily analysing the safety of water and milk. That year, she recruited Grace Eldering, who was originally from Montana and had likewise turned from teaching to bacteriology to join her team. At the time, an outbreak of virulent whooping cough was sweeping through the city and Kendrick asked her boss if she could work on it in her spare time. She and Eldering set out to develop a reliable test for who was infectious. This was a cough plate of the medium in which the pertussis bacterium would grow and onto which patients would cough. If the bacteria grew, then the patient was infectious. Laboriously manufacturing their own medium for the cough plates and going out to homes all over Grand Rapids to collect samples at the end of long days of paid work, Kendrick and Eldering had their eyes open to the deprivation that had worsened the plight of the working class since the start of the Depression. By the light of kerosene lamps, they saw children struggling for breath in workless and hungry households. Quarantine sometimes meant destitution for a family where the breadwinner could not then go out to work. Soon, they had established that most people were infectious for four weeks, which helped influence local and national policy on quarantine. But they wanted to go further and develop an effective vaccine. And this they did, systematically and gradually, by using standard vaccine development techniques over the next four years. Nothing new or really clever, just careful experiments. The end result was a killed version of several strains of the bacterium that, when injected into mice, guinea pigs, rabbits and Kendrick's and Eldering's own arms, proved safe. 
now to show that it protected people against whooping cough. Here, the two scientists proved to be adept at the social as well as the laboratory side of the work. They did not want to do what was typical at the time and use as a control group orphans who would be denied the vaccine to show that it worked, but they needed to match those who received the vaccine with similar people who did not receive it. With the help of local doctors and social workers, they used the Kent County Welfare Relief Commission statistics to identify a large selection of people who matched those given the vaccine in age, sex and location, but who had missed out on the vaccine for whatever reason. During 1934-5, they found that four of the 712 vaccinated children had caught whooping cough, whereas 45 of the 880 unvaccinated controls went down with the disease. When Kendrick and Endering announced these results at the annual meeting of the American Public Health Association in October 1935, the audience was sceptical, suspecting that the trial was faulty in some way, as many trials were in those days. A doubtful medical scientist named Wade Hampton Frost came twice from Johns Hopkins to examine the methods employed but eventually admitted that he could find nothing wrong with the two women's work. At the same time, Kendrick wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, inviting her to visit the laboratory, and to her amazement received an acceptance. The First Lady spent 13 hours with the two scientists and went back to Washington to persuade the administration to find ways to fund the project so that they could hire more people to help. This enabled Kendrick and Eldering to do a second, larger trial using just three injections per child instead of four, to which large numbers of families immediately applied. In 1938, when the second trial produced even stronger results, Michigan began mass-producing the vaccine, and by 1940, the rest of the country had followed suit, followed by the rest of the world. Whooping cough incidents and mortality fell rapidly and permanently to very low levels. Kendrick and Eldering received very little recognition for this work, turning down most requests from the media even decades later, and little financial reward. They shared their methods and formulae freely all over the world. They did everything right, chose a vital problem, did the crucial experiments to solve it, worked with communities to test it, gave it to the world, and wasted no time or effort defending their intellectual property. When not travelling to spread the message and the vaccine, they lived together in a house in Grand Rapids and threw generous parties and picnics for their co-workers. Nobody had a bad word to say of them. As one colleague said later, Dr Kendrick never became rich and outside a relatively small circle of informed friends and colleagues never became famous. All she did was save hundreds of thousands of lives at modest cost. Secure knowledge of that fact is the very best reward. Fleming's Luck Fifty years after Pasteur's summer holiday led to a fortuitous insight into the mode of action of vaccination, summer holidays would produce another piece of serendipity in the conquest of disease. Alexander Fleming left his laboratory in London to spend August 1928 in Suffolk. The weather that summer in London was changeable, cool in much of June, then suddenly rather hot in July, the temperature reaching a stifling 30 degrees centigrade on the 15th, before cooling dramatically in early August, then heating up again after the 10th of August. This is of relevance because it affected the growth of the Staphylococcus aureus bacteria that Fleming was growing in Petri dishes as he prepared a chapter for a book on bacteria. Though he was an expert on the species, he wanted to check some of his facts. The cold spell of early August was just right for the growth of a mould of the fungus penicillium, a spore of which had somehow floated into the laboratory on the wind and landed on one of the Petri dishes. The hot spell that followed allowed the bacterial culture to expand, leaving only a gap around the penicillium where the mould had killed the staphylococci. It created a striking pattern, as if the two species were allergic to each other. Had the weather been different, this pattern might not have been possible, because penicillin is not effective against mature bacteria of this species. 
Fleming, a diminutive and taciturn Scot, returned from holiday on the 3rd of September, and as was his habit, began inspecting the cultures he had left behind in the petri dishes cluttered into an enamel tray before discarding them. A former colleague, Merlin Price, put his head around the door, and Fleming engaged him in conversation as he worked. That's funny, he said when he picked up the plate with the pattern of exclusion between the fungus and the bacterium. Was the fungus producing a substance that killed bacteria? Fleming was immediately intrigued and saved both the plate and a sample of the fungus. Yet it was to be more than twelve years before anybody turned this discovery into a practical cure for diseases. Part of the problem was the success of vaccination. Fleming's career had been largely under the influence of a great pioneer of bacteriology, Sir Almroth Wright, who was convinced that diseases would never be cured by medications, however effective, but by assisting the body to defend itself. Vaccination should be used to treat as well as prevent disease. Wright, the son of an Irish father and a Swedish mother, was a towering figure, outspoken, eloquent and irascible. Among colleagues, he was known as the Prade Street philosopher, the Paddington Plato, or more mischievously, Sir Almost Right or Sir Always Wrong. Stimulate the phagocytes, was Wright's battle cry, immortalised in Bernard Shaw's play The Doctor's Dilemma, in which Sir Colenso Ridgeon is a thinly disguised depiction of Wright. St Mary's Hospital, where Wright and Fleming worked, became the high temple of vaccine therapy. Wright's championing of typhoid vaccination for the Allied troops in the First World War probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Influenced by Wright, Fleming's scepticism that a chemical could ever be found to cure infections was reinforced by his experiences researching the causes of infection in wounds during the First World War. He and Wright were stationed in a casino in Boulogne, which they turned into a bacteriological laboratory, the better to understand how to save lives. Here, Fleming showed, using test tubes deformed to resemble jagged wounds, that antiseptics like carbolic acid were counterproductive because they killed the body's own white blood cells without reaching the gangrene-causing bacteria deep in the crevices of the wounds. Instead, Fleming and Wright argued, wounds should be cleaned with a saline solution. It was an important discovery and one that doctors treating the wounded almost completely ignored because it felt all wrong not to dress wounds with antiseptics. Yet Fleming was not dogmatic about his devotion to Wright's ideas. Before the war, he had adopted the medical scientist Paul Ehrlich's arsenic-based chemotherapy, Salvasan, for syphilis, and became renowned as a pox doctor. So he knew there were other ways to treat disease than by stimulating the phagocytes. In 1921, he discovered the bacteria-killing properties of a protein, lysozyme, found in his own nasal mucus and in tears, saliva and other fluids, and that it was secreted by phagocytes. The body's own natural antiseptic, lysozyme hinted at the possibility of finding chemicals that could kill bacteria when injected into the body. But lysozyme itself proved disappointing against the most virulent species of bacteria responsible for disease. Thus Fleming was at least partly prepared for the discovery of penicillin, or mould juice as he initially called it. In a series of experiments he showed that it killed many kinds of virulent bacteria more effectively than most antiseptics, but did not kill the body's own defensive phagocytes. But early experiments with penicillin as a topical antiseptic applied to infected wounds were disappointing. Nobody yet realised that it worked best if injected into the body. Also, it was hard to produce in quantities, or to store. Notoriously, in 1936, the pharmaceutical company Squibb concluded that, in view of the slow development, lack of stability and slowness of bacterial action shown by penicillin, its production and marketing as a bactericide does not appear practicable. So penicillin languished as a curiosity undeveloped as a cure for disease, for more than a decade. Fleming was a denizen of the laboratory, not the clinic or the boardroom. It is generally assumed that it was the outbreak of war that accelerated the development of antibiotics. But the evidence suggests that this may be wrong. 
On the 6th of September 1939, just three days after war broke out, two Oxford scientists applied for a grant to study penicillin, still thinking in terms of science rather than application. They had been working on it for more than a year by now, and the outbreak of war actually made it harder for them to get the money. Both the Medical Research Council and the Rockefeller Foundation gave considerably less than requested, and the latter cited wartime uncertainty as the reason. So, if anything, the outbreak of war slowed down the development of penicillin at this stage. The two scientists, Ernst Chain, a refugee biochemist from Germany, and Howard Florey, a pathologist from Australia, had come across Fleming's work and decided to take a closer look before the war began. Despite wartime shortages of suitable materials, money and people, by May 1940, their colleague Norman Heatley had extracted penicillin and injected it into mice to show that it did not harm them. On Saturday the 25th of May, Flurry injected four mice with penicillin before infecting them and four control mice with a huge dose of streptococcus bacteria. That night, the four untreated mice died, the treated mice survived. It dawned on Flory, Chain and Heatley that a new treatment for wounded soldiers might be at hand. Over the next few months, they turned their laboratory into a penicillin factory. And on the 12th of February 1941, Albert Alexander, a 43-year-old policeman who was dying of septicemia following a scratch from a rose bush, became the first person to be treated with penicillin. He quickly rallied, but supplies of penicillin dried up before he was fully cured and he relapsed and sadly died. But the miraculous effect of the drug had been observed. Then, in August 1942, Fleming, whose interest had by now been reawakened, used penicillin to cure one Harry Lambert of meningitis in a case that caught the attention of the press. From then on, Fleming was a hero, more so than the publicity-shy Flory. In July 1941, with the war stretching British industry to breaking point, Flory and Heatley flew to America to kick-start the production of penicillin there. Higher-yielding varieties of mould were quickly discovered and better techniques for culturing them. But chemical companies were initially reluctant to invest in such an uncertain project, while antitrust, i.e. anti-monopoly rules, made it hard for the firms to learn techniques from each other. Britain was later somewhat resentful of just how much intellectual property relating to penicillin was then claimed by American industry. Wartime shortages, security concerns, and, in Britain, V-1 flying bombs continued to hamper the project, so it is by no means clear that penicillin would have been developed more slowly in peacetime. This is not to deny the drug's value to wounded soldiers, many of whose lives were saved. Even more remarkable was penicillin's ability to cure gonorrhea, an enemy that was causing more casualties than the Germans in the North African and Sicilian campaigns. By D-Day, enough penicillin was available to ensure that the death rate from wounds was far lower than expected. News of penicillin's properties had reached Germany even before the war, and Hitler's doctor used it to treat the Fuhrer after the assassination attempt of June 1944, but no serious attempt was made to scale up production there or in France. This too would probably have been different in a peaceful 1940s. The story of penicillin reinforces the lesson that even when a scientific discovery is made by serendipitous good fortune, it takes a lot of practical work to turn it into a useful innovation. The Pursuit of Polio by the 1950s, the most high-profile disease in the United States was polio. The story of polio's vaccine is not quite as neat and harmless as that of smallpox. Some of the worries of the early opponents of Lady Mary Wortley Montague did indeed come to pass, albeit much later. Vaccines did cause deaths that they should not have done, and it was another stubborn, unfashionable woman who blew the whistle. Her name was Bernice Eddy. Born in rural West Virginia in 1903, the daughter of a doctor, she could not afford medical school, so she went into laboratory research, receiving a PhD in bacteriology in 1927 from the University of Cincinnati. 
By 1952, she was working on the polio virus in the Division of Biological Standards, a branch of the U.S. government. She was involved in testing the new Salk virus for safety and efficacy. Polio became a worsening epidemic, especially in the United States during the 20th century. Ironically, it was mainly improved public health that caused this by raising the age at which people caught the virus, resulting in more virulent infections and frequent paralysis. When everybody encountered sewage in their drinking or swimming water, the population was immunized early before the virus caused paralysis. With chlorine cleaning up the water supply, people encountered the virus later and more virulently. By the 1950s, the polio epidemic in the United States was worsening every year. 10,000 cases in 1940, 20,000 in 1945, 58,000 in 1952. Enormous public interest channeled generous donations into treatment and the search for a vaccine. Huge fame and great wealth awaited the team that reached the prize, so some corners were cut. One breakthrough came when Jonas Salk in Pittsburgh used the new technique of tissue culture to grow vast quantities of polio virus in the minced kidneys of monkeys. By 1953, he was killing 50 monkeys a week for their kidneys, growing the viruses in flasks of kidney tissue culture and inactivating them with 13 days of exposure to formaldehyde. The vaccine thus produced was tested on 161 children and found to cause no harm, no polio, and raised antibodies against the polio virus. Overcoming objections from Salk's rivals, especially Albert Sabin, and ignoring the results of Bernice Eddy, who found that the vaccine could still sometimes cause polio in monkeys. The Salk vaccine was rushed into nationwide trials in 1955 with a great fanfare of publicity. Disaster followed when one of the manufacturers, Cutter Laboratories, infected thousands and paralysed more than 200 people with polio through inadequately inactivated virus. The vaccine was quickly withdrawn and the programme rethought. Meanwhile, Dr. Eddy had another concern. With Sarah Stewart, she had done a groundbreaking experiment to show that cancer could be transmitted from a tumour in a mouse to a hamster, rabbit or guinea pig by a virus, the S.E. polyoma virus, the S standing for Stewart and the E standing for Eddy, a momentous biomedical discovery. She knew that the monkey kidney tissue culture used to grow the salt vaccine sometimes itself sickened with viral infections because of monkey viruses, and she worried that these contaminating viruses might be included with the vaccine and might cause cancer in people. In June 1959, in her own time, she did experiments to show that monkey kidney cultures could indeed cause cancers in hamsters at the site of inoculation. She was rebuked by her boss, Joe Smadel, for doing the work because of the way it cast another doubt on the safety of polio vaccination. And when she persisted in reporting it to a scientific meeting in October 1960, she was effectively sacked from polio work and forbidden to speak about her experiments. Smadel thundered, You have apparently stirred up a hornet's nest, and there are some who are sufficiently credulous as to believe that the use of monkey kidney tissue cultures in man may induce cancer in them. Indeed. The contaminating virus was eventually isolated, christened SV40, and studied in detail by others. We now know that almost every single person vaccinated for polio in America between 1954 and 1963 was probably exposed to monkey viruses of which SV40, the 40th to be described, was just one. That is about 100 million people. In the years that followed, the health establishment was quick to reassure the world that the risk was small, but they had little reason to be so complacent at the time. Sure enough, there has been no epidemic of unusual cancer incidents among those who received contaminated vaccines, but SV40 DNA has been detected in human cancers, especially mesotheliomas and brain tumours, where it may have acted as a cofactor alongside other causes. Saying this remains unpopular to this day. 
Polio eradication was targeted in 1988. Using a combination of inactivated vaccines to prevent paralysis and oral, live, polio vaccines to create full immunity, volunteers fanned out across the world to find and bring protection to adults and children everywhere. They continued throughout civil wars, crossing front lines and even winning ceasefires to do their work in wars in South America and Central Africa. Over the next 30 years, they probably prevented 16 million cases of paralysis and 1.6 million deaths. Today, they have been more than 99.99% successful. The last case of polio in Africa was in 2016. Only Afghanistan and Pakistan still report a very few cases, 33 in 2018. There too, it will surely soon be history. Mud huts and malaria. By the 1980s, with smallpox eradicated and polio, typhoid and cholera in retreat, one stubborn disease remained the biggest killer, capable of ending hundreds of thousands of lives a year. And it was getting worse. Malaria. On the 20th of June 1983, in the hot and dusty settlement of Sumuso in Burkina Faso, West Africa, a group of French and Vietnamese scientists began an experiment together with African colleagues. They had bought in the local market some tool and percale cotton cloth with which to make 36 mosquito nets. Some were large group nets to cover more than one bed, some individual nets to cover a single bed. They now soaked half the nets in a 20% solution of the insecticide permethrin and left the other nets untreated. They next did something rather odd. They tore lots of holes in half the nets, both the treated and the untreated ones. They now had nine nets untreated and unholed, nine that were treated and unholed, nine that were treated and holed, and nine that were untreated and holed. They then laid the 36 nets flat in the sun for 90 minutes to dry before installing them in 24 huts. These huts were built with the traditional mud walls and thatched roofs, but they were not meant to be used as homes. This being a research station, they were specially equipped with mosquito traps, some designed to catch the mosquitoes inside the huts and some to catch them leaving the huts. On the 27th of June, volunteers began to sleep in the huts, occupying them from 8pm to 6am every night for five months, one person to an individual net, three to a group net. Six days a week, three times a day, every mosquito that entered or tried to leave the huts was collected, dead or alive, at 5am, 8am and 10am. The live mosquitoes were kept under observation for 24 hours to see how many could be added to the roll call of the dead. After 21 weeks, 4,682 female mosquitoes had been collected, mostly of two species, Anopheles gambii and Anopheles funestus, both malaria vectors. The idea for this experiment had occurred to two of the French scientists, Frédéric Dariot and Pierre Carnaval, after noting the use of DDT-treated bed nets by the American military in the Second World War and by Chinese forces later. Why include nets with the holes in them, I asked Dariot recently. Because mosquito nets rarely remain intact for long in Africa, so it is realistic to study whether a torn net is as useless as nothing or as useful as an intact net. In the case of untreated nets, a torn cloth is pretty useless, as many a restless sleeper will have experienced. But what if there is insecticide on the net to kill or repel the insects? The Burkina Faso team's results were truly astonishing, even to Dariot and Carnival. They found that the presence of a permethrin-treated net, whether intact or torn, repelled mosquitoes. It reduced the number of mosquitoes entering the huts by about 70% and increased the rate at which the insects left the hut from 25% to 97%. And it reduced the engorgement rate, whether the mosquitoes took a blood meal, by 20% for Anopheles gambii and 10% for Anopheles funestus. Whereas hardly any of the mosquitoes in the control huts died, 
17% of those in the huts with treated nets died. After five months, the nets were still highly effective as insect repellents and killers. Today, the treatment of nets lasts even longer. This beautifully simple, carefully designed experiment, known as Dariet et al. 1984, became famous in the small world of malaria and insect control, though it has never achieved the celebrity it deserves in the popular media. It proved to be a breakthrough in the control of malaria in Africa. The impregnated bed net is the magic bullet against the disease and its vectors. The idea took a while to catch on. Impregnated bed nets first started to be used on a wide scale in 2003, and that very year malaria mortality stopped increasing and began to decline. According to a recent study published in Nature, insecticide-treated mosquito nets account for 70% of the 6 million lives saved worldwide in recent years, twice as high a percentage as anti-malarial drugs and insecticide sprays put together. By 2010, 145 million nets were being delivered each year. Over a billion have been used to date. Globally, the death rate for malaria almost halved in the first 17 years of the current century. Tobacco and harm reduction The greatest killer of the modern world is no longer a germ, but a habit, smoking. It directly kills more than 6 million people every year prematurely, perhaps contributing indirectly to another million deaths. The innovation of smoking, brought from the Americas to the old world in the 1500s, is one of humankind's biggest mistakes. Given that this is a voluntary habit, and that human beings are rational at least some of the time, it ought to be relatively easy to exterminate this killer. Just tell people it is bad for them, and they will stop. Addiction being what it is, this has proved harder than that. Smoking is the source of more premature mortality than almost any other cause. Knowing that it causes cancer and heart disease made surprisingly little dent in its global popularity. The proof that smoking kills, having long been established beyond all reasonable doubt, has done surprisingly little to stop the habit. Advertising bans, plain packaging, bans on smoking in public spaces, deterrent messages on cigarette packages, medical advice, education, all have had some effect, especially in Western countries, but still more than a billion people in the world are addicted to lighting little bonfires of plant material between their lips. Enter Innovation the decline of smoking in Britain has accelerated sharply in recent years, largely because of the spread of an alternative way of getting nicotine hits, which are not known to be harmful in themselves, using high technology instead of smoke, the electronic cigarette. More people vape in Britain than in any other European country. About 3.6 million Britons vape, compared with 5.9 million who smoke. The habit is even endorsed by public agencies, the government, charities and academic colleges, not because it is wholly safe, but because it is much safer than smoking. This is in sharp contrast to the United States, where vaping is officially discouraged, or Australia, where it is still, as of this writing, officially illegal. Who was vaping's innovator? The original inventor was a man named Hon Lick, who devised the first modern electronic cigarette in order to stop himself smoking. Around the turn of the 21st century, he was working as a chemist at the Liaoning Provincial Institute of Traditional Chinese Medicine and smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. He wanted to quit, but tried and failed several times. He tried a nicotine patch, but found it a poor substitute for the hit he got from a cigarette. One day in the laboratory at work, he acquired some liquid nicotine and began experimenting with ways of vaporising it. The first commercial electronic cigarette had been marketed in the 1980s without success, and prototypes date back to the 1960s, with patents on the use of nicotine vapour even in the 1930s. Now, with the miniaturization of electronics, however, Mr. Hon had better luck. His first machine was big and cumbersome. But by 2003, he had filed a patent on a smaller device using a more practical mechanism. Further miniaturization followed, and he submitted the product for testing at the pharmaceutical authority in Liaoning and by the Chinese military's medical institute. It went on sale in 2006. 
But remember, the inventor is not necessarily the innovator. Vaping has not succeeded in catching on as much in China as in Britain. Why? In 2010, Rory Sutherland, an advertising executive, stopped by an office in Admiralty Arch in central London to see an old friend, David Halpern, who had just begun working as the head of David Cameron's new Behavioural Insights team, otherwise known as the Nudge Unit. During the course of the conversation, Sutherland pulled out an electronic cigarette he had bought online and inhaled. By then, electronic cigarettes had been banned in Australia, Brazil and Saudi Arabia, among other countries, at the urging of either the tobacco farmers or public health pressure groups worried that this was in effect a new form of smoking. It was surely only a matter of time before Britain also outlawed the technology. Halpern had not seen an electronic cigarette. He asked Sutherland to explain, and was intrigued by the thought that the risks of vaping might be the lesser of two evils, like vaccinating to prevent smallpox, or chlorinating to prevent typhoid, or like distributing clean needles to heroin addicts to prevent HIV infection, a controversial policy adopted by Britain in the 1980s which had proved remarkably effective in keeping the HIV infection rate among drug addicts far lower than in other countries. We looked hard at the evidence and made a call, wrote Halpin later. We minuted the PM and urged that the UK should move against banning e-cigs. Indeed, we went further. We argued we should deliberately seek to make e-cigs widely available and to use regulation not to ban them, but to improve their quality and reliability. That is why this innovation caught on more in Britain than elsewhere. Despite furious opposition from much of the medical profession, the media, the World Health Organization and the European Commission. Strong evidence from well-controlled studies now exists that vaping's risks, though not zero, are far lower than smoking. It contains fewer dangerous chemicals and it causes fewer clinical symptoms. One 2016 study found that after just five days of vaping, the toxicants in the blood of smokers had dropped to the same levels as those of people who quit altogether. A 2018 study of 209 smokers who switched to e-cigarettes and were followed for two years found no evidence of any safety concerns or serious health complications. But vaping ran up against the same sort of entrenched opposition from vested interests as greeted Lady Mary Wortley Montague's inoculation. Tobacco interests got it banned in many countries. Pharmaceutical companies lobbied to have it restricted in others, the better to protect their prescribed gums and patches. Public health lobbies argued against it, the better to protect their stop-smoking practices. In 2014, at the height of an Ebola epidemic, which ought to have been a priority, the Director-General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, made it clear that she considered opposing vaping a high priority. The European Commission also tried to kill the industry in 2013 by demanding e-cigarettes be regulated as medicinal products. That proposal was dropped, but Europe's Tobacco Products Directive, which came into force in 2017, brought a ban on high-strength e-liquids and on the advertising of e-cigarettes. This compromise partly helped the industry by introducing standards and subjecting products to strict product safety regulations, including toxicological testing of the ingredients, as well as rules to ensure tamper-proof and leak-proof packaging. In the United States, by contrast, there was little regulation. But there were lots of attempts to ban vaping products, and sure enough, people soon began to die, almost all of them, as a result of buying black market vaping products containing not nicotine, but THC oil, an ingredient of cannabis, contaminated with a thickening agent called vitamin E acetate. In effect, in an echo of the Prohibition era, while the British government encourages vaping but strictly regulates the products, the American government discourages it and then does little to ensure its safety. Chapter 3. Transport Failure is only the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. Henry Ford the locomotive and its line. For all of human history, until the 1820s, nobody went faster than the speed of a galloping horse. 
Then within a generation it became routine to travel at speeds three times that fast and for hours at a time. Has there ever been an innovation as tangible and dramatic as this? I have lived, by contrast, in an era when speed of transport has not changed much at all. The man who did most to make the breakthrough in speed was not the originator of the idea, but the practical improver, and like Thomas Newcomen, a craftsman of humble origin. The year is 1810, and a new coal mine has been sunk at Killingworth in Northumberland, with a brand new Newcomen engine installed to pump out the water. But it does not work, and for a whole year the pit remains drowned, despite the best efforts of engine men from all around. In a tale very reminiscent of James Watts, the humble brakesman in charge of the winding gear at a neighbouring pit, 29-year-old George Stevenson, who has a reputation for being able to mend clocks and shoes, offers to help. His only condition is that he will pick his own workmen to help him. Four days later, having dismantled the engine, reshaped the injection cap and shortened the cylinder, he has the engine working well, and the pit is soon dry. Stevenson gets the job of engine man and is soon much called upon as an engine doctor all over the district. Stevenson's father was a fireman at Wylam Colliery, his job being to shovel coal into the furnace to fuel a steam engine. Young George rose quickly by 17 years of age to being the plug man in charge of such an engine at Newburn and then the brakes man in charge of the steam-driven winding gear at Willington Quay and later Killingworth. He had by now been hit by a series of misfortunes. His wife died, leaving him with a young son. His father was blinded by a steam engine accident. He was drawn for military service and had to buy his way out by paying for a substitute to serve in his place, using up the last of his savings. But with his mechanical reputation growing, he was soon in great demand. And the time was ripe for locomotion. The idea of a steam engine pulling wagons along a wagon way was not new. Stationary engines had been hauling coal wagons up hills for some years now using cables, and Richard Trevithick's first locomotive steam engine had hauled a train along a track in Merthyr Tydville in 1804. Trevithick realised that high-pressure steam could now be handled by modern metalworking, giving much more power, making an engine portable, and doing away with the need for a condenser. But Trevithick could not make money, lost interest, travelled abroad and died penniless. The experiment seemed to be over. His imitators likewise gradually gave up. Steam locomotives were unreliable, dangerous, hideously expensive, damaging to wooden or iron plate railways and unable to haul heavy loads or go up hills without their wheels slipping. Better to stick to horses, said everybody sensible. What changed this was war. The Napoleonic conflict created an insatiable demand for horses and for hay to feed them, driving up the price of both. In the coal mining districts, getting the coal to water by horse-drawn cart to be loaded onto ships was the limiting factor. A journey of more than eight miles would make a pit unprofitable. So pit owners started experiments again, and all over the northeast. There were clanking machines with boilers aboard, trying to get up speed. Even so, almost nobody imagined that the railway would prove useful outside the world of the collieries. That it could challenge the canals and the stagecoaches to carry people and cargo long distances just did not occur to anybody. An illustration of a great truth about innovation, that people underestimate its long-term impact. In 1812, An ingenious engineer named Matthew Murray, in Leeds, built an engine for John Blenkinsop with two cylinders rather than one, called Salamanca, after the Spanish battle in which Arthur Lord Wellington defeated a Napoleonic army. He then shipped another of the same design, called, by a spelling mistake, Willington, to the northeast. It progressed forward using a cog, rack and pinion system. But William Headley's rival Puffing Billy at Wylam, 1813, did away with this, disposing finally of the persistent myth that a smooth wheel could not grip a smooth rail. Counterintuitively, with enough weight, a locomotive can pull a heavy load on the smoothest of rails, at least on a shallow incline. But Headley and others soon encountered a new problem. 
The iron plates of the wagonway could not handle the weight of a locomotive and kept smashing. Clearly some innovation was needed under the wheel as well as on top of it. This was the moment for Stevenson, who more than anybody else saw the need for innovation in both engine and rail. The next year, 1814, he built a two-cylinder locomotive at Killingworth, named Blucher after the victorious Prussian general. The influence of the Napoleonic War in this story continues. He largely copied the design of Murray's Willington. When it was working, Blucher proved capable of hauling 14 wagons carrying two tons of coal each at three miles an hour, doing the work of 14 horses. It was not reliable enough yet to compete with horse-drawn vehicles, let alone canals, except at coal mines where fuel was cheap, but it was a start. And Stevenson was already tinkering with the design. As for rails, Stevenson soon took out a patent with William Losh on a new design of cast-iron rail, better able to withstand the weight of the locomotive. But he then changed tack. A friend named Michael Longridge had recently taken over running an ironworks at Bedlington on the River Blythe, not far from Killingworth, and using the new puddling process for producing malleable, low-carbon iron, had the idea of rolling out wrought iron rails through a mould. Longridge's engineer, John Birkenshaw, came up with a design of rail that was wedge-shaped in cross-section with a broad top and a narrow base. This saved metal while allowing good contact with the wheel of a locomotive. When it came to the building of the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1822, I am writing these words in Darlington Railway Station. Stevenson abandoned cast iron to the fury of Losh and went with Birkenshaw's wrought iron rails. George Stevenson and his son Robert now did something astonishingly bold. They surveyed and built a 25-mile, eventually 40-mile, wrought iron railway equipped with locomotives to haul coal to Stockton from Darlington. Serendipity played a part in this triumph. The wealthy Quaker wool merchant and philanthropist Edward Pease had proposed a horse-drawn railway rather than a canal to get coal, wool and linen from Darlington to the tide at Stockton-on-Tees. But building even a horse-powered railway like building a canal required an immense expenditure on lawyers and agents to acquire land and get an act through Parliament. Pease and his fellow Darlington Quakers encountered fierce opposition from members of the House of Lords, and it was only Edward Pease's single-minded determination and hard slog in bending the ears of politicians in London that finally got a bill passed in April 1821. This was just for a horse-drawn railway. The very day the bill passed, the 19th of April 1821, Pease met George Stevenson, who had walked to see him from Stockton, having apparently heard that he was planning a railway. Stevenson offered to survey the route, and then persuaded Pease to use locomotives as well as horses. This led to a fresh round of fury among the landowners, terrified by ridiculous rumours, said the promoters, that these infernal machines, said the opponents, might go at ten or twelve miles an hour. Robert Stevenson organised the construction of improved locomotives to run on the Stockton and Darlington Railway. At the grand opening on the 27th of September 1825, the first of these, Locomotion, designed mostly by Timothy Hackworth, hauled a train that consisted of twelve wagons of coal, one of flour and twenty-one of people. By the time it reached Stockton, more than 600 people were aboard. Later, locomotion showed it could travel at up to 24 miles an hour. Heat was doing work in transporting people for the first time. True, the Darlington and Stockton Railway relied heavily on horses for the next few years, locomotives being occasional, unreliable and dangerous interlopers. But the Stevensons did not stop there. Their most famous locomotive design, Rocket, entered the Rainhill Trials in 1829, a contest to choose engines for the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, a line George Stevenson was building. To qualify, an engine had to weigh no more than 4.5 tonnes, have only four wheels, be well sprung, and haul a small train back and forth 
for 35 miles without stopping for any length of time and then repeat the feat. Rocket was designed by Robert, but incorporated many ingenious improvements, mostly invented by Henry Booth, a new collaborator. These included multiple fire tubes in the boiler to increase the rate of steam generation, angled cylinders, pistons connected directly to just two driving wheels, and a blast pipe for exhausting steam vertically into the chimney, increasing the draft through the furnace. In short, it was the product of incremental tinkering and trial and error by several people, not of brilliant leaps of imagination by a genius. At Rainhill, Rocket had nine competitors, five of which failed to start. Of the others, the horse-powered Cycloped collapsed, Perseverance failed, saint Pere cracked a cylinder, and Novelty, the crowd's favourite, set off at a furious lick but then kept bursting pipes. Playing tortoise to Novelty's hair, Rocket steamed serenely on, hauling 13 tonnes and reaching 30 miles an hour. It set the basic design for locomotives for decades to come. It also caused the first railway fatality a year later, killing the politician William Huskisson at the grand opening of the railway as he stepped off another train to speak to his political rival, the Prime Minister, the Duke of Wellington. After the Liverpool-Manchester line was opened and proved a roaring success, nothing much happened for a few years. A scattered sprinkling of short railways appeared and techniques were slowly honed. Then, driven by low interest rates on government bonds and a liberated stock market, in 1840 there began an extraordinary boom in railway projects, funded by a frenzy of share buying on deposit by anybody with savings. New rail lines appeared all over the nation, linking cities, then towns, then villages. Travel by rail became routine, fast, and even a little bit reliable, though far from safe by today's standards. The grass grew between the cobblestones of roads as the stagecoaches vanished. The railway boom was a competitive bubble, profitable to some, ruinous to many, and riddled with hype and fraud, but enormously valuable to its users as it left Britain connected as never before, enabling trade to flourish. The rest of the world soon followed suit. The first railway in America began operating in 1828, in France in 1830, in Belgium and Germany in 1835, in Canada in 1836, in India, Cuba and Russia in 1837, in the Netherlands in 1839. By 1840, America already had 2,700 miles of railway and 8,750 by 1850. Turning the Screw Putting steam engines on ships happened around the same time, but it was not till the second half of the 1800s and the invention of the screw propeller to replace the paddle wheel that ocean-going steam could challenge sail for price as well as speed. Sailing technology peaked in the late 1860s with the launch of the Cutty Sark and other fast clippers. The story of the screw propeller shows all the usual elements of an innovation. A long prehistory, simultaneous breakthroughs by two rivals, then incremental evolution over many years. The idea had actually been around since the 1600s and it kept popping up in the 18th century. But by the 1830s, paddle steamers were everywhere instead. Patent after patent appeared for screw designs. One historian traced 470 names associated with the idea, including an especially prescient patent in 1838 by a woman, Henrietta Van Sittart, the mistress of the author Edward Bulwer-Lytton. But practical trials were largely missing. Then, in 1835, a 27-year-old farmer in Hendon, on the outskirts of London, by the name of Francis Smith, built a model boat with a screw actuated by a spring and tried it on a pond. The next year he built a better one and took out a patent on propelling vessels by means of a screw revolving beneath the water. 
By one of those remarkable coincidences, just six weeks later, also in London, a Swedish engineer by the name of John Ericsson, who did not know Smith, also took out a patent for a similar device. Smith was already building a full-scale boat of ten tons, with a six-horsepower engine, with the help of an engineer named Thomas Pilgrim. The boat was launched into the Paddington Canal in November 1836 and immediately suffered a lucky accident. The screw that Smith had built was like a wooden corkscrew wrapped around a wooden shaft with two complete turns of the screw along its length. A collision knocked one turn of the screw off, after which the boat went much faster. An unexpected discovery related to turbulence and drag. The next year, Smith redesigned the propeller in metal with a single turn of screw and the boat went out to sea and round the Kent coast and back, proving its worth in rough weather. Ericsson's version had two drums rather than a narrow shaft with screws revolving in opposite directions, an adaptation that was largely unnecessary until the development of the torpedo. Like most inventors, Smith struggled to be taken seriously. The Admiralty asked for a demonstration with a larger vessel, capable of at least five knots, before it would consider trying the technology. Smith formed a company, built a 237-ton ship called the Archimedes, fitted it with an 80-horsepower steam engine, and in October 1839 successfully took on the Widgeon at Dover and the Vulcan at Portsmouth, two of the Navy's fastest paddle steamers. Still the admirals demurred, while the Archimedes shuttled around Europe, showing off. Eventually, in 1841, the Admiralty commissioned a screw ship, Rattler, launched in 1843 and in service the following year. In 1845, Rattler was pitted against a paddle steamer of similar weight and horsepower, a Lecto, in a tug-of-war, the two ships being attached by a line astern. A Lecto was humiliatingly dragged backwards at two knots. Meanwhile, in America, Ericsson had built a series of ships, including the Princeton for the US Navy. France had launched the screw-driven Napoleon. The world's navies switched to screws almost overnight. Innovation continued, though, and the design of the screw evolved radically as the years went by and as the understanding of turbulence and drag improved. The blade shape eventually became narrow near the shaft, wide further out, then tapering to a rounded end. Internal Combustion's Comeback The story of the internal combustion engine displays the usual features of an innovation, a long and deep prehistory characterised by failure, a short period marked by an improvement in affordability characterised by simultaneous patenting and rivalries, and a subsequent story of evolutionary improvement by trial and error. In 1807, a Franco-Swiss artillery officer not only patented but built a machine that could use explosions to generate movement. Isaac de Rivaz built a wheeled charrette on which was mounted a vertical cylinder in which hydrogen and oxygen were mixed and exploded by spark ignition. The weight of the descending cylinder drove the charrette forward through a system of pulleys before the explosions sent the piston back up again. It worked, just, as did a much bigger version built seven years later, but could not hope to compete with the steam locomotive. In 1860, the year after the first oil well was sunk in Pennsylvania, Jean-Joseph Etienne Lenoir patented a design for an internal combustion engine running on petroleum, and by 1863 he had built one that trundled very slowly for nine kilometres in three hours outside Paris. Called the Hippomobile, it was a cart mounted on a tricycle. Its extremely wasteful inefficiency derived mainly from the fact that there was no compression of the air in the cylinder. Two failures, then. External combustion to make steam remained dominant for transport and would surely soon conquer the roads as well as the rails. By the 1880s, firms were springing up all over America and Europe to manufacture and sell steam cars, 
and as the new century dawned, the main threat to the dominance of steam in the motor market would seem to be from newfangled electric cars. The Stanley Steamer, marketed first in 1896, was the best seller and set a world speed record of 127 mph ten years later. Yet within a few years, the underdog that was the internal combustion engine had defied the experts and conquered all. Steam cars and electric cars were consigned to history. The central invention behind internal combustion was the Otto cycle of compression and ignition. A four-stroke dance. Fuel and air enter the cylinder one. The piston compresses the mixture two. Ignition drives the power stroke three. And the gases are exhausted by the piston four. Nicolaus Otto, a grocery salesman, came up with this design in 1876 after 16 years of trying to improve on Lenoir's engine. He had enough success along the way to make and sell stationary engines and to expand his firm, which became Deutz, still a leading engine maker. Although Otto sold many engines, he was not interested in developing a car. So two of his employees, Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach, left and started making gasoline petrol engines for cars. Many others in France, Britain and elsewhere contributed inventions during the 1880s, but it was Carl Benz who got the first complete car into series production in 1886. Benz, a talented engineer living in southern Germany and working at the back of a bicycle shop, built a three-wheeler to a design that owed more to bicycles than carriages. According to family legend, in 1888, his wife Bertha took the car without telling Carl, put her two sons in it and drove very slowly all the way from Mannheim to Pforzheim refueling with gasoline bought from pharmacies along the way, a journey of nearly 100 kilometres. By 1894, more than 100 Benz Motorwagen had been sold. Maybach and Daimler, meanwhile, were independently perfecting a four-stroke engine that ran at faster speeds than Benz's and gave much more power. In France, Émile Levasseur acquired a licence to make Daimler engines, and quickly began to make innovations in car design that were in turn copied by Daimler, the front-mounted engine and the water radiator among them. In 1900, Maybach and Paul Daimler, son of Gottlieb, who had died that year, launched the car that set the standard of design, followed by the industry ever after. The prototype was built specifically for Emil Jelinek, a wealthy Hungarian car racer living in Nice called the Mercedes 35 HP, after the nickname of Jelinek's daughter, it no longer looked like the result of an encounter between a horse carriage and a steam engine round the back of a bicycle shed. Maybach made it wider, lower, and with a low centre of gravity to stop it overturning. It had an aluminium engine mounted on a steel chassis over the front axle for the first time, and a patented water-cooled honeycomb radiator and gate gearbox. The car performed so well for Jelinek at Nice in 1901 that everybody wanted one, and the production plant in Stuttgart went flat out over the next few years. Yet the Jelinek episode is a reminder that in the early years of the car industry, as in the early years of computers, mobile phones, and many other innovations, the inventors thought they were developing a luxury good for the upper middle classes. It took a farmer's son from Detroit to turn the car from a luxury invention into an everyman innovation, an affordable utility for ordinary people. Henry Ford revolutionised the industry after 1908, consigning steam and electric cars to history, and brought cars within the reach of the masses, changing the behaviour of human beings in so many far-reaching ways that the automobile, not the aeroplane, is the 20th century's representative technology as the steam engine was the 19th. At the start, the eccentric and single-minded Ford would have seemed an irrelevant also-ran. He developed little that was technically new. He had twice set up car companies that failed, merely to try to emulate the expensive German and French designs. He abandoned the first and was sacked from the second. His third attempt, with an unremarkable design called the Model A, almost ran out of money but sold just enough cars to keep going. 
but he had a relentless genius for cost control, and he then began making a car that was simpler than most on the market, relatively cheap, and going to get cheaper with mass production. The Model T, the famous Tin Lizzie, was robust and reliable enough to appeal to Midwestern farmers needing to get to town. By 1909, he was selling them as fast as the factory could make them and was thinking big. With so few paved roads, the main competition was still the horse. As the Ford Company argued in one of its advertisements, Old Dobbin, the family coach horse, weighs more than a Ford car, but he has only one twentieth the strength of a Ford car. Can it go as fast, nor as far? Costs more to maintain? Almost as much to acquire. So who invented the motor car running on an internal combustion engine? Like the steam engine, and as I will show later the computer, there is no simple answer. Ford made it ubiquitous and cheap. Maybach gave it all its familiar features. Levasseur provided crucial changes. Daimler got it running properly. Benz made it run on petrol. Otto devised the engine cycle. Lenoir made the first crude version and Arrivas presaged its history. And yet even this complicated history leaves out many other names. James Atkinson, Edward Butler, Rudolf Diesel, Armand Peugeot, and many more. Innovation is not an individual phenomenon, but a collective, incremental, and messy network phenomenon. The success of the internal combustion engine is mainly a thermodynamic one. As Vaclav Smil has argued, the key metric is grams per watt, how much mass it takes to generate a certain amount of energy. Human beings and draft animals operate at about a 1,000 grams per watt. Steam engines got that down to about 100 grams per watt. The Mercedes 35 HP was more like 8.5 grams per watt, and the Model T Ford just 5 grams per watt and the cost just kept on falling. In 1913, somebody earning the average American wage would have had to work 2,625 hours to earn enough to buy a Model T. In 2013, on the average wage, he or she would have needed to work just 501 hours, or 18% as long, to afford to buy a Ford Fiesta equipped with seat belts, airbags, side windows, rear view mirror, heating, oops, speedometer and windscreen wipers, none of which was in a Model T. The Tragedy and Triumph of Diesel Rudolf Diesel is an unusual innovation hero in several ways. He did not live to see the success of his device, apparently committing suicide by jumping from a ferry in the North Sea one night in 1913, while on the way to opening a diesel factory in Britain, leaving large debts behind. He was motivated as much by social justice as ambition, believing, wrongly, that he was inventing something that would decentralise industry by being used in small machines, even sewing machines. My chief accomplishment is that I have solved the social question, he said, after writing an unsuccessful book on how to organise worker-run factories. And unlike many inventors, Diesel started from first scientific principles. He became obsessed with the thermodynamics of the Carnot cycle, a theoretical idea by which an internal combustion engine could reach 100% efficiency, turning heat into work without changing temperature. In the 1890s, he strove to get some way towards this goal by inventing an engine that used excess air and high compression so that the fuel was ignited purely by compression rather than a spark. Neither of these ideas was novel, but Diesel's practical exploration of their possibilities eventually broke new ground. By 1897, thanks to the help of a more practical industrial engineer, Heinrich von Butz, he had a design of engine that worked at double the efficiency of the best gasoline engines then on the market, though it had largely abandoned many Carnot cycle features. At which point he and Butz thought they were home and dry. But getting to a reliable and affordable product proved almost impossibly difficult, 
mainly because of the challenge of making a machine that operated at high pressures. Diesel's critics said he had both claimed too much originality for his ideas and failed to make them workable. His disillusionment with life poured out in a letter written shortly before his death. The introduction of an invention is a time fraught with combating stupidity and jealousy, inertia and venom, furtive resistance and an open conflict of interests, an appalling time spent battling with people, a martyrdom to be overcome, even if the invention is a success. Yet today, diesel engines run the world. Vast diesels, the biggest of which generate more than 100,000 horsepower, drive almost all the world's large cargo ships, making global trade possible, playing a larger role in globalization, argues Vaclav Smil, than political agreements over trade. Smaller diesel engines transport goods by road and rail, and virtually every farm tractor or bulldozer runs on diesel, making the modern economy unimaginable without them. In Europe, in the early 21st century, diesels even came to dominate the car market for a while after their efficiency appealed to politicians concerned about climate change, a decision that had to be reversed when the effect on urban air quality emerged. The Right Stuff Five years before the first Model T, in the month of December 1903, on the east coast of the United States, after years of experiment, accident and disappointment, a human being was about to experience powered flight. The American government had spent $50,000 through the War Department to support the experiments of Samuel Langley, who was convinced that he could build a plane. Another $20,000 had been contributed by Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, and other friends of the aviation pioneer. Professor Langley, an astronomer, was a well-connected but rather haughty New Englander who was head of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. He insisted on complete secrecy about the details of his device, sharing his ideas with nobody outside a small circle. But the demonstration had attracted a large crowd, called the Great Aerodrome. His monstrous contraption with a 48-foot wingspan was to be launched from a track on the roof of a houseboat on the Potomac River, its gasoline-powered propeller driving it forward through the air while its two pairs of angled wings generated lift. Seven years before, in 1896, a model version with a steam-powered engine and no pilot had managed a promising 1,000 yards and 90 seconds of flight before crashing into the river. In August, a repeat of that attempt had failed, and in October, the full-scale machine with a man aboard had simply dropped ignominiously straight into the water. This December test was probably Langley's last chance, but he was confident of success. Not that Langley himself would be the pilot. He was too grand for that. That dubious privilege fell to Charles Manley, who at 4pm climbed aboard the aerodrome, pessimistically wearing a cork-lined life jacket. He powered up the engine, and after making some adjustments, blasted forward as the watching crowd held their breath. The machine curved straight up into the air, stalled, flipped backwards, began to disintegrate, and crashed into the ice-flecked river not ten yards from the houseboat. Manly clambered from the wreckage, cursing volubly. Langley's reputation never recovered. The fiasco led to an abrupt end to the government's support of powered flight after a decade of wasted money. Yet just nine days later, a few hundred miles to the south, on a windswept and sandy shoreline, near a lonely fishing settlement called Kitty Hawk, with almost nobody watching, two brothers from Ohio would indeed achieve the first powered, controlled flight after spending a tiny fraction of Langley's budget. At 10.35am on the 17th of December 1903, with Orville Wright lying on the lower of two wings to control the steering gear, and his elder brother Wilbur 
running alongside to steady the craft during takeoff. The flyer lifted smoothly from a wooden track into a stiff headwind, its gasoline engine providing thrust and its biplane wings lift. Twelve seconds and forty yards later, it touched down on its skis. Just five people were watching. Later that day, Wilbur flew the flyer for almost a minute and covered more than eight hundred feet. Where Langley had done everything wrong, spending lots of money, depending on the government, consulting few other people, building a fully-fledged device from scratch rather than inching incrementally through each of the problems to be solved, the Wrights had done everything right. As experienced bicycle makers and diligent craftsmen, they had systematically worked step by step through the challenges necessary to solve the problem of powered flight. First, they had written to and drawn upon the experience of others, especially the German designer of gliders Otto Lilienthal, who died crashing one of his gliders in 1896, and an eccentric French-American in Chicago named Octave Chanute, who had made a great study of the problems to be overcome and was himself a node in a huge network of exchanging ideas about flight. The Wrights sent Chanute 177 letters in all. The brothers also watched soaring birds obsessively. From all this research, they had gleaned crucial ideas such as the curvature of an aerofoil wing to provide lift, the concept of a biplane, and the notion of warping the wings to steer. Then in 1900, they had built a glider, taken it in parts to the windy Carolina Barrier Islands, and tried it out, at first flying it tethered like a kite, and then lying on it as it lifted into the wind while being run downhill. In 1901, despite a plague of mosquitoes and stormy weather, they camped at Kitty Hawk with two helpers and Chanute himself, having made adjustments to the design, only to find that it worked less well than the year before. The machine climbed quickly but stalled too easily. It turned out that Lilienthal's recommended ratio of the height to width of a curved wing, 1 to 12, which they had copied, was much too curved. With flatter wings, 1 to 20, the glider worked again. At this point, back in Dayton, they began to experiment with models in a wind tunnel, making thousands of laborious measurements till they had a full understanding of lift and drag. As soon as the peak of the new bicycle selling season was over in the summer, they returned to Kitty Hawk in 1902 with a third design of glider kite, made more adjustments, especially to the rudder, and learned the hard way how to pilot a device through the air, crashing frequently till they mastered the art. Bit by bit, they had put together everything except the motor. Until now, they had done nothing that could not at least in theory have been done by Leonardo da Vinci. A wooden frame with fabric covering constituted their invention. Sure, it had metal wires holding it in shape, and a sewing machine invented in the Wright's own state of Ohio not long before was indispensable in making and repairing the wings. But this was just a sort of wooden hang glider with huge wings and minimal weight, just capable of carrying a person. And it was pretty useless for any practical purpose, requiring strong wind for a lift-off, but being easily blown into a crash. The reason nobody had invented such a thing before was partly because getting to the next stage, powered flight, had never been so tantalisingly close. The Wrights, surrounded by newfangled automobiles, knew that it was the engine, the motor, that was going to make all the difference. Unlike other inventors, they had left the motor to last reasoning that it would be the least difficult thing to do because all it had to do was provide sufficient propulsion. Here they had a stroke of luck. The man they had hired to run the bicycle shop while they were away, Charlie Taylor, was a very good mechanic. He could not find a lightweight engine on the market, so he designed and built one from scratch using aluminium. It was a four-cylinder motor, and although it kept going wrong, eventually he had a version that proved reliable. Meanwhile, Orville and Wilbur tinkered with different designs for a propeller, finding the mathematics fiendishly difficult, 
and the example of a ship's propeller not especially helpful. By the autumn of 1903, all was ready. They moved to Kitty Hawk and late in the season managed at last to get into the air with a man lying behind the engine. Most aviation pioneers, like Langley, were dilettante gentlemen or scientists rather than practical craftsmen. A distinguishing feature of the Wright brothers, who lived together with their preacher father Milton and their teacher sister Catherine, was their dedication to hard work. Unmarried, uninterested in frivolity or anything remotely resembling sin, the siblings devoted their lives to working all the hours God gave, except on Sundays. They had each other as sounding boards, including Catherine, the only one with a university degree. In the photographs of the first flight, Wilbur, despite having spent many weeks in a makeshift camp and hangar on the North Carolina shore in freezing winds, is wearing a stiff collar with his black suit as if ready for church. As John Daniels, the Kitty Hawk resident who took the photograph, put it, they were the workingest boys I ever knew. It wasn't luck that made them fly. It was hard work and common sense. Even after the first flight, news of which was largely ignored by the world as highly implausible given the humble non-graduate nature of the inventors, the Wright brothers continued to tinker with and tune their designs till they were able to take off without a headwind, using a catapult, turn slow circles in the air and stay up for minutes at a time. By 1905, at a field outside Dayton, Ohio, Wilbur had set a record of 24 miles of continuous flying. Yet even the local papers still did not catch on to what was happening under their noses, while the grandee commentators at Scientific American, even as late as 1906, saw fit to dismiss rumours about the claims of the brothers with patrician sarcasm in an article entitled the right aeroplane and its fabled performances. If such sensational and tremendously important experiments are being conducted in a not very remote part of the country on a subject in which almost everybody feels the most profound interest, is it possible to believe that the enterprising American reporter would not have ascertained all about them long ago? Apparently so. Even when people did believe the Wright brothers, they doubted the value of what they'd done. Our scepticism is only as to the utilitarian value of any present or possible achievement of the aeroplane. We do not believe it will ever be a commercial vehicle at all, opined the engineering magazine. The United States War Department replied to the Wright brothers' offer to demonstrate their flyer with a flat refusal, its mind made up by the Langley fiasco. When Wilbur travelled to France in 1907 and 1908, having signed a lucrative contract that would pay out if he could demonstrate powered flight and meet certain targets, he was still widely mocked as a bluffer. On the day set for his demonstration at a horse racing track at Le Mans, on the 8th of August 1908, a small crowd gathered, which included the grandee sceptic Ernest Archdeacon of the Aero Club de France who continued to scorn the claims of the rights to all who would listen, even while the crowd waited. Hours went by as Wright prepared the machine, and scepticism grew. The shock and excitement when he finally powered into the air at 6.30pm was extreme. He turned to the left, flew back past the crowd, turned another circle, and dropped smoothly back onto the grass after two minutes aloft at about 35 feet. The enthusiasm was indescribable, said Le Figaro. C'est merveilleux, cried Louis Blériot, who was there. Il n'est pas bluffeur, shouted somebody, perhaps at Monsieur Archdeacon. Meanwhile, at Fort Myer, near Washington, Orville was also wowing the crowds with a duplicate flying machine. On the 9th of September, he twice stayed in the air for more than an hour, circling the field more than 50 times. From then on, the two rights were huge celebrities, fated wherever they went. Their rivals scrambled to catch up. Within a year, 22 pilots went aloft at an air festival in Reims, watched by a crowd of 200,000, and Blériot had crossed the English Channel in a flimsy monoplane. Just ten years later, in June 1919, 
John Alcock and Arthur Brown crossed the Atlantic non-stop from Nova Scotia to Ireland in 16 hours through fog, snow and rain. The First World War had by then given rapid impetus to the development of designs and flying skills, though much of it would have happened anyway. A long slog was still needed to turn the invention of powered flight into an innovation of use to society. Some of the Wright's ideas were dropped, a forward elevator proved too unstable, and warping the whole wing to steer worked less well than having hinged flaps or ailerons. But their general discovery that to control an aircraft in a turn it was necessary to use the wings to achieve the roll and the rudder to control the yaw was crucial. The rights themselves soon became rich through prizes and contracts, yet were also embroiled in exhausting legal battles as they sought to defend their patents. Wilbur died of typhoid in 1912, at the age of 45. Catherine died in 1929, Orville in 1948. Looking back, the Kitty Hawk moment of 1903 was bound to stand out, because there was only ever going to be one instant when a powered plane left the ground in controlled conditions. But in truth, it was a step in a lengthy evolutionary path that began with strange, usually fatal attempts by eccentrics to leap into the air with big flapping wings. Likewise, the Wright's design continued to evolve gradually into the airliners, supersonic jets, helicopters and drones of today. It is a continuum. There is little doubt that somebody would have got planes into the air within the first decade of the 20th century, even without the rights. Motors made it inevitable that many people would then try, and trial and error was all that was really needed. Indeed, because so few people believed the rights at first, the Paris Herald called them flyers or liars in 1906, the rival pioneers of powered flight, in France especially, such as Clément Adé, Alberto Santos Dumont, Henri Farmont and Louis Blériot had begun quite independently hopping off the ground with propellers and wings more or less effectively and with more or less control. To Orville Wright's fury, the Smithsonian tried to rewrite history in 1914, resurrecting Langley's aerodrome, secretly modifying it, flying it briefly then removing the modifications before putting it on display along with the claim that Langley had therefore designed the first machine capable of powered flight. The Wright's flyer was not installed in the Smithsonian Museum until 1948, after Orville's death. International Rivalry and the Jet Engine the turbine is the most efficient prime mover known, so it is possible that it will be developed for aircraft, especially if some means of driving it by petrol could be devised, wrote young Frank Whittle in 1928, in a thesis on future aircraft design. He soon followed this in 1930 with a patent on his own design for a jet. By that date, the idea of the jet already had a fairly long history, including a patent taken out on a design for an axial-flow turbojet engine for planes in France by Maxime Guillaume in 1921, which Whittle did not know about. Bigger gas turbines were already in use running factories in France and Germany before this date, though they were far too inefficient to be adapted for flight. But coming up with the idea of jet propulsion was a very long way from actually building a jet plane, as Whittle was about to find out. Finding materials for compressors and turbine blades that could withstand immensely high pressure and red-hot temperature while rotating at high speed was a tall order. As was the case with the steam engine in the early 1700s, and is the case with nuclear fusion today, innovation in materials is vital to realising an advance that can be conceived but not built. The engineer Alan Griffith had already been secretly wrestling with this problem at Britain's Royal Aircraft Establishment since 1926. Griffith had published a key paper, An Aerodynamic Theory of Turbine Design, in that year, explaining the poor performance of all turbines. The blade shape was wrong, 
and they were flying stalled. Aerofoil shapes of the kind used by the Wright brothers proved much better. Griffith was now trying to come up with an axial flow turbojet to drive a propeller in a two stage engine, a forerunner of the turboprop. When Whittle, a newly commissioned pilot officer, approached him, Griffith was welcoming but mildly discouraging, writing that the performance of both compressors and turbines will have to be greatly improved before a jet would work. Whittle remembered this differently much later as a snub, yet the Royal Air Force generously sent Whittle to Cambridge to study engineering, and it was from there that he wrote to a friend in May 1935, saying that I have allowed the patent to lapse. Nobody would touch it on account of the enormous cost of the experimental work, and I don't think they were far wrong, although I still have every faith in the invention. Just six months later, in November 1935, Hans Joachim Pabst von Ohain filed a patent for a jet engine in Germany based on his diploma at Göttingen University, where he was unaware of Whittle's work, or Griffiths's, or Guillaume's. Ohain had a better reception from German industry, and in March 1937 his engine was ready for its first test run at the Heinkel plant in Rostock. A month later, Whittle's design also came into existence and ran for the first time at the British Thompson Houston Company in rugby. Whittle had revived his project as a company, Power Jets, with the backing of industrialists in 1935. As examples of simultaneous innovation go, this parallel story of Whittle and O'Hein, with its almost exact matches in date, is extreme, but the general phenomenon surprisingly common. The parallels continued. O'Hein's jet engine got a Heinkel plane into the air well before Whittle's, the first flight happening on the 27th of August 1939, just a few days before the invasion of Poland began the Second World War. Whittle's engine got a Gloucester plane into the air on the 15th of May 1941. Both Germany and Britain had jet fighters in combat for the first time in the same month. The Gloucester meteor shortly after the 17th of July 1944 the Messerschmitt 262 on the 25th of July. But although they were fast, they had little influence on the war, being limited in range. Britain gave America the technology during the war, and American jets were also aloft by the end of the war. Later, Whittle, somewhat embittered and without much financial reward, wrote his memoirs as a tale of lonely genius struggling against official bureaucratic and corporate resistance but subsequent historians have revised this account, finding that the British government and British industry were actually fairly receptive, at least by their sluggish standards, to Whittle's ideas, and that the story of the jet was a much more collective effort than it seems at first. Indeed, the main design for jet engines today uses Griffiths' axial flow, whereas Whittle used centrifugal flow. As Andrew Nahum has put it, rather few historians, or indeed engineers, given a moment to reflect, would now assert that there would have been no jet engine without Whittle. The same could be said of O'Hein. Both were brilliant pioneers who affected the course that history took, but the jet engine would have happened without them. Curiously, they did not meet until 1966, when O'Hein was working for the US Air Force and Whittle was long retired. Like radar and the computer, the jet is often thought to be a product of wartime inventiveness. But as in those other cases, the key work was actually done long before hostilities broke out, both in Britain and in Germany, and it is impossible to know just how fast the jet would have been developed and commercialised in an alternative universe in which the 1940s were prosperous and peaceful. After the Second World War, the race to improve and perfect the jet engine for passenger aircraft as well as for military planes, was mainly carried out within three big companies, Pratt & Whitney, General Electric and Rolls-Royce. The heroic age was over. Now it was teams of engineers doing thousands of experiments and reams of calculations, incrementally inching up the power and efficiency of jet engines in turning heat into work until they reached today's 40% compared with just 10% in O'Hein's and Whittle's first jets. Innovation in safety and cost 
The truly extraordinary improvement in the safety record of air travel is an example of gradual but pervasive innovation with real impact. In 2017, for the first time, there was no death as a result of a commercial passenger jet crashing. There were fatal crashes involving cargo planes, private planes and propeller aircraft, but no commercial passenger jets. Yet that year also saw a record 37 million commercial flights. The number of airline accident fatalities in the world has declined steadily from over 1,000 people a year in the 1990s to just 59 in 2017, even as the number of people flying has greatly increased. The general trend remains true despite the two accidents suffered in 2018 in Indonesia, 189 fatalities, and 2019 in Ethiopia, 157 fatalities, by Boeing 737 MAX 8 planes, caused by computer error. These two exceptional tragedies underlined just how rare such accidents had become and resulted in the grounding of the entire fleet of such planes. The comparison with half a century ago is even starker. There are now more than ten times as many people in the air at any one time as there were in 1970. Yet according to the Aviation Safety Network the number of fatalities was more than 10 times greater in the earlier year. In 1970, there were 3,218 fatalities per trillion revenue passenger kilometres. In 2018, there were just 59, a 54-fold decline. In America, you are now at least 700 times more likely to die in a car per mile travelled than in a plane. The decline in air accidents is as steep and impressive as the decline in the cost of microchips as a result of Moore's Law. How has this been achieved? The answer, as with most innovation, is that it happened incrementally as a result of many different people trying many different things. To take an early example, in the 1940s, Alphonse Chapinis, tasked with identifying the causes of accidents in the Army Air Corps, noticed that tired pilots were sometimes retracting the landing gear instead of the flaps as they touched down. The controls for the two were identical in shape and next to each other. He recommended changing both the location and the shape of the controls so that wheel controls looked like wheels and flap controls looked like flaps. More generally, it is the widespread use of dull low-tech but vital practices such as crew resource management techniques and checklists galore with cross-checking between crew members and a culture of challenge that have made the big difference since the 1970s. In 1992, an Air Antair flight on a modern Airbus 320 crashed into a mountain while coming into land at Strasbourg Airport, killing 87 of 96 people on board. The weather was snowy, it was dark, but many more factors contributed to the accident, all of them avoidable. The primary cause was that the crew selected the wrong mode in the flight management and guidance system, vertical speed mode instead of flight path angle mode. This mistake was too easy to make and too hard to spot. This meant that when they entered the number 33 the aircraft began descending at 3,300 feet per minute instead of at 3.3 degrees. But the display did not make this clear enough. That air traffic control had given the crew a wrong fix, causing confusion on the flight deck, and that the crew were not communicating well or cross-checking with each other, contributed too. Finally, the aircraft was not equipped with a ground proximity warning system, because it was thought likely to produce too many false alarms in mountainous regions. As cases like this show, there are multiple factors of technology, procedure and psychology that safety designers have to get right in making flight safer. Most crucial of all is learning from mistakes, such as this accident, by openly and transparently sharing the results of accident investigations all around the world. The astonishing safety record of the modern airline industry has been achieved quite literally by trial and error. Its methods have since been emulated in other walks of life, such as surgery and offshore oil and gas exploration. This improvement in safety has happened in an era of deregulation and falling prices. Far from leading to cut corners and risk-taking, 
The great democratization of the airline industry over the past half century, with its fast turnarounds, no frills service and cheap tickets, has coincided with a safety revolution. Herb Kelleher, who died in 2019 at the age of 87, is a strong candidate for the most prominent hero of the budget airline revolution. He founded Southwest Airlines in 1967, in an era when commercial flight was run as a cartel of government-sponsored and often nationalized carriers. Flights between states within America were determined entirely by the government, with airlines taking instruction from the Civil Aeronautics Board when setting prices and deciding on routes. Kelleher therefore decided that his airline could not leave Texas initially. Even so, three existing airlines immediately got a restraining order to prevent him flying. He lost court case after court case against this cartel, until the Texas Supreme Court ruled unanimously in his favour. Even then the legal battles persisted, but Kelleher was a lawyer and knew how to fight them. As the author Gibran Khan related, two airlines, Braniff and Texas International, lodged complaints against him with the Federal Civil Aeronautics Board. But Kelleher argued his case in court and won, the board dismissing the objections. The two airlines found another judge, who had ruled against Southwest a few years earlier in another case, and got another injunction. The Texas Supreme Court went into emergency session and overturned the injunction. In 1977, Braniff and Texas International would be indicted for conspiring to monopolize the industry. Southwest took to the skies at last in 1971, and by 1973 it was profitable despite offering low fares. It remains so to this day, an unmatched record in an industry scarred by bankruptcies and mergers. Gallagher's innovations included the simple idea that flight attendants should be encouraged to crack jokes, and when a flight is ready to take off but the food has not arrived, to take a straw poll among the passengers as to whether to wait for the food. The vote usually goes for not waiting. In 1974, the government set ticket prices on airlines, and the minimum for a standard-class ticket from New York to Los Angeles was more than $1,550 in today's dollars. Today, it is a fraction of that. Many imitators of Kelleher's initiative have since followed the same path of cost-cutting with various degrees of success, from Freddie Laker to Michael O'Leary to Björn Kjos, the founder of Norwegian Air. These are the true transport innovators of today, the heirs to Stevenson and Ford. Pause in awe at what innovation does. For the entire history of humanity before the 1820s, nobody had travelled faster than a galloping horse, certainly not with a heavy cargo. Yet in the 1820s, suddenly without an animal in sight, just a pile of minerals, a fire and a little water, hundreds of people and tons of stuff are flying along at breakneck speed. The simplest ingredients, which had always been there, can produce the most improbable outcome if combined in ingenious ways. Early in the following century, people are taking to the air or piloting their own carriages along roads, once again just through the rearrangement of molecules and atoms in patterns far from thermodynamic equilibrium. Chapter 4. Food No potatoes, no potpourri. The Mob, 1765 The Tasty Tuber the potato was once an innovation in the old world, having been brought back from the Andes by conquistadors. It provides a neat case history of the ease and difficulty with which new ideas and products diffuse through society. Potatoes are the most productive major food plant, yielding three times as much energy per acre as grain. They were domesticated about 8,000 years ago in the high Andes, above 3,000 metres, from a wild plant with hard and toxic tubers. Quite how and why people managed to select a nutritious plant from such a dangerous ancestor remains shrouded in the mists of time, but it probably happened somewhere near Lake Titicaca. Francisco Pizarro and his band of conquerors encountered the potato and ate it 
while decapitating and looting the Inca Empire in the 1530s. But the conquistadors' emphasis was on taking their familiar old world crops and animals to the new world more than vice versa. So it was at least three decades before the potato appeared on the eastern side of the Atlantic. Maize, tomatoes and tobacco got back to the old world much quicker. The first definite account of potatoes grown on the eastern side of the Atlantic comes from the Canary Islands, where the archives of the public notary in Las Palmas de Gran Canaria contains a list of the goods shipped by Juan de Molina to his brother Luis de Quesada in Antwerp on the 28th of November 1567. Three medium-sized barrels which you state contain potatoes and oranges and green lemons. Slow to arrive, the potato was slow to catch on in Europe. Against it was a combination of practice and prejudice. Being from the tropics, potatoes were adapted to 12-hour days and would not produce tubers in the longer days of European summers, so it was autumn before they fruited, and then, disappointingly. It was probably in the Canaries that selection and breeding gradually solved this problem. As for prejudice... Clergymen forbade their parishioners from eating potatoes in England as late as the early 18th century for the magnificently stupid reason that they are not mentioned in the Bible. Somehow, probably with an Irish flavour to the argument, the English turned this into a belief that potatoes were Roman Catholic agents. In Lewis, in Sussex, the crowd shouted, No potatoes, no popery, during an election in 1765. Yet in rainy Lancashire and in Ireland, the potato's ability to yield reliable harvests, even in wet years when the grain crop rotted, proved irresistible. In 1664, one John Forster wrote a pamphlet urging the king to make money from royalties on potato growing. He offered, in the title alone, a sure and easy remedy against all succeeding dear years— by a plantation of the roots called potatoes, whereof, with the addition of wheat flour, excellent, good and wholesome bread may be made every year, eight or nine months together, for half the charge as formerly. The potato also had to overcome a loopy doctrine, taught by what passed for intellectuals in those days, that plants were good at curing the diseases they most resembled. Walnuts, looking like brains, were good for mental illness. God liked to drop hints. This idea was started in the 1500s by the alchemist and astrologer Paracelsus, real name Theophrastus von Hohenheim, and credulously repeated by various herbalists in the 16th century. Since potatoes supposedly resembled fingers with leprosy, but since leprosy was very rare people were somehow induced to think that potatoes might cause leprosy. In 1748, the French Parliament, in an early example of the precautionary principle later to inhibit the use of genetic modification, banned the growing of potatoes for human food, just in case they did cause leprosy. Deterred by such fears, continental Europeans and North Americans only slowly came to like growing and eating potatoes. Indeed, the potato may have spread more rapidly in India and China in the 1600s than in Europe. It took to the Himalayas especially well, being reminded, no doubt, of the Andes. In 18th century continental Europe, the potato as a field crop, rather than a garden delicacy, appears to have spread south from the coast of what is now Belgium and northwest from Alsace, with Luxembourg getting into the habit of growing potatoes in the 1760s and most of Germany by the end of the 1770s. One of the factors that overcame resistance was war. In a world dependent on wheat and barley, invading armies stripped the barns of stored grain and of animals and trampled or grazed the crops, leaving the population to starve. Potatoes, however, often survived these depredations, being in the ground during the campaigning season and taking too much trouble for soldiers to lift. Farmers who planted potatoes therefore tended to survive better during wars, spreading the habit. As John Reader recounts, the result of Frederick the Great's wars was that the potato, unknown or despised in most of Central and Eastern Europe in 1700, 
had by 1800 become an indispensable part of the European diet. France lagged behind. The French took nervous note of the rich and fattening diet the Prussians were now on, and the demographic threat they thus posed. Here, at last, late in the story, we get a glimpse of an individual as potato innovator, at least according to legend. Antoine Augustin Parmentier was an apothecary working with the French army who rather carelessly managed to get himself captured no fewer than five times by the Prussians during the Seven Years' War. They fed him on nothing but potatoes, and he was surprised to see himself growing plump and healthy on the diet. On his return to France in 1763, he devoted himself to proselytising the benefits of the potato as the solution to France's repeated famines. With grain prices high after poor harvests, he was pushing at an open door. Parmentier was a bit of a showman, and he devised a series of publicity stunts to get his message across. He got the attention of the Queen, Marie Antoinette, and persuaded her to wear potato flowers in her hair, supposedly after a contrived encounter in the gardens of Versailles. He planted a field of potatoes on the outskirts of Paris and posted guards to protect it, knowing that the presence of the guards would itself advertise the value of the crop and attract hungry thieves at night when the guards were mysteriously absent. He gave dinners of potato cuisine to people of influence, including Benjamin Franklin. But he was also scientific in his approach. His Examen Chimique de Pommes de Terre, published in 1773, a year after the Parliament had repealed the ban on potatoes, praised the nutrient contents of potatoes. In 1789, on the brink of revolution and against a background of widespread hunger, the king ordered Parmentier to produce another treatise on the culture and use of the potato, as well as other roots. Not that this saved the king's head. It was left to the revolutionaries to reap the full benefits, growing potatoes in the gardens of the Tuileries, preventing mass starvation during the first commune. In Ireland, the potato fueled a population explosion that soon threatened to be a Malthusian disaster. The rapidly growing population of the early 19th century tilled every acre they could find, reaching a higher density of people per acre than anywhere in Europe, with large families managing to survive to adulthood, but in increasingly desperate poverty as land was divided among offspring. As Cecil Woodham Smith details in her book, The Great Hunger in the Early 1800s, no fewer than 114 commissions and 61 special committees were instructed to report on the state of Ireland, and without exception their finding prophesied disaster. Ireland was on the verge of starvation, her population rapidly increasing, three-quarters of her labourers unemployed, housing conditions appalling and the standards of living unbelievably low. The crash came in 1845 when a parasitic blight fungus, Phytophthora infestans, that the potato plant had left behind in the Andes, reached Ireland via the United States. That September, throughout Ireland, the potato crops rotted in the fields, both above and below ground. Even stored potatoes turned black and putrid. Within a few years, a million people had died of starvation, malnutrition and disease, and at least another million had emigrated. The Irish population, which had reached over 8 million, plunged and has still not returned to the level it was in 1840. Similar, if less severe, famines caused by blight drove Norwegians, Danes and Germans across the Atlantic. Today, the potato is experiencing a new wave of innovation. The invention of synthetic fungicides in the 1960s enabled potato farmers to keep the disease at bay, but only by spraying their crops on an almost weekly basis or up to 15 times in a season. Then, in 2017, the United States approved the release of new potato varieties that are resistant to blight. These had been developed by the J.R. Simplot Company in Idaho by genetic modification, specifically through the introduction of a disease resistance gene from a variety of potato found in Argentina. The new variety requires little, if any, spraying. 
Other blight-resistant varieties developed by gene editing are also coming to the market. How Fertilizer Fed the World Fritz Haber's 1908 discovery of how to fix nitrogen from the air to make ammonia by reacting it with hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst under pressure stands as one of the key innovations of all time. Not just for the immense impact it had on feeding the world and defeating famine, nor just for the less benign effect of making the manufacture of explosives much easier but because it was an unusual example of solving an apparently impossible problem. How to make useful compounds of nitrogen out of the air, which is largely made of molecular nitrogen, was a challenge that everybody could see was well worth solving. But by the time Harbour did it, most people had concluded that it was as hard to solve as the alchemist's dream of turning lead into gold and might never yield. This is an example of an innovation that the world demanded and got. That nitrogen was a limiting nutrient in the growing of crops had been known, at least vaguely, for centuries. It led farmers to beg, borrow and steal any source of manure, urea or urine they could find. Try as they might, though, they struggled to apply enough nitrogen to enable their crops to realise their full potential. The best way involved not just manure from cattle, pigs and people, but break crops of peas and beans. These legumes thrived without manure because they could somehow fix nitrogen from the air and left the soil enriched for the next year's crop as well. If they could do it, why not a factory? The science that explained this hunger for nitrogen came much later with the discovery that every building block in a protein or DNA molecule must contain several nitrogen atoms, and that though the air consisted mostly of nitrogen atoms, they were bound together in tight pairs, triple covalent bonds between each pair of atoms. Vast energy was needed to break these bonds and make nitrogen useful. In the tropics, frequent lightning strikes provided such energy, keeping the land a little more fertile, while in paddy rice agriculture, Algae and other plants fix nitrogen from the air to replenish the soil. Temperate farms, growing crops such as wheat, were very often nitrogen-limited, if not nitrogen-starved. In 1843, a field called Broadbulk was set aside at Rothamsted in Hertfordshire to demonstrate the effect of fertiliser. One strip of the field has been planted every year since then with winter wheat, and with no fertiliser of any kind. It became a tired and desolate site, yielding less and less grain, till by 1925 it was able to produce less than half a tonne from every hectare, a small fraction of that which could be harvested from a part of the field that received farmyard manure or nitrate fertiliser. After 1925, fallow was introduced into the rotation so that the land could recover some nitrogen from wild clover every other year. Yield rose on the untreated strip, but only to modest levels. The lesson for humanity is obvious. Without a continuous input of nitrogen, from crops grown elsewhere, or at other times and perhaps fed to cattle or people first and turned into manure, farming cannot feed people sustainably. During the 19th century, this did not matter all that much. The plough marched west into the prairies, east into the steppes, and south into the pampas and the outback, breaking virgin soil that had been denuded of its wild grazing herds and its native people, and unleashing its fertile potential. More land fed more mouths. That the land soon became exhausted and less replenished by manure or clover mattered, but there was always new land to break. Westward ho! It did not help that there was a competing demand for nitrogen. Kings and conquerors also coveted ionised nitrogen, not that they knew it as such, with which to make gunpowder and wage war. In 1626, for instance, King Charles I of England ordered his subjects to carefully and constantly keep and preserve in some convenient vessels or receptacles fit for the purpose all the urine of man during the whole year and all the stale of beasts which they can save. 
and with this to make saltpetre the basic ingredient of gunpowder. Farmers all over the world were forced to make saltpetre from manure and pay it as a tax to support the monopoly on violence claimed by their rulers, thus depriving their fields of a source of fertiliser. One of the motives for the British conquest of Bengal was to gain access to the rich saltpetre deposits at the mouth of the Ganges. In the early 1800s, the world stumbled upon a huge mother load of fixed nitrogen, combined with two other elements vital to plants, phosphorus and potassium. Off the coast of Peru were some small islands in a sea rich in fish. This combination of circumstances attracted millions of breeding birds, mainly shags and boobies. Since it almost never rained here to wash the islands clean, their rich droppings had accumulated century after century till there was a grey guano soil hundreds of feet deep, steeped in urea, ammonium, phosphate and potassium. Perfect for enriching yields of farms. Over the middle decades of the 19th century, millions of tonnes of guano were mined in horrific conditions by mainly Chinese indentured labourers who were little more than slaves to satisfy the needs of farmers in Britain and other parts of Europe. Ships queued for months to await the chance to load the dusty and foul-smelling cargo. Desperate to get access to guano, the American Congress passed an act saying that any American who found a guano island in the Pacific could claim it for the United States, which is why so many mid-Pacific atolls belong to America today. Few islands proved as rich as the Chinchas of Peru. The Namibian coast had a similar combination of rich sea and dry desert air, and a Liverpool merchant opened a guano mine here on Ichaboe Island in 1843. By 1845, he was filling up to 400 ships, steadily reducing the height of the island and fighting pitch battles with rival miners. But Ichaboe and the Chinchas soon began to run out of guano. Today, cormorants, boobies and penguins are back on the islands, slowly rebuilding the guano. The guano boom made great fortunes, but by the 1870s it was over. It was succeeded by a boom in Chilean saltpetre, or salitre, a rich nitrate salt that could be made by boiling caliche, a mineral found in abundance in the Atacama Desert, the result of desiccated ancient seas uplifted into the mountains and left undissolved by the extreme dryness of the climate. Though the mines and refineries were mostly in Peru and Bolivia, it was Chileans who worked them, and in 1879 Chile declared war and captured the key provinces, cutting Bolivia off from the sea and amputating part of Peru. By 1900, Chile was producing two-thirds of the world's fertiliser and much of its explosive. But the best deposits of Chilean nitrate, too, were soon showing signs of running out. It is against this background that a speech by a famous British chemist suddenly caught the world's attention. Sir William Crookes, a wealthy and independent scientist and spiritualist, famous for discovering thallium, isolating helium and inventing the cathode ray tube, was elected president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in 1898. This was a year-long job that brought with it the obligation at the end to make a formal speech and say something profound. He chose to speak about the wheat problem, namely the looming probability that the world would be starving by 1930 unless a way could be made to synthesize nitrogen fertilizer to replace Chilean nitrate, wheat being then by far the largest crop in the world. Crookes's warnings were noticed especially in Germany, a country that was using larger and larger sailing ships to import more Chilean nitrate than any other nation in order to support a growing population. As Britain went to war with South African Boers of Dutch and German extraction, the year after Crookes's speech, a distinguished German chemist named Wilhelm Ostwald began to wonder, what if there were a war and Britain's Royal Navy cut off the Chilean trade as a way of depriving Germany of the raw material with which to make gunpowder and fertiliser. Ostwald 
joined the race to fix nitrogen from the air. But instead of using electricity, as most were trying, he tried chemical catalysts, especially iron. In 1900, he thought he had succeeded in making ammonium, but Carl Bosch, employed by the BASF Chemical Company to check before they bought his patents, discovered that it was a mirage. The ammonia was a contaminant of the iron derived from iron nitride. Ostwald retired hurt. Enter Fritz Haber, an ambitious, prickly, restless genius, sensitive about his Jewish background and suspecting, rightly, that anti-Semitic discrimination was holding him back from the glittering prizes that were his due, but also fiercely nationalistic on behalf of Imperial Germany, Harbour too saw the fixing of nitrogen as a golden goal. It would effectively make bread from air, in the arresting phrase of Harbour's modern biographer, Thomas Hager. In 1907, Harbour had a feud with Walter Nernst, Ostwald's protégé, when he first claimed to have made ammonia in small quantities using heat and a catalyst. Nernst said Harbour could not possibly have made even as little as he claimed. Furious, Harbour returned to the laboratory determined to prove Nernst wrong, but also having picked up a hint from Nernst that using very high pressure might work. He soon found that the higher the pressure, the lower the temperature at which the reaction worked. This was crucial because very high temperature caused the ammonia to self-destruct almost as soon as it was formed. Harbour's assistant, Robert Le Rossignol, gradually figured out, step by step, how to hold the ingredients together at high pressure inside a chamber drilled out of solid quartz. There was no single moment of breakthrough, just a number of small improvements and incremental advances, writes Hager. It was at this point that Harbour approached BASF, the giant chemical company that had grown rich from making synthetic indigo dye and was looking for a second act. BASF was determined to crack nitrogen fixation, but thought electricity was the way to go. It invested in Harbour's idea mainly as a fallback. It gave him a laboratory, a big budget, 10% of any sales, and the chance to stay on at Karlsruhe University. With BASF's money and expertise, Harbour and Le Rossignol were able to push their experiments above 100 atmospheres of pressure, the equivalent of a mile beneath the surface of the sea, and to drop the temperature from over 1,000 degrees centigrade to 600 degrees centigrade. But the results were disappointingly far from being commercially viable, so Harbour began to try different catalysts. Like Edison seeking the right material for a filament in a light bulb, Harbour cast about for different metals, almost at random, and indeed it was from lighting filaments that he eventually stumbled upon osmium, a dense, shiny, blue-black metal element usually found alongside platinum and first described in 1804. In March 1909, Harbour watched liquid ammonia dribble out of the apparatus at the second test of an osmium catalyst. He had no idea why osmium worked, but it did. He immediately proposed to BASF that they scale up his idea. The company was sceptical. Osmium was rare and expensive, while a manufacturing plant running at 100 atmospheres of pressure without exploding was impossible to imagine, let alone build at a reasonable price. But Carl Bosch, the man who had exposed Ostwald's failure nine years before and was now in charge of nitrogen research at BASF, argued for giving it a go, mainly because he was out of other ideas. Over the next few years, Bosch turned Harbour's invention into a practical innovation solving problem after problem in the quest to build a factory rather than a toy, to produce ammonia by the tonne rather than by the teaspoon, and to do so more cheaply than it could be shipped from Chile. He first bought up almost the world's entire supply of osmium, a few hundred kilograms, but it was not enough. Harbour discovered that uranium worked also, although not as well, 
but it was not much cheaper or more abundant. So Bosch set up a plant in which new catalysts could be tested and new designs for containing the high-pressure ingredients at the same time. It was kept behind a strong wall so that it could explode without killing people. Eventually, Bosch's assistant, Alvin Mitash, went back to pure iron, then iron compounds, and found one sample of magnetite from Sweden that got good results. Some impurity in the magnetite made the iron into a good catalyst. By the end of 1909, they had settled on a mixture of iron, aluminium and calcium. It worked as well as osmium, but was far cheaper. Mitash went on searching for still better catalysts, testing over 20,000 different materials, but he never improved on the iron mixture. BASF made Harbour keep quiet about the catalyst, though it allowed him to announce the breakthrough with osmium in 1910, giving the firm tacit knowledge that kept it in the lead. Vast challenges remained. How to purify nitrogen from the air? How to make enough hydrogen out of steam exposed to hot coke without including carbon monoxide in the gas too? How to achieve unprecedentedly high pressures? How to contain such pressures at red-hot temperatures? How to feed in the gases and extract the ammonia? The team grew into the biggest group of scientists and engineers before the Manhattan Project. The Harbour Bosch story, like so many about innovation, is often told as one of brilliant insight by academic, Harbour, followed by inevitable application by businessman, Bosch. But this is wrong. Far more ingenuity was needed during Bosch's perspiration than during Harbour's inspiration. As Hager recounts, none of these challenges could be overcome without access to the ideas being developed in other industries. A fine example of how innovation thrives in an ecosystem of innovation. Bosch's teams looked for design hints in locomotive engines, gasoline engines and the new engine that Rudolf Diesel had invented. Bosch and his engineers met with men from the German steel industry, learned about the Bessemer process for making steel, talked with Krupp's representatives about cannon design and new advances in metallurgy. He set teams to work designing quick-acting valves, self-closing valves, slide valves, pumps reciprocating and circulating, large and small, temperature monitors of all sorts and sizes, pressure balances, density recorders, trip alarms, colorimeters, high-pressure pipe fittings. Everything had to be rugged, leak-proof, functional at high temperature and under enormous pressure. The ovens had the potential of exploding like small bombs. Bosch wanted to make sure that they could be carefully monitored and quickly shut down if something started to go wrong. He wanted perfect reliability and lightning speed. He wanted a machine that combined the strength of a sumo wrestler, the speed of a sprinter and the grace of a ballerina. For six months, Bosch was held up by an apparently insuperable problem that hydrogen infiltrated the steel walls of the ovens and weakened them, leading them to explode after a few days. He tried different alloys, but nothing helped. Only by rethinking his whole approach and using a sacrificial layer of weaker steel within and boring small holes to exhaust the hydrogen from between the two layers was he able to control this problem. By 1911, he had prototypes running continuously and producing ammonia cheaply, so long as you wrote off the costs of developing the system. As so often, intellectual property now got in the way. The rival firm Hoechst, advised by Ostwald, challenged Harbour's patent on the production of ammonia with heat and pressure, arguing that Nernst had started the whole idea under Ostwald's direction. BASF, Facing ruin, simply bought off Nernst with a lucrative five-year contract in exchange for his testifying on their side in court. The company's huge factory at Oppau began producing ammonia in late 1913, just in time for the First World War. Germany had a store of chili and nitrate to use for making explosive that it thought would last a short war, and it captured more when Antwerp fell into German hands but when the war bogged down in trench stalemate and the Royal Navy sank a German fleet that had been blockading their Chilean nitrate trade in a battle off the Falkland Islands, 
Germany faced the prospect of running out of fixed nitrogen to make explosives for guns and fertilizer for fields, just as Ostwald had feared. In the short run, it began to make small amounts of nitrate using electricity in the expensive cyanamid process using electricity and calcium carbide. Then, in September 1914, Bosch made the famous saltpeter promise that he could convert the Opau plant so that it turned ammonia into nitrate using a newly discovered iron bismuth catalyst. He built an even bigger plant at Loina, producing huge quantities of nitrate and thus probably prolonging the war. Harbour, in the meantime, had invented gas warfare, personally presiding over the first chlorine attack at Ypres in March 1915. After the Great War, the Harbour Bosch process was used throughout the world to fix nitrogen on a grand scale. The process became steadily more efficient, especially once natural gas was substituted for coal as the source of energy and hydrogen. Today, ammonia plants use about one-third as much energy to make a tonne of ammonia as they did in Bosch's day. About 1% of global energy is used in nitrogen fixation and that provides about half of all fixed nitrogen atoms in the average human being's food. It was synthetic fertilizer that enabled Europe, the Americas, China and India to escape mass starvation and consign famine largely to the history books. The annual death rate from famine in the 1960s was 100 times greater than in the 2010s. The so-called Green Revolution of the 1960s and 1970s was about new varieties of crop, but the key feature of these new varieties was that they could absorb more nitrogen and yield more food without collapsing. See next section. If Haber and Bosch had not achieved their near-impossible innovation, the world would have ploughed every possible acre, felled every forest and drained every wetland, yet would be teetering on the brink of starvation, just as William Crookes had forecast. Yet, as I write this, it is possible to glimpse a future in which the Haber-Bosch process is redundant. In 1988, two Brazilian scientists, Joanna Derberiner and Vladimir Cavalcanti, noticed something peculiar. Some fields of sugarcane were producing consistent yields without having received any fertilizer for decades. They searched inside the plant tissues and found a bacterium, Gluconacetobacter diazotrephicus, that was fixing nitrogen from the air. This ability is found in legumes, such as peas and beans, thanks to a symbiosis between the plants and bacteria that live in special nodules on the roots, but all attempts to persuade crops like maize and wheat to emulate this legume habit had so far failed. Perhaps this new bacterium, which lived inside the plant and did not need special nodules, might do better. A sample of the bacteria reached Professor Ted Cocking of Nottingham University, and he soon persuaded the bacterium to live inside the actual cells of various species of plant, Remarkable improvements in the yield and protein content of maize, wheat and rice were soon being shown in field trials. In 2018, the company Cocking founded with David Dent, Azotic, announced that it was going to market the bacteria as a seed dressing to American farmers. If this simple fix succeeds, it may prove possible to feed the world without ammonia made in factories. Dwarfing Genes from Japan Around the time that Bosch was perfecting the fixation of air, on the other side of the world, a plant breeder was pursuing a different innovation that would prove vital to the application of Bosch's product. In 1917, at the Central Agricultural Experiment Station in Nishigahara, near Tokyo, somebody, it is not clear who, decided to cross two varieties of wheat. One was called Glassy Fultz, and it was derived from a wheat variety imported from the United States in 1892. The other was a native Japanese variety of dwarf stature, known as Daruma. The resulting wheat, Fultz Daruma, was then crossed in 1924 with another American variety called Turkey Red. 
Samples of this wheat were grown and self-crossed before being tested at an agricultural research station at Iwate in northeast Japan. The best plants seem to retain the short stature of Daruma and the high yield of Turkey Red. The station head, Gonjiro Inazuka, selected the most promising lines and in 1935 began to market a true-breeding new wheat variety under the name Norin 10. Local farmers began commercially growing dwarf wheat for the first time. Ten years later, in the aftermath of war, there arrived in Japan an agronomist and wheat breeding expert from Kansas by the name of Cecil Salmon. He was serving on the staff of General Douglas MacArthur, the de facto ruler of Japan. Salmon was intrigued by the dwarf wheats he saw at Morioka Agricultural Research Station in Honshu and sent 16 samples back to the small grains collection in the United States. One of these was Inazuka's Norin 10. Meanwhile, a third wheat breeder, Orville Vogel, at Washington State University in Pullman, was wrestling with a problem caused by Harbor Bosch's nitrate fertilizer. Applied to fields, it caused wheat plants to grow thick and tall. This meant that as soon as the wind blew and the rain fell, the ripening wheat crop would tend to collapse under its own weight or lodge, then lie flat and rotting on the ground. Salmon seeds from Japan came to his rescue via a fourth breeder named Burton Bales. Vogel takes up the story. Being aware of our lodging problems, B.B. Bales sent a collection of semi-dwarf wheats for preliminary observation at Pullman in 1949. From these, Norin 10 was selected to be crossed with Brevor, which at the time was considered to be the most lodging-resistant, high-yielding variety with short straw. Perhaps, reasoned Vogel, even shorter straw would make the wheat less likely to topple, saving it from lodging and allowing it to adapt to the new fertiliser. Sure enough, some of his new Norin 10 crosses, especially the cross with Brevor, proved capable of staying upright while yielding real good, as Vogel's notebook records. The only problem was that they were susceptible to local diseases, so Vogel continued experimenting in search of a less susceptible line before putting it on the market. A fifth wheat breeder now got to hear of Vogel's experiments and asked him for some samples. This was Norman Borlaug, a Minnesotan descended from refugees who left Norway during a potato famine. After an aborted career as a forester, Borlaug was working for the Rockefeller Foundation in Mexico, where his aim was to find varieties of wheat resistant to rust fungus and with good yields. Borlaug and his team were making good progress. At first, even though yields were excellent, no Mexican farmer trusted the new varieties. Eventually, in 1949, Borlaug persuaded a few to plant them and to use fertilizers on them. The news of their higher yields began to spread. Farmers found they could double their yields and double their incomes. By 1951, the wheat crops were swelling all across Mexico. By 1952, Borlaug's wheats dominated the country's wheat acreage and the entire country's wheat production had doubled. Soon, Borlaug, like Vogel, became distracted by the lodging problem. He searched the entire collection of American wheat varieties for one that could resist falling over, without success. On a trip to Argentina, he found himself talking over a drink to the same American government wheat breeder, Burton Bales, who had sent the Norin seeds to Vogel. He asked Bales if he knew of any short-strawed wheats that resisted lodging. Bales told him about Norin 10 and suggested he contact Vogel. Borlaug wrote to Vogel, who sent him both pure Norin 10 seeds and Norin Breva hybrids. Borlaug began crossing them with his Mexican wheats. He got spectacular results. Not only was dwarfness of stature introduced into the crosses from the Norin 10 derivatives, but also a number of other genes had been introduced which increased the number of fertile florets per spikelet, the number of spikelets per head, and the number of tillers per plant. Like Vogel... Borlaug found the new varieties suffered from rust infection, but he had an advantage over the Washington team. He was growing the wheats at two different locations at very different altitudes, meaning that the lower elevation irrigated wheat in the northern Sonora Valley 
could be harvested before the high elevation crop in the central highlands was planted. He was thus able to get two breeding seasons in a year. He tested tens of thousands of varieties for rust resistance. By 1962, Borlaug had a commercially viable variety to offer Mexican farmers with short straw, massive yields if well fertilized, little lodging, and good rust resistance. Mexico was only one country. Enter a sixth wheat breeder by the name of Manzur Bajwa of Pakistan. Bajwa met Borlaug when the latter came to Pakistan in 1960. He immediately applied to go and work with him in Mexico. There, among the crosses, he identified a line of wheat that was short-strawed and rust-resistant to test in the Indus Valley. The new variety caught the attention of the Minister of Agriculture in West Pakistan, Malik Kuda Baksh Bucha. But the Pakistani scientific establishment was scornful, telling Borlaug and Bajwa that the Mexican wheats were unsuited to Pakistan, susceptible to disease, dependent on fertilizer which only made weeds grow, or more fancifully that the genes in the new varieties might sterilize cattle or poison Muslims and were a CIA plot to make the country dependent on American technology. So progress stalled. Across the border in India, a seventh wheat geneticist in this story, Momkombu Sambasivan Swaminatham, had also taken notice. He invited Borlaug to India in 1963 to help persuade his government to embark on a crash program of wheat improvement. It was uphill work. As Borlaug later said, when I asked about the need to modernize agriculture, both scientists and administrators typically replied, poverty is the farmer's lot. They are used to it. I was informed that the farmers were proud of their lowly status and was assured they wanted no change. After my own experiences in Iowa and Mexico, I didn't believe a word of it. The Indian bureaucrats were adamant that Mexican wheats should not even be allowed in the country, let alone encouraged. The biologists warned of devastation and disease if the wheats failed. The social scientists warned of irreversible social tensions and riots if the wheat succeeded and cause some farmers to make more money than others. Thus do innovation's opponents seek any argument, however absurd, to defend the status quo. Yet India should have been desperate for new ways to feed its growing population. Hunger and malnutrition were widespread. Towards the end of the 1960s, after poor monsoons led to famine, Western experts began to write off India as impossible to feed, the ecologist Paul Ehrlich forecast famines of unbelievable proportions by 1975. Another famous environmentalist, Garrett Hardin, said feeding India was like letting survivors of a shipwreck climb aboard an overloaded lifeboat. The chief organiser of Earth Day in 1970 said it was already too late to avoid mass starvation. A pair of brothers, William and Paul Paddock, one an agronomist, the other a Foreign Service official, wrote a bestseller called Famine 1975, arguing for abandoning those countries like India that were so hopelessly headed for or in the grip of famine, whether because of overpopulation, agricultural insufficiency or political ineptness, that our aid will be a waste. These can't-be-saved nations will be ignored and left to their fate. Never have gloomy and callous forecasts been so rapidly proved wrong. Both India and Pakistan would be self-sufficient in grain within a decade, thanks to dwarf wheat. In 1965, with determined support from their ministers of agriculture, India ordered 200 tonnes and Pakistan 250 tonnes of Borlaug's Mexican wheat to plant as seed. Fulfilling the order was a nightmare for Borlaug, as the shipments were held up at the American border on the way to Los Angeles delayed by the riots in the Watts area of the city, and then arrived in Bombay and Karachi in the middle of a brief outbreak of war between the two countries. But the grain reached its destinations just in time for planting, and the harvest was promising. Over the next few years, inch by inch, Borlaug won over his critics, and Pakistan especially began to experience remarkable increases in its wheat harvest. In India, farmers on the ground soon began to see the difference, but the government refused to license the import of enough fertilizer or the construction of fertilizer plants by foreign firms to make the new crops reach their potential. Borlaug's long campaign culminated in a stormy meeting on the 31st of March 1967 with the Deputy Prime Minister and Head of Planning Ashok Mehta. 
Borlaug decided to throw caution to the winds. In the midst of an argument, he yelled, "'Tear up those five-year plans! Start again and multiply everything for farm support three or four times!' Increase your fertilizer, increase your support prices, increase your loan funds, then you will be closer to what is needed to keep India from starving. Imagine your country free of famine. It is within your grasp. Meta listened. India doubled its wheat harvest in just six years. There was so much grain that there was nowhere to store it. In his acceptance speech on being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, Norman Borlaug said that Man can and must prevent the tragedy of famine in the future, instead of merely trying, with pious regret, to salvage the human wreckage of the famine, as he has so often done in the past. This fifty-year story of how dwarfing genes were first found in Japan, crossbred in Washington, adapted in Mexico, and then introduced against fierce opposition in India and Pakistan, is one of the most miraculous in the history of humankind. Thanks to Inazuka Borlaug genetic varieties and Harbour Bosch nitrogen fertiliser, India not only fed itself, proving the forecasts of worsening starvation wrong, but became an exporter. The dwarfing versions of genes in Norin 10, which turned out to be two mutations known as RHT1 and RHT2 that make the plant less responsive to growth hormones, thus changed the world in combination with fertiliser fixed from the air. Rice quickly followed with its own dwarf varieties and higher yields. So did other crops. A determined campaign to blame this green revolution for various environmental and social problems in the country, such as farmer suicides, proved to be fake news. Indian farmers are actually less likely to commit suicide than average Indians. Insect Nemesis In 1901, a Japanese biologist named Ishiwata Shigatana began looking into the cause of a lethal disease of silkworms called Soto, or Sudden Collapse Disease, which had economic implications for the nationally important silk industry. He quickly identified a bacterium as the cause. Little did he realise that nearly a century later, his discovery would lead to a vital innovation that would transform farming practice and make it more environmentally friendly as well as more productive. Insect-resistant crops. The same bacterium was rediscovered and named by a German researcher in 1909. Ernst Berliner was studying flower moths at the Research Institute for Cereal Processing in Berlin. A shipment of flour from a mill in Thuringia contained diseased caterpillars, and the disease quickly spread to the flower moths being bred in the laboratory. Berliner isolated the bacterium behind the infection and named it Bacillus thuringiensis. It turned out to be the same creature that had been killing the Japanese silkworms. Bt, as it came to be known, possessed an ability to kill the caterpillars or any moth or butterfly, because of a gene for producing a crystallised protein that was lethal to such insects. It latches onto receptors in their gut walls and turns those walls porous. By the 1930s, in France, it had become possible to buy Bt in the form of bacterial spores as a living insecticide known as sporine. It remains on the market today under the labels Dipel, Theoricide or Natural Guard, and is mainly used by organic farmers and gardeners because it is not a product of the chemical industry but an example of biological control. It has repeatedly been shown to be harmless to people, the crystal being destroyed by stomach acid in mammals and being unable to fit mammalian receptors anyway. Varieties of the bacterium that can kill flies and beetles were added to the range of products in 1977 and and 1983, respectively. But Bt, though useful in a greenhouse, is not a very cost-effective spray for farmers. Being expensive and patchy in its results, easily destroyed by sunlight or washed off by rain. It also often fails to reach insects living inside the plants, 
such as cotton bollworms or corn stem borers. This is where a Belgian biochemist enters the story. Mark van Montagu was born in Ghent in 1933 at the height of the Great Depression. His family lived in poverty and his mother died giving birth to him. None of his parents or siblings had finished school, but an uncle was a teacher and insisted he not only stay at school but go to university too. He became an expert on the biochemistry of nucleic acids and then, in 1974, together with his colleague Jeff Schell, made a key discovery, the tumour-inducing TI plasmid. This was a small circular chromosome inside a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which was known to have the strange property of inducing tumours in plants, known as crown galls, yet not inhabiting those tumours itself. Three years later, Van Montague was narrowly beaten by Mary Dell Chilton of Washington University in St. Louis to the discovery that the TI plasmid stitches some of its DNA into the plant's own DNA as part of the infection. Given that a few years before, tools had been developed to insert genes from animals or plants into bacteria, for example to make human insulin for diabetics, now the reverse became feasible, to insert bacterial genes into plants. Within six years, in an example of simultaneous invention, teams led by Van Montague, Chilton and Robert Fraley of Monsanto all turned this insight into an invention by showing that agrobacterium could be manipulated to insert any gene into a plant by removing the tumour-inducing gene from the plasmid and replacing it with a gene from a different organism. The result was a healthy plant with a new gene. Agricultural biotechnology was born. It was using TI plasmids that scientists would go on to create many genetically modified crops, including herbicide-tolerant maize and soybeans, and eventually virus-resistant papaya and vitamin-enriched golden rice. Van Montague set up a company, Plant Genetic Sciences, to develop the technology. One of the first candidate genes his colleagues came up with to insert into a plant was the protein from Bt that kills insects, since it was already popular with organic farmers and gardeners. In 1987, in the laboratory, they created a tobacco plant that was normal in every way except that it included Bt's key gene in its chromosomes. It proved lethal to tobacco hornworm, a common pest. Soon the technology was licensed by Monsanto to produce cotton, maize, potatoes and other crops that were inherently resistant to insects. Because the insecticidal protein was within the plant, it would kill caterpillars that bored inside the plant tissues, such as bollworms and root borers, which were hard to reach with sprays. But unlike chemical sprays, it would not affect harmless insect species with no desire to eat the crop plant. It proved to be a triumphantly successful innovation. Almost every cotton garment you buy today is a product of such a genetically engineered plant. Over 90% of the cotton grown in the world is insect resistant. In India and Pakistan, the technology was rapidly adopted by farmers while still illegal, as its benefits became dramatically obvious elsewhere in the world. It was then legalised, and today almost all cotton grown in the two countries is Bt. About one third of the maize, or corn, grown in the world is now insect resistant because of introduced Bt genes as well. In America, where 79% of the corn is now Bt, the cumulative benefit to farm income of this technology over 20 years comes to more than $25 billion. Bizarrely, the organic farming sector refused to approve the new plants, even though they used the same molecules as their own sprays, because of an objection to biotechnology in principle. Because a BT crop is protected without much, if any, spraying, there has been a noticeable increase in wildlife on farms that adopt the BT technology, as well as a reduction in accidental poisonings of farmers themselves by sprays. In some Chinese studies, a doubling of natural insect predators, such as ladybirds, lacewings and spiders, was recorded in Bt cotton fields, meaning better control of all pests by natural predators. 
Research at the University of Maryland has now found that BT crops create a halo effect in which surrounding crops and fields, not growing BT crops, also have reduced pest problems. In the 20 years since the introduction of BT crops, the populations of two common pests, the European corn borer and the corn earworm, both of which attack other plants as well as maize, have fallen so much in three American states that even organic and non-genetically modified farmers are able to use less spray than before, 85% less on peppers. Overall, a comprehensive study of the effect of BT technology concluded that after a billion acres had been planted, there were zero unintended consequences and large benefits for non-target insects. This technology is proving especially useful in developing countries. Africa is currently facing an intense crisis because of the arrival on the continent in 2016 of a pest from the Americas, the fall armyworm, which is now devastating maize crops across the continent. The pest is no longer a problem in Brazil because of the use of BT maize there, but African countries, under pressure from well-funded ideological opponents of genetically modified crops, have been slow to allow BT maize to be grown. These opponents had been especially successful in Europe, discovering in the late 1990s that spreading scare stories about genetically modified crops among easily spooked consumers was a lucrative way of raising funds. To Van Montague's dismay, Europe rejected the technology almost entirely by erecting high and costly regulatory barriers to its deployment, which amounted to a de facto ban. See chapter 11. All pest control eventually runs into the evolution of resistance in the pest, though this has been less of a problem with BT crops than with pesticides. However, the latest generation of BT crops includes sophisticated extra features that ensure that insects will be much slower to develop resistance to the BT protein. So the innovation path that led from the discovery of a bacterial disease in silkworms more than a century ago has led to dramatically reduced crop loss, pesticide use and environmental damage. Most crops are now also herbicide tolerant so that they can be combined with effective weed control without the soil damaging practice of ploughing. Some are also being engineered to be resistant to fungal disease or drought. Others are being engineered to fix their own nitrogen with the help of bacteria greatly improving yields. Yet others are being engineered to remove a metabolic penalty found in all C3 plants, which include wheat, rice, soybeans and potatoes, but not maize, whereby oxygen diverts the photosynthetic machinery into producing a wasteful product. The first such modified tobacco plants had a 40% greater yield and flowered a week earlier in field trials published in 2019. Gene editing gets CRISPR. Highly useful scientific discoveries are almost always, ridiculously often, accompanied by frenzied disputes about who deserves the credit. In no case is this more true than in the story of CRISPR, a genetic technique that the world awoke to in 2012 and which promises wonderful results in agriculture as well as medicine. The dispute is sharpened in this case by the fact that it pits two great American universities on opposite coasts against each other. There is Berkeley in California, where Jennifer Doudna worked, while collaborating with Emmanuel Charpentier, a French professor who had recently moved from Vienna to Umea in Sweden, and Charpentier's graduate student Martin Ginek. And there is MIT in Massachusetts, where Feng Zhang and his colleagues Li Kong and Fei An Ran worked. Both groups had crucial breakthroughs around the same time. Initially, more prizes went to Doudna's group, but a fiercely fought patent battle was eventually won in the courts by Zhang's group. Yet arguably, neither of these huge American universities with their big budgets and luxurious laboratories deserve as much credit as they seek. That should go to a couple of obscure microbiologists working on practical but unfashionable questions about bacteria, one in a university laboratory tackling a problem of interest to the salt industry, the other in an industrial food manufacturing company. The road from the discovery of a biochemical curiosity 
to the invention of a technology, as ever, is long and winding. And in this case it goes not from academia to industry, but at least partly in the opposite direction. Near the town of Alicante in Spain is a large pink lake, dotted with even pinker flamingos. Known as Torrevieja, this 1,400-hectare lake lies below sea level and has been used for three centuries to produce salt. In June, seawater is allowed to flow into the lake. Over the summer, as the water evaporates, salt crystallizes on the floor of the lake and is scooped up by special machines to be cleaned and sold, 700,000 tonnes of it in a year. The pink colour comes from salt-loving microbes of two kinds, bacteria and archaea, which are eaten by pink shrimps, which are eaten, in turn, by pink flamingos. Not surprisingly, the local university's microbiology department has made use of this resource to study salt-loving pink microbes. One archaeal microbe, called Haloferax mediterranei, was first described in Alicante. Perhaps, being such a salt-loving species, it could be used for biotechnology in especially salty places. Francisco Mojica, who was born nearby, earned a doctorate here in 1993 studying the genes of this creature. And he noticed something rather odd. Hidden in part of its genome was a distinctive sequence of the same 30 letters, repeated over and over again, each repeat being separated by a sequence of 35 to 39 letters that was different in every case. The repeat sequence was often a palindrome. It spelt the same text backwards and forwards. Mohika looked in another related salt-loving microbe and found roughly the same pattern, though with a different sequence. He then found it again in 20 different microbes, both bacterial and archaeal. A Japanese researcher had spotted the same pattern in a bacterium in the 1980s, but had not followed it up. Mohika spent the next 10 years trying to understand why this pattern was there. Most of his hypotheses proved wrong. A Dutch scientist, Ruud Janssen, noticed that there were always certain genes near the strange text, known as Cas genes. Janssen coined the name for the pattern, Clustered, Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats, or CRISPR for short. Then, one day in 2003, Mohika had a lucky break. He took one of the non-repetitive spacer sequences between the palindromes from a gut bacterium and put it into a database of gene sequences to see what it matched. Eureka! The answer came back. It matched the gene of a virus, specifically a bacteriophage virus, known as phage for short. These tiny particles, sometimes shaped like minuscule lunar landers from an Apollo mission, are viruses that inject their DNA into bacteria, hijack their cellular machinery, and make more phages. Mohika looked at more spacer sequences and found that many of them came from viruses that infect bacteria. He surmised that he was looking at a microbe's own immune system, in which genes of viral diseases were kept on file by the microbe for recognition and destruction. The Cas genes do the work. It took Mohika more than a year to get his results published. So sniffy were the prestigious journals at the idea of a significant discovery coming from a scientific nobody in a backwater like Alicante. Across the Pyrenees in France, an industrial microbiologist was already taking the next step. Philippe Horvat worked for Rodia Foods, which soon became part of Danisco and later part of DuPont. Yogurt and cheese are fermented milk. They depend on bacteria to eat the milk and convert it into bacterial bodies, which is what we eat. The microscopic domesticated milch cow of the dairy industry is a harmless creature called Streptococcus thermophilus. The average person eats about a thousand billion billion S. thermophilus a year. Big companies that make yoghurt therefore spend a lot of money on bacteriology 
the better to understand their domesticated flocks of microbes. They are especially interested in what happens when the bacteria get sick. Just as a dairy farmer wants to protect his cows against mastitis, so a yoghurt maker needs his streptococci not to get infected with phages. Horvat and his Danisco colleague Rodolf Barangu knew that some cultures of bacteria proved to be more resistant to phage epidemics than others. Understanding why this was the case might help the industry. After hearing about CRISPR at a conference, Horvat had a hunch that it might supply the answer. He soon showed that the bacteria with the most spacers were often the most likely to be the resistant strains, and the ones with spacers derived from a particular phage DNA were resistant to that phage. This proved Mohica right. CRISPR's job, with the help of Cas, is to recognize a particular sequence and cut it, thus emasculating the virus. The next step, or leap of logic, was to think, maybe we human beings can borrow CRISPR for our own purposes. Replace the spacers with a gene we want to excise, perhaps combine it with a new sequence we want to insert, and adapt the microbial system as a genetic engineering tool of uncanny precision. Instead of waiting for nature to throw out better genes as we did in the 1920s, or mutating genes at random using gamma rays as we did in the 1960s, or throwing in specific new genes in the hope in some cases they would land somewhere useful as we did in the 1990s, now we could literally edit the genome of a plant or animal, changing one letter here or one sentence there using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Gene editing was born. In 2017, scientists at the Roslin Institute near Edinburgh announced that they had gene-edited pigs to protect them against a virus called Porcine Reproductive and Respiratory Syndrome Virus, PRRS. They used CRISPR to cut out a short section from the gene that made the protein that gave the virus access to pig cells, thus denying the virus entry. And they did this without altering the function of the protein, so the animal grew up to be normal in every way, but immune to the disease. In 2018, scientists from the University of Minnesota and Calixt, a genetic company, used a different gene editing technique called TALEN to make a wheat resistant to powdery mildew so it needs less fungicide. That same year, Argentinian scientists used CRISPR to snip out part of the polyphenol oxidase gene in a potato, making the potato incapable of turning brown when cut. As of mid-2019, there are over 500 gene-editing products underway in China, nearly 400 in America and almost 100 in Japan. Most of these relate to agriculture, though of course gene editing will be applied in medicine as well. And Europe? Most of the world quickly agreed that gene edited plants should not be subject to the same immensely expensive and delaying regulation as GMO crops, but be treated like conventionally bred varieties. All across Europe, scientists hoped and prayed that the same conclusion would be reached by the authorities there. The European Commission waited two years for the European Court of Justice to opine. The Court's Advocate General argued for liberalisation. But in July 2018, the Court, under political pressure, rejected his advice and ruled that gene-edited organisms must be treated to the same regulation as GMOs, not the much simpler rules applied to mutagenesis crops, those treated with gamma rays or chemical mutagens, in a far more risky process. In 2019, three French scientists reviewed the patenting of CRISPR products and found that Europe was already being dramatically left behind. Whereas America had taken out 872 patent families and China 858, the EU had only taken out 194 and the gap was growing. They concluded it would be a delusion not to consider the GMO bans in Europe as having had a strong negative impact on the future of biotechnology on the continent. 
gene editing is changing fast. Already, base editing, or prime editing, in which DNA bases are chemically replaced without snipping the DNA strand, has begun to appear with far greater accuracy than gene editing. There is no doubt that extraordinary improvements in the yield, nutritional quality, and environmental impact of food crops is going to be possible in the future. Land sparing versus land sharing The immense improvement in the yield of farming during the 20th century, as a result of innovations in mechanization, fertilizer, new varieties, pesticides and genetic engineering, has banished famine from the face of the planet almost entirely and drastically reduced malnutrition, even while the human population has continued to expand. Few predicted this, yet many are concerned that this improvement has come at the expense of nature. In fact, the evidence is strong that the opposite is the case. Innovation in food production has spared land and forest from the plough, the cow and the axe on a grand scale. By increasing the productivity of the land, we do farm. It turns out that this land sparing has been much better for biodiversity than land sharing would have been, by which is meant growing crops at low yields in the hope that abundant wildlife lives in fields alongside crops. Between 1960 and 2010, the acreage of land needed to produce a given quantity of food has declined by about 65%. Had this not happened, pretty well every acre of forest, wetland and nature reserve in the world would have been cultivated or grazed and the Amazon rainforest would have been far more severely destroyed. As it is, the acreage of wild land and nature reserves is steadily increasing, while forest cover has stopped declining and in many places is now increasing, so that overall there has been a 7% increase in tree cover since 1982. By the middle of the current century, the world will be feeding 9 billion people from a smaller area of land than it fed 3 billion from in 1950. Moreover, recent studies have concluded that for a given yield of food, intensive agriculture not only uses less land, but produces fewer pollutants, causes less soil loss, and consumes less water than organic or extensive systems. Now imagine that innovation continues to improve the yields of farms by tweaking the efficiency of photosynthesis, inserting nitrogen-fixing bacteria into plant cells, further reducing losses to insect, fungi and weeds, and diverting still more of each plant's energy into valuable food, all of which are happening, so that the average yield of crops like rice, wheat, maize, soy and potatoes are 50% higher in 2050 than they are now. This is definitely plausible, maybe even probable. That would mean we would cultivate much less land, enlarging national parks and nature reserves, returning land to forest and wilderness, managing more land for flowers, birds and butterflies. We could enhance the ecology of the planet even as we feed ourselves. Chapter 5. Low Technology Innovation When zero is added to a number or subtracted from a number, the number remains unchanged, and a number multiplied by zero becomes zero. Brahma Gupta, the year 628. When Numbers Were New These are the nine figures of the Indians. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. With these nine figures, and with this sign zero, which in Arabic is called zephyrum, any number can be written, as will be demonstrated. Thus did an Italian merchant, around the year 1202, or MCCII, introduce Europe to modern numerals, modern arithmetic, and, crucially, the use of zero. Leonardo of Pisa, today known by the nickname Fibonacci, had travelled as a child from Pisa to Bugia, a port on the coast of North Africa, where his father was the diplomatic representative of the Pisan traders who imported wool, cloth, timber and iron into North Africa, 
while exporting silk, spices, beeswax and leather to Genoa. Fibonacci learned arithmetic in Bugia in the Arab style and probably in the Arab language. And he quickly realised that the Arabic notation, borrowed from the Indians, was far more practical and versatile than Roman numerals. There, from a marvellous instruction in the art of the nine Indian figures, the introduction and knowledge of the art pleased me so much above all else, and I learned from them, whoever was learned in it, from nearby Egypt, Syria, Greece, Sicily and Provence, and their various methods, to which locations of business I travelled considerably, boasted Fibonacci later. There are two features of Indian numbering that are astonishingly helpful. One is the idea that the position of a number in a sequence indicates its size. So 90 is 10 times bigger than 9, whereas X means 10 in Roman numerals wherever it appears in a number. The other feature is that this positional system only works in decimal systems if one of the 10 numerals stands for nothing. The language of mathematics writes Robert Kaplan, comes into its own when zero entered it as the sign for an operation, the operation of changing a digit's value by shifting its place. But a symbol for nothing is bafflingly counterintuitive if you stop to think about it. Nothing of what? As Alfred North Whitehead put it, the point about zero is that we do not need to use it in our daily operations. No one goes out to buy zero fish though I sometimes go out fishing and catch zero fish. Zero turns numbers from adjectives into nouns and becomes a number in its own right. This was an innovation of far-reaching consequence, for sure, but it involved no technology. Considering how indispensable Indian numbers are to modern life and how impossible it would be to live without them, this innovation was extraordinarily important and it is bizarre how late it enters the story of Western civilization. The whole of the classical world, an early medieval Christendom, got by with a system of counting that made multiplication virtually impossible, algebra unfathomable, and accounting primitive. Fibonacci's role in this revolution was forgotten until late in the 18th century, when a scholar by the name of Pietro Cosali studying the work of a great 15th-century mathematician, Luca Pacioli, a close friend of Leonardo da Vinci, noticed that Pacioli, in passing, mentioned that we follow for the most part Leonardo Pisano. Casali sought out this earlier Leonardo's manuscripts and realised that almost all of the mathematical treatises of the intervening centuries were derived more or less directly from his hefty tome, the Liber Abaci. The name Fibonacci was coined in the 19th century as a contraction of the phrase Filius Bonacci, or Son of a Good Bloke, which appeared on the title page of his book. Since Liber Abaci appeared two centuries before the printing revolution and therefore relied on being transcribed, its success as a manuscript had been lost in the mists of time. Fibonacci's work was one of the most influential compositions in all European history garnering him an audience with the Holy Roman Emperor, the intellectually curious but cruel Frederick II, as well as being copied and disseminated all over Europe till Indian numerals had almost entirely displaced the Roman species. The irony is that Indian numbers were not wholly unknown on the northern shores of the Mediterranean, but they were a scholarly speciality, especially in Spain, where Christian monks had borrowed them from the Arabs but only to study mathematics. The works of Al-Khwarizmi, the great expositor of algebra, had been translated into Latin, but for scholars, not merchants. What Fibonacci did was show merchants how to use this arithmetic in everyday commercial transactions. His book was filled with practical questions, each redolent of this world of Mediterranean trade dominated by the Italian city-states and their trading partners in the Near East and Maghreb, such as, if 100 weight of linen, or some other merchandise, 
is sold near Syria or Alexandria for four Saracen Byzants, and you will wish to know how much 37 rolls are worth. Note that this was after the first three Crusades and around the time of the fourth, so plenty of Christian chiefs and priests were living, ruling and fighting in the Near East, but it was a merchant who got the message across. It is notable that this innovation, like so many, comes to us through commerce. Fibonacci, however talented an innovator, was not the inventor, but the messenger. He did invent plenty of mathematics, including the famous Fibonacci series and the golden ratio derived from it, found throughout growing organisms in nature, such as the shell of a snail or the seeds of a sunflower. But he did not invent Indian numbers or zero. His sources were Arab, and the greatest of them was al khwarizmi the mathematician whose name survives into English in the word algorithm. Fibonacci read his work in Latin translation when back in Italy as well as probably in Arabic. Yet al khwarizmi too was not the inventor of much of this, but the compiler and popularizer, as the title of his most important work shows. On the Calculation with Hindu Numerals, published around the year 820. He had played a role in the Muslim world not unlike Fibonacci in the Christian world. He aimed his book at merchants, and he was explaining an innovation that his civilization had borrowed from another. Tracing the trail two centuries further back to the year 628, we find Brahma Gupta, an astronomer living in a kingdom of western India called Gujaradesa, known for its scholarship. He published a book called the Brahma Sfuta Siddhanta, or The Opening of the Universe. Though mostly about astronomy, it had chapters on mathematics and is the first work to treat zero as an actual number rather than as a symbol for nothing as the Babylonians had done. In simple and easily understood statements, Brahmagupta set out the significance of zero and considered negative numbers for the first time, driving the point home in homely terms. A debt minus zero is a debt. A fortune minus zero is a fortune. Zero minus zero is a zero. A debt subtracted from zero is a fortune. A fortune subtracted from zero is a debt. The product of zero multiplied by a debt or fortune is zero. After that, the trail goes cold. The oldest written use of zero as a placeholder when it was a dot is found in the Bakshali manuscript of the 4th or 5th century AD, which was discovered in what is now Pakistan in 1881. Something like it might have been used in ancient Sumer and Babylon, whence it might or might not have travelled east with the Greeks who followed Alexander to India. But there is no evidence before Brahmagupta that zero was being used in its present numerical form and thus transforming arithmetic. But hang on, in the best tradition of parallel innovation, there is evidence that the Mayans invented zero around the same time as Brahmagupta, perhaps earlier. In their 20-based counting system, used for the Mayan long calendar, there was a glyph that stood as a spacer, somewhat like the Hindu zero. It proved to be a dead end. The Mayan civilization collapsed and took its best arithmetical idea with it. Could the same have happened in the old world? Fibonacci was a contemporary of Richard the Lionheart, Saladin and Genghis Khan, all bloodthirsty warriors. Warfare, religious fanaticism and tyranny were on the march. Two great capitals of learning had recently turned their back on freedom of thought in favour of mysticism, Baghdad under Al-Ghazali and Paris under St. Bernard of Clairvaux. India, too, was a battleground between Islamic and increasingly fundamentalist Hindu dynasties. China was crushed by Mongol armies. Perhaps it was just as well that Fibonacci took zero across the sea to Pisa and the other city-states of northern Italy, where commerce thrived and people cared for more practical enterprise, for buying low and selling high, rather than glory or God. Fibonacci's innovation coexisted with other ways of counting and accounting for centuries, 
counting boards, tally sticks, the abacus. Even on paper, it sat alongside Roman numerals. In the 14th century, ledgers would sometimes have columns of Indian numbers and paragraphs of Roman ones intermingled or taking turns. Yet gradually, numbers won, especially in the preparation of merchants' accounts. Commerce led the way. By the time Luca Pacioli wrote his great treatise on double-entry bookkeeping in 1494, making clear just how vital Fibonacci's innovation was for mathematicians as well as accountants, Roman numerals were used mainly for dates and monuments, as they still are today. I have seen people write 7II19 for a date atop a letter. The Water Trap I walk a lot in London, and a few months ago I set myself a goal. Somewhere in the vast city, while walking down a street to catch the smell of sewage. I have yet to achieve this goal. Close to 10 million defecations occur in London every day, presumably, since for most people it is a daily occurrence. I hazard that I am rarely more than 100 feet from somebody actively at work on this task. According to the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, the volume of sewage produced in London is more than a billion litres every day, 400 billion litres a year, or enough to fill 10 million standard swimming pools. Yet you never smell it. Why not? This is a new phenomenon, an innovation. In past eras, cities smelled richly of sewage all the time, and you would be hard-pressed to walk down a street without seeing it, or stepping in it, let alone smelling it. Today, sewage is still there, all around us, yet kept so entirely separate from us that we never even smell it, let alone see it. It is taken away, treated, and disappears, almost wholly unseen. When you think about it, this is quite an achievement, one of the finest of our civilization. Lots of innovations contribute to this, most of them simple and low-tech, such as sewers themselves. Perhaps the neatest innovation is the S-Ben, or U-bend, in the pipe beneath every toilet, which traps water so as to prevent any smell coming back up the pipe. It's gorgeously simple and exquisitely clever. It transformed the flush toilet into a strong competitor against the chamber pot. Flush toilets were tried many times before, beginning with a device invented in 1596 by Sir John Harrington, a godson of Queen Elizabeth I, who had one installed in Richmond Palace. Harrington even wrote a book about it, with the punning title The Metamorphosis of Ajax, Jake's being a contemporary term for toilet. The Queen had the book hung from the wall in the privy, presumably as loo reading. But it did not catch on. Flush toilets were expensive and unreliable, and they had the huge disadvantage that they took away the sewage, but not its smell. Carrying a chamber pot out of the building worked much better in that regard. The S-Bend is one of those things that could have been invented at almost any time by almost anybody. It ought to be the classic case of a journeyman plumber doing something that had evaded brilliant thinkers. Yet, surprisingly, it is the product of a fine mathematical mind at the height of the Enlightenment. His name was Alexander Cumming and he was mainly a maker of clocks and organs, though he also wrote disquisitions on carriage wheels and dabbled in pure mathematics. We know nothing of his origins beyond the fact that he was born in Edinburgh and came to London to win the patronage of King George III, for whom he made an ingenious pendulum-driven barometer clock that recorded the air pressure on a paper chart. His chronometers were so good that the Arctic explorer Constantine Phipps named a small island after him, north of Spitsbergen. Apart from that, there is not a lot to say about Mr. Cumming. He was granted a patent on a water closet upon a new construction. It included many of the features we know today, most critically the S-trap. It flushed from an overhead cistern, and a little water remained in the double bend of the pipe to act as a barrier to smell. However, 
Coming included a feature that was quite unnecessary and proved troublesome, a sliding valve across the base of the bowl above the S-trap that had to be opened and closed by a lever. This leaked. It also jammed, especially in frosty weather, and most toilets were out of doors in privies in those days, or when it had rusted or become encrusted with scale. So coming like Harrington, saw his invention only slowly adopted. Three years later, in 1778, the water closet was transformed by another innovator, Joseph Brahma. The son of a Yorkshire farmer, born in 1749, Brahma had a string of inventions to his name in many different fields. His most important was hydraulics, so crucial to much machinery today, though in fact it was his even more talented employee, Henry Maudsley, who contributed the crucial ideas. His most famous is the Brahma Lock, also built by Maudsley. It was virtually impossible to pick, as demonstrated by Brahma's firm offering a prize of 200 guineas to the first person to do so. It remained unclaimed for nearly half a century, till 1851, long after Brahma's death, and then only when an American lock-picking empresario named Alfred Hobbs spent more than a month achieving the feat with a clutch of specially made instruments. By then, Brahma's firm had a new version of the lock. After a leg injury as a teenager left him permanently lame and unfit for farm work, Brahma discovered a talent with woodworking, serving his apprenticeship as a joiner and moving to London to work as a cabinet maker. He was employed by a Mr. Allen, who was probably used by Cumming to make a cabinet to hold his water closet. Allen improved the water closet by causing the water to spiral around the bowl when flushed. Around this time, Brahma had another accident, and while laid up, turned his mind to improving the water closet further. He patented his design in 1778 with a hinged flap instead of a sliding valve, and a series of other tweaks to the design. What is more, he brought his own exquisitely high standards of craftsmanship to the product, and it began to sell. Brahma set up in business and was soon installing six water closets a week for the wealthy, at over £10 a time. The success of the product was proved by the fact that others soon copied it, and Brahma took several to court. One case in 1789 set legal precedent. The defendant, a Mr. Hardcastle, argued that Brahma's patent was too vaguely worded, including features that were not novel and, crucially, had been published before. The argument on this latter point was that Brahma had built three water closets to his design and tested them before applying for the patent. The judge ruled in favour of Brahma, stating, perhaps from practical experience, that the design worked better than any previous one. The indoor water closet really only took off as a must-have item towards the end of the 19th century. The building of a vast new sewer system in London meant that at last water closets had somewhere to send waste to, even from the humblest house. The antipathy of many people to having WCs indoors began to change. Thomas Crapper, a Yorkshire plumber who set up shop in London in the 1860s, was an entrepreneur who capitalised on this new demand. He invented little but improved the water trap by making it more of a U-bend rather than an S-bend, rendering it less likely to block. He improved the siphon system from the cistern and the ballcock mechanism, a British peculiarity, to prevent the cistern overflowing. But his real achievement was to make water closets reliable, simple and affordable and lend his very name to them, even though, strangely, the verb to crap was much older. Crinkly Tin Conquers the Empire Disliked for its ugliness, overlooked for its ordinariness, and so old it is hard to think of it as an innovation. Corrugated iron is an unlikely hero. Yet it was a novelty once, invented in 1829, and has arguably been a greater benefit to human beings than many a more glamorous thing. It has sheltered countless millions of people from the rain and the wind, and has done so more cheaply and effectively than far more celebrated architecture. It has kept the poor alive in shanty towns, favelas, and slums. 
in the form of Anderson shelters. It has saved lives in bombing raids. In California, Australia and South Africa, it was indispensable for gold miners erecting instant towns. In Australia, it proved to be popular with both settlers and natives, who called it the white man's bark. At one point, it was so fashionable that architects built churches out of it. Prince Albert added a ballroom to Balmoral in corrugated iron. As innovations go, the story of corrugated iron is comparatively simple. It appears to have been invented by one person, unchallenged by rivals. He was a trained engineer, not an obscure genius or a brilliant scientist. His patent went unchallenged, and when it expired, the product quickly grew and grew as an export industry. It was improved at various points in history, mainly to make it more resistant to corrosion, but it remains essentially the same design today as it was at the start. The inventor was Henry Robinson Palmer. His other ideas were both far ahead of their time, the monorail and containerization. Born in 1795 in East London, the son of a parson, he apprenticed as an engineer, worked for ten years for the great civil engineer Thomas Telford, and was a founder of the Institution of Civil Engineers. In 1826, he was appointed to oversee the extension to a dock in East London. Having finished the excavation and construction of the locks, he turned his attention to the buildings. He seems to have hit upon the idea of using an iron sheet for the roof of an open shed, but to make the sheet stronger, he passed the wrought iron through rollers to give it a sinusoidal wave. On the 28th of April, 1829, he patented the use or application of fluted, indented or corrugated metallic sheets or plates to the roofs and other parts of buildings. This immensely strengthened the iron sheet, making it more rigid and capable of spanning a wide gap without extra support while supporting a load such as snow. Crinkly tin was born. At the dock, the corrugation was done on site, and the first building erected with a curved, self-supporting cast-iron roof. George Hebert, editor of the periodical Arts and Sciences, visited shortly afterwards and was much taken with Mr. Palmer's newly invented roofing. The grooving, or as we might say, arching and counter-arching, confers great strength, Hebert accurately reported, so that a sheet of metal just one-tenth of an inch thick could provide a sturdy roof spanning 18 feet. It is, we should think, the lightest and strongest roof for its weight that has been constructed by man since the days of Adam. Corrugated iron has evolved continuously since then with scores of patents on improvements. For instance, within ten years, the process of galvanization invented by Stanislas Sorel in France protected iron from rusting with a thin layer of zinc and gave corrugated iron a much longer lifespan. Later in the century, steel replaced wrought iron as the main ingredient. But the basic design barely changed. Palmer sold the patent to his assistant, Richard Walker, who, together with his sons, was to dominate the industry for decades. He grew wealthy before the patent expired in 1843. Only after that did the market rapidly expand as the price came down. Intellectual property therefore merely served to delay the innovation, as usual. By 1837, Walker was advertising corrugated iron for use in Australia, a continent that would come to embrace the material more than any other. Australia is, beyond doubt, the spiritual home of corrugated iron, wrote Adam Mornament and Simon Holloway in their 2007 History of the Material. Its resistance to termites and fire, its lightweight and its prefabricated nature in a country with scarce labour, all of these recommended corrugated iron to the colonists of the Australian continent. The gold rush of the 1850s in Victoria resulted in growing demand for quick-fix new building materials, and soon entire towns of corrugated iron were springing up in the gold fields. In 1853, Samuel Hemming shipped a complete church from London to Melbourne for £1,000 from where it was transported to Gisborne by bullock cart and erected for a further £500. By 1885, Australia was the largest market for the stuff in the world 
and in the 1970s it was an Australian firm, BHP, that patented zinc loom steel, a corrugated material made of steel but coated in 55% aluminium, 43.5% zinc and 1.5% silicon. This is more resistant to corrosion than normal zinc-coated steel. Recently, corrugated iron's place in Australian history has made it a trendy material for architects and artists. The opening of the Sydney Olympics included a specially composed tin symphony in its honour, while the artist Rosalie Gascoigne used the material in her sculptures. From Australia, the habit of building in corrugated iron spread to Africa, where the gold mining boom of South Africa in the late 1800s depended heavily on corrugated iron manufactured in Australia, shipped to Durban and carried inland by teams of porters to make anything and everything. Roofs, walls, water tanks, whole buildings. In the Boer War, the British built blockhouses of double skins of curved corrugated iron, the space filled with shingle, to defend railways. From the trenches of the First World War to the whaling stations of South Georgia, corrugated iron was a vital part of 20th century construction. The Nissen Hut, a semi-cylindrical shelter of corrugated iron on a steel frame, invented by Norman Nissen, an American engineer, proved a cheap, safe and quick building in both world wars. In the slums of today's expanding megacities, where property rights are uncertain, corrugated iron is not only affordable and available, but buildings made of it can be easily dismantled and moved. It is one of the first things shipped into earthquake zones to provide shelter in short order. It has probably also saved a lot of forests, since it requires so much less timber support than many other building materials. It may never be loved or admired, and the drumming of rain on roofs made of it may not be the sweetest of sounds, but it was a simple innovation that certainly changed the world. The Container That Changed Trade The Warrior was a normal cargo ship contracted by the U.S. military to carry a typical 5,000-ton cargo on an unremarkable voyage from Brooklyn to Bremerhaven in Germany in 1954. The cargo consisted of 194,582 items. Cases, cartons, bags, boxes, bundles, packages, pieces, drums, barrels, crates, vehicles and more. They arrived in Brooklyn in 1,156 shipments from 151 American cities. Loading took six days, including one lost to a strike. The voyage took almost 11 days. Unloading took four days. Port costs accounted for 37% of the total shipping cost of £237,577, whereas the sea voyage itself cost just 11%. We know all this because of a government-sponsored study of this one cargo, cited by Mark Levinson in his book about the invention of container shipping, The Box. The study's conclusion was that in tackling the high costs of ports, perhaps the remedy lies in discovering ways of packaging, moving and stowing cargo in such a manner that brake bulk is avoided. Within a few years, containerization was an innovation that transformed the world. It was a momentous innovation, but it involved no new science, no high technology, and not much new low technology, just a lot of organization. In the mid-1950s, shipping goods by sea was almost as expensive, slow and inefficient as it had been for centuries. Despite faster engines and bigger ships, the ports were costly bottlenecks. More than half the cost of exporting or importing consisted of port costs. The warrior voyage was unusually good value in this respect because of low labour costs in post-war Germany. The dockers or longshoremen who handled the work earned relatively good wages for manual workers, but the job was labour-intensive, dangerous, uncertain, irregular in hours and exhausting. Cargoes were deposited on the quayside, sorted, stored in warehouses, piled on pallets, slung by cranes aboard ship, unloaded from pallets and stowed largely by hand into holds that were usually curved and variable in shape, making the securing of a cargo as much an art as a science. Forklift trucks and cranes helped, 
but a great deal of elbow grease did most of the work. The whole process was repeated on arrival at the other end, with customs inspections added in. International trade as a percentage of the economy in the United States had actually been shrinking since the 1920s, largely because of the costs incurred in ports. Union-closed shops had recently done away with the bribery and violence that accompanied the scramble for irregular work at docks, but at a cost of higher charges. The quantity of cargo handled by a single man in a year fell during the 1950s in the ports of Los Angeles, New York and London, even as wages rose. The idea of standard containers, boxes of uniform size and shape, preloaded at factories with goods and lifted on and off ships without being opened, was not new. Railways had been experimenting with standardised containers for decades, and trucks too. An American firm called Sea Train Lines had started using specially designed ships to carry railway boxcars in 1929. But the results had so far been disappointing. The containers were either too big to fill quickly, so they sat around at factories, or too small to be much help, their own weight adding to the cost of the cargo. They wasted space by not fitting neatly into holds, or being half empty. Cargo containers have been more of a hindrance than a help, a leading shipping executive concluded in 1955, just in time to be proved dramatically wrong. Then came Malcolm Maclean. Born in 1913 in the landlocked town of largely Scottish-descended folk, Maxton in North Carolina, Maclean was one of those ambitious, risk-ready entrepreneurs who make getting rich look simple. Working at a fuel station, he realised there was good money to be made transporting fuel, so in 1934 he borrowed an old tanker and started trucking. Within a year, he owned two trucks and employed nine drivers with their own trucks. By 1945, his business had 162 trucks and earned $2.2 million. McLean knew how to get round the fussy interstate commerce regulations, and his mostly self-employed drivers were less prone to strike than those of his competitors. They earned bonuses for not having accidents, which kept repair costs down. To save money, he switched to diesel early and pioneered conveyors to move cargo between trucks. By 1954, he had over 600 trucks, financed by a lot of debt. By then, he had had an idea. Coastal shipping was in decline, not having recovered from the war, whereas the roads were increasingly congested. Why not drive his trailers onto ships and have rigs pick them up at ports nearer their destination? With a high appetite for risk, he sold the truck business and bought a big shipping business instead with borrowed money, effectively inventing the leveraged buyout. But then he had a better idea. Instead of putting whole trailers on ships, why not lift the bodies of the trailers off the wheels and stack them on the ships instead? He tested the plan on paper with a shipment of beer from New York to Miami and found it could cut the cost by 94% compared with brake bulk cargo. The legend that grew up around this story is that McLean, like Archimedes and Newton, had a sudden moment of inspiration while waiting for a truck to be unloaded at a port back in the 1930s. Like all such stories, it is false, though hard to kill. As Levinson recalls, having studied the history, To my consternation, though, I quickly learned that many people quite fancy the tale of Maclean's dockside epiphany. The idea of a single moment of inspiration of the apple landing on young Isaac Newton's head stirs the soul, even if it turns out to be apocryphal. In contrast, the idea that innovation occurs in fits and starts, with one person adapting a concept already in use and another figuring out how to make a profit from it, has little appeal. Why do such heroic myths persist? Perhaps the truth is that people like to think they too could become heroes with a single leap of imagination. Such magical thinking is deeply misleading as to the character of most actual innovators. The facts are less remarkable but more daunting, and Maclean is a case in point. Maclean bought an oil tanker, the SS Ideal 10, 
and converted her to carry containers on a specially designed deck. He bought two cranes and converted them to lift containers. And he commissioned the construction of a fleet of 33-foot containers. He then spent two years persuading the authorities in the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Coast Guard that the ship was safe while fighting off spoiling actions in the courts by railways and truckers. On the 26th of April, 1956, the Ideal 10 set sail from New Jersey to Texas with 58 containers on board. It took seven minutes to lift each container on board and just eight hours to load the ship. By the time the voyage was over, McLean reckoned it had cost less than 16 cents a tonne, compared with $5.83 a tonne for normal cargo rates. Such enormous cost savings spoke for itself, or so one would think, but McLean's battle was only beginning. The engineering bit went smoothly at first. He used a dock strike in 1956 to redesign six larger ships to hold 226 containers each at his headquarters in Mobile, Alabama. By trial and error, his engineer, Keith Tantlinger, worked out just how much tolerance to allow in the metal cells in the hold where the containers sat. Just over an inch in length and just under an inch in width. Enough to make loading simple, not enough for the container to shift in a storm. Tantlinger used modelling clay stuffed into the space around the containers to prove that they did not shift on the first voyage. Systematically, Tantinger redesigned everything from the truck chassis to the containers themselves and the twist lock that held them together on board to make them quicker to load and unload. The new gantry cranes on board could even load and unload a ship at the same time. The first of these ships, the SS Gateway City, built in Mobile in 1957, could be loaded and unloaded in eight hours, the same time as the Ideal 10 though she carried five times as many containers. The chief obstacles McLean encountered were human ones. In 1958, he sent two of his new ships from Newark to Puerto Rico, where the Longshoremen's Union refused to unload them. They sat idle for four months, till McLean caved in and agreed to unnecessarily large crews of men unloading each ship. The delay cost him all the previous year's profits. Another strike in 1959 caused further losses and brought McLean's business to the brink of bankruptcy. Other shipping companies balked at the hefty investment needed to get into container shipping, especially with an uncooperative labour force, so ports were reluctant to change. The container revolution seemed like a failure. McLean responded by hiring hungry young entrepreneurial people from his former trucking business for the renamed Sea Land Business, to crack the problems. He borrowed more money and built even bigger ships. He started shipping from the East Coast to California through the Panama Canal. He had a stroke of luck when his main competitor on the Puerto Rico route went bust after its buyer took on too much debt. By 1965, Sealand had 15 ships and 13,533 containers. After a long internal battle, the unions eventually came round to mechanisation as it brought more business to ports and better working conditions. On the West Coast, unions even argued that employers were dragging their feet in automating work. The key problem now was standardisation. The United States government and then the International Standards Organisation wrestled for years with what would be the best size and shape for a standard container. By 1965, though, Two-thirds of containers in use did not fit the standards agreed for length or for height. They were either Sealand's 35-foot containers or, in the Pacific, Matson's 24-foot containers, the product of a rival and parallel project done by a firm shipping pineapples from Hawaii to San Francisco. Eventually, though, the industry settled mainly on 20-foot and 40-foot standard lengths. McLean's next breakthrough came with the Vietnam War. The United States built up and supplied its troops in Vietnam with constant difficulty because of the shallow water and inadequacy of the port facilities in Saigon and Da Nang. The military tried again and again to ease the congestion, delay and confusion without much success. It kept getting worse. McLean saw his opportunity 
and badgered the Pentagon to be allowed to build a container port at Camran Bay. He encountered predictable resistance, but his persistence finally paid off in 1967. Sealand constructed a port at its own risk and started shipping 600 containers every two weeks. Suddenly, the supply problems of the military were over. Even refrigerated containers with ice cream aboard joined the rush. Sealand garnered huge sums from the contracts. The restless McLean then spotted an opportunity to send the empty containers back via Japan, where they picked up export goods, thus helping to build the Asian export boom that was to transform the economies of Japan, Taiwan, Korea, China and eventually Vietnam. The military soon gave McLean more contracts for supplying troops in Europe as well, which helped change the attitude of container-sceptic ports in Europe. McLean sold Sealand to R.J. Reynolds in 1970 and soon left the company. He tried various other enterprises, including pig farming and resorts, before buying back into the shipping industry with the purchase of United States lines in 1977. The capacity of container shipping was growing at 20% a year and ships were getting bigger and bigger. Per tonne of cargo, a bigger ship cost less to build, required a smaller crew and consumed less fuel than a smaller one. The only limit was getting through the locks of the Panama Canal. The average speed of container ships dropped during the 1970s as fuel costs rose following the oil crises of 1973 and 1978. McLean saw an opportunity to build 14 large but slow econ ships in South Korea, designed to go continuously around the world in an easterly direction, thus avoiding the problem of returning empty. It was a neat idea, but it did not work. Oil prices fell, and round-the-world timetables proved unreliable. In 1986... McLean Industries filed for bankruptcy with $1.2 billion of debt, the largest bankruptcy in American history at the time. The great risk-taker had taken one risk too many. He was shattered by the experience and shunned the limelight for a while. He died in 2001 at the age of 87, and on the morning of his funeral, container ships all around the world sounded their whistles at the same time. The vast container trade across the oceans that today is vital to the world economy is his legacy. Today, some ships carry more than 20,000 20-foot containers each. They can be unloaded and reloaded in just three days. McLean is the father of modern trade, but invented nothing very novel, let alone high-tech. If he had not made this revolution, somebody else would probably have done it. But. He did it. Was wheeled baggage late? Having lugged heavy bags through train stations and airports in my youth, I regard the wheeled suitcase as one of the pinnacles of civilization. But for something so low tech, it turned up surprisingly late, after the first human beings had landed on the moon. What was to stop somebody inventing the wheeled suitcase in the 1960s? Why was it so late in arriving? The wheeled bag seems to be a good example of tardy innovation that should have happened sooner. Or does it? One day in 1970, Bernard Sadow, a senior executive of a baggage-making company in Massachusetts, went on holiday in Aruba with his family. On the way back, at American Customs, he joined a queue periodically picking up two heavy bags as he shuffled forward. Just then, an airport worker strode past with a piece of heavy machinery on a wheeled trolley. You know, that's what we need for luggage, Sado said to his wife. He went home, took four casters off a wardrobe, and screwed them onto a suitcase. He then attached a leash to the case and dragged it effortlessly around the house. He applied for a patent on rolling luggage, which was granted in 1972. In the application, he wrote, The luggage actually glides. Further, substantially any person, regardless of size, strength or age, can easily pull the luggage along without effort or strain. 
But when Sadow took his crude prototype to retailers, one by one they turned him down. The objections were many and varied. Why add the weight of wheels to a suitcase when you could put it on a baggage trolley or hand it to a porter? Why add to the cost? For several years he got nowhere, till eventually Macy's, the department store, commissioned a line of bags that glide from Sado, and the world gradually followed suit. A glance through the history of patents reveals that Mr. Sado was not the first to try. Arthur Browning had filed a patent on wheeled baggage the year before Sado in 1969. Grace and Malcolm McIntyre had tried in 1949. Clarence Norlin had patented suitcases with retractable wheels, the better to fit into spaces, in 1947. Barnett Book filed a patent for a wheeled suitcase in 1945, and Saviour Mastrantonio had patented a luggage carrier that could be used to roll a bag, satchel, suitcase or the like in 1925. In the accompanying illustration, a carpet bag rolls in front of a glamorous lady in a stripy dress propelled by a stiff, long handle. Clearly the problem was not a lack of inspiration. Indeed, what seems to have stopped wheeled suitcases from catching on was mainly the architecture of stations and airports. Porters were numerous and willing, especially for executives. Platforms and concourses were short and close to drop-off points where cars could drive right up. Staircases abounded. Airports were small. More men than women travelled and they worried about not seeming strong enough to lift bags. Wheels were heavy, easily broken, and apparently with a mind of their own. The reluctant suitcase manufacturers may have been slow to catch on, but they were not all wrong. The rapid expansion of air travel in the 1970s and the increasing distance that passengers had to walk created a tipping point when wheeled suitcases came into their own. A decade later, Sado's design was displaced by a superior innovation, the rollerboard. This was the brainchild of Robert Plath, a pilot with Northwest Airlines. In 1987, he went into his workshop at home and fixed two wheels to one side of the short end of a rectangular suitcase, rather than four to the base of the long side, as Sado had done. A case could now be tilted and dragged semi-upright with the help of a telescopic handle. Plath sold a few to fellow pilots, but ordinary passengers began to notice them and ask about how to get them. So Plath left the airline and set up Travel Pro, which rapidly became a successful business. Four-wheeled versions followed, as well as new aluminium and plastic lightweight versions and wheels that can roll in any direction so you could push as well as pull. Innovation continues to transform the experience of travel. The lesson of wheeled baggage is that you often cannot innovate before the world is ready, and that when the world is ready, the idea will be already out there, waiting to be employed, in America at least. Nothing like this happened in communist Russia or Mao's China. Novelty at the Table The restaurant industry is addicted to innovation. It experiences rapid turnover as once fashionable eating spots give way to new ones, with zero protection from government for those who prefer to resist innovation, zero subsidy for those who wish to innovate, and zero overall strategy from experts. It is as close as you can get to a permissionless innovation system. Restaurants must adapt or die. Some can last for decades and become global brands, though even these are constantly having to adjust to shifts in taste. Others are flashes in the pan, whose formula catches on briefly, if at all. Over the past half century or so, much of the innovation in food has come from importing foreign cooking styles. In 1950, somebody eating out in London would be familiar with French cuisine, but probably not Italian, let alone Indian, Arabic, Japanese, Mexican or Chinese. Today, all those versions of food were on sale in the street market where I bought my samosa lunch today. And Korean, Ethiopian, Vietnamese and other styles 
are not far away. But there is a limit to how many foreign cultures can be found, and this method of innovation will eventually run dry. The restaurant sector has had to get creative in its search for further novelty. There are occasional new ingredients, though not often. The kiwi fruit and the Chilean sea bass, formerly known as the Patagonian toothfish, are two examples of foods not eaten before recent decades. But mostly we still eat things like chickens and potatoes in ever more varieties of ways. There are new ways of preparing food with fancy names like foam or juice and other affectations. There are fusions of styles with mixed Asian cuisines leading the way. There is the rise of vegan food with ingenious ways of recreating the experience of eating red meat. Beetroot is key. Or fish and chips. Banana blossom has surprisingly similar consistency to cod. In some cases, the search for novelty takes on an almost desperate flavour and goes back to older ingredients or styles. Thus, the Danish haute cuisine of the chef René Redzepi, whose Copenhagen restaurant Noma won the San Pellegrino Award for the most innovative restaurant in the world three years running, starting in 2010, relies at least partly on the retro novel idea of combining animals with the plants that grow where they live, such as pork neck with bulrushes, violets and malt. Paradoxically, to recreate the extreme localism of ancient hunter-gatherers therefore becomes an innovation. A study of Noma by two hungry professors of innovation stresses that the main method of innovation here is not de novo invention, but recombination, bringing old things together in new combinations, and that this is a general feature of innovation elsewhere in the economy. Innovation is a process of search and recombination of existing components, a point also made by Joseph Schumpeter in the 1930s. Innovation combines components in a new way. Can this recombination continue indefinitely? Let's assume there are ten different kinds of meat, ten different kinds of vegetable, ten different kinds of spice or herb, and ten different ways of preparing each. This greatly simplifies the actual situation, but still it results in 10,000 possible different dishes. With a more realistic set of numbers, the number of ways of recombining the ingredients becomes astronomical. So there is not much danger that food will eventually become monotonous and stop changing. There are even laboratories working on recipes. El Bulli, a restaurant in Spain, was the first to win both a Michelin star and a Pellegrino award. Its owners, Ferran Adrian and Julie Sola, achieved this by investing in their own research and development facility, in which chefs and food scientists develop new recipes during the winter, when the restaurant is closed, for the next year. The Fat Duck, an expensive restaurant in Britain, even developed a seafood dish called Sound of the Sea, with the sound of waves coming from an iPod Nano hidden inside a seashell after collaborating with psychologists at Oxford University. Those who have studied how chefs innovate report that they follow a process of feed-forward trial and modification, experimenting with variations on a central idea till they hit on a dish that they think will win the approval of customers. It is not very different from the way Thomas Edison improved the light bulb. But food innovation is not just about ingredients and recipes. It's also about the method of eating. Ray Kroc's realisation that simple meals could be prepared to a standard form that could be eaten without plates or forks and the formula rolled out across the world, McDonald's, is a reminder that it is not the invention but the commercialization that makes the difference. Kroc was a travelling salesman trying to sell mixers for milkshakes against stiff competition. One of his customers was a small chain of Californian hamburger restaurants run by Richard and Morris MacDonald that was unusually clean, well-organised and popular. In my experience, hamburger joints are nothing but jukeboxes, payphones, smoking rooms and guys in leather jackets. I wouldn't take my wife to such a place, he wrote. The MacDonald brothers had developed a sort of assembly line approach to preparing meals that was fast and reliable as long as the menu was simple. 
Entering into partnership with the brothers, Croc expanded McDonald's with a franchise model that emphasized uniformity and affordability, while allowing him to keep a tight control of standards, in sharp contrast to the unreliability of fast food in those days. Soon, McDonald's was spawning emulators all across America and the world, and eventually its popularity came to earn the snobbish rage of cultural commentators. There can be no greater accolade. The Rise of the Sharing Economy It might seem odd to describe the sharing economy as low-tech, given its dependence on the Internet. But innovations such as eBay, Uber and Airbnb, none of which were foreseen when the Internet was launched, are actually simple and non-technical concepts from an earlier era made possible by the connectivity of the modern world. People with spare time can pick up people who need car rides. People with spare rooms can rent them out to people who need somewhere to stay on holiday. People with expertise can lend it to people who need it. People with things to sell find people looking to buy things. These activities were happening before the internet, but are becoming much more lucrative and widespread as the world goes online. Not many people saw this coming, though it should have been obvious. Joe Gebbia and Brian Chesky founded Airbnb in 2008. It has now surpassed 5 million properties listed in more than 80,000 towns and cities. The gross revenue to renters probably exceeds $40 billion a year. These numbers suggest that this innovation fulfills a need. By unlocking the potential value hidden away in people's homes, it brings welcome revenue to the person renting out the property. By supplying more properties to rent, it keeps prices lower than they would otherwise be for the person renting. True, it also brings problems, and not just for hotel chains. Cities such as Amsterdam and Dubrovnik have become home rental monocultures and deserts for permanent residents. The sharing economy is a form of more from less, or growth by shrinkage. Economic enrichment caused by using resources more frugally. In the case of car sharing, Many private vehicles stand idle for 95% of their lives. Why not use them a bit more? Other examples of the sharing economy are only just getting started. VIP Kid, founded in 2013 by Cindy Mee, links up students in China with English language teachers in America over the internet. By the end of 2018, it was enabling 61,000 teachers to fill their spare time and 500,000 students to learn English. It is sending about $1 billion a year from Chinese people to American people. HipCamp, founded in 2013 by Alyssa Ravasio, enables people who own land near American national parks to find campers willing to pay to pitch a tent on their land. The sharing economy is the oldest idea in the world, connecting people who have more fish than they need with people who have more fruit than they need. Chapter 6. Communication and Computing There's a law about Moore's Law. The number of people predicting the death of Moore's Law doubles every two years. Peter Lee of Microsoft Research 2015 The First Death of Distance As the three-masted passenger ship Sully pitched and rolled in the Atlantic swell, En route from Le Havre to New York in 1832, one night two of the passengers engaged in a momentous conversation after dinner. One was Charles Thomas Jackson of Boston, a geologist and physician and a bit of a genius, though he spent much of his life, before he went mad, furiously claiming priority for other people's scientific discoveries in medicine, geology and technology. He was about to do so now. The other man was a famous artist, one Samuel Morse. Aged 42, he was well regarded by everybody. He had done many portraits, including several of presidents, except himself, who thought he was out of ideas and past his best. He was still trying to finish his masterpiece, on which he had been working for months, a minutely detailed depiction of the Grand Gallery in the Louvre. But the conversation was not about art. According to Morse's recollection five years later, 
We were conversing on the recent scientific discoveries in electromagnetism and the experiments of Ampere. One of the other passengers inquired whether an electric current could go far down a long wire without being retarded. Jackson replied instantly that Ben Franklin had shown that a current can go as far down a wire as you want, and very fast. In that instant, Morse had an idea. Perhaps the arrival of the current at the far end of a long wire could somehow bring a message. If the presence of electricity can be made visible in any desired part of the circuit, I see no reason why intelligence might not be transmitted instantaneously by electricity. Morse and Jackson then discussed doing experiments to prove this. Five years later, Morse wrote to the passengers and captain of the Sully to get their recollections of that evening. By then he had indeed invented the telegraph, but he was beset by claims from European rivals to have done so before him. He wanted to establish priority. The captain was most helpful. I have a distinct remembrance of your suggesting, as a thought newly occurred to you, the possibility of a telegraphic communication being affected by electric wires. So were two passengers, but not Jackson, who now claimed the insight had been his alone. I do claim to be the principal in the whole invention made on board the Sully. It arose wholly from my materials and was put together at your request by me. This drove Morse into a fury and eventually to law. Samuel Morse did more to shrink the world than anybody before or after him. Thanks to his innovations, messages that once took months could now take seconds to reach their destination. Unlike Jackson, Morse did a series of experiments to try to turn the original idea into a device. A suggestion of using relays from Leonard Gale of New York University proved critical, and by 1838, Morse was able to send the message, A patient waiter is no loser, over a two-mile wire using a code. In a typical example of simultaneous discovery, he was narrowly beaten to the same goal by two British inventors, Charles Wheatstone and William Cook, but Morse's version, using a single wire, was better. Moreover, Morse went on to invent a binary digital alphabet to use on the telegraph, Morse code. Like so many inventors, he then spent years defending his priority, fighting no fewer than 15 court actions over his patents. I have been so constantly under the necessity of watching the movements of the most unprincipled set of pirates I have ever known that all my time has been occupied in defence, in putting evidence into something like legal shape that I am the inventor of the electromagnetic telegraph, he cried in 1848. He achieved final vindication in the Supreme Court only in 1854. Morse's real achievement, like that of most innovators, was to battle his way through political and practical obstacles. As his biographer Kenneth Silverman put it, Morse's claims for himself as an innovator rest most convincingly on the part of his work he valued least, his dogged entrepreneurship. With stubborn longing, he brought his invention into the marketplace despite congressional indifference, frustrating delays, mechanical failures, family troubles, bickering partners, attacks by the press, protracted lawsuits, periods of depression. In 1843, Congress, after a long siege, appropriated a sum for Morse to install the first telegraph wire from Washington to Baltimore. The equipment for insulating and entrenching the wire along the railway proved hopeless, while his partners proved corrupt and untrustworthy. The next year he changed tack and started suspending the wires from poles, with more success. In May he was able to use the half-completed wire to get news of Henry Clay's nomination for president by the Whig Party Convention in Baltimore more than an hour before the train brought confirmation. On the 24th of May 1844, with the line complete, he transmitted a message all the way from Baltimore to the Supreme Court building in Washington a quotation from the book of Numbers suggested by Annie Ellsworth, the daughter of a friend. What hath God wrought? 
The implications of the telegraph's annihilation of distance were instantly understood in a vast country like America. As an official report put it a few years later, Doubt has been entertained by many patriotic minds how far the rapid, full and thorough intercommunication of thought and intelligence, so necessary to a people living under a common representative republic, could be expected to take place throughout such immense bounds. That doubt can no longer exist. It has been resolved and put an end to forever by the triumphant success of the electromagnetic telegraph of Professor Morse. Telegraph wires soon crisscrossed the continent, with 42,000 miles laid by 1855 in America alone. In 1850, the first underwater cable was dropped across the English Channel, wrapped in gutta percha, an insulator derived from the rubber tree. A transatlantic cable followed in 1866, and a submarine cable from Britain to India in 1870, reaching Australia in 1872. Because of its overseas empire, Britain dominated the marine cable-laying industry, and London lay at the hub of a web of submarine cables. Submarine cable capacity increased tenfold in the 30 years from 1870. There was widespread utopian hope about the telegraph's impact on society, as there would be 150 years later for the internet. The wires would make war less likely, keep families in touch, transform the practice of finance and deter crime, commentators speculated. One newspaper, the Utica Gazette, waxed lyrical. Fly, you tyrants, assassins and thieves, you haters of light, law and liberty, for the telegraph is at your heels. Once the telegraph was in use, the telephone was bound to follow at some point. In 1876, in what is often cited as a spectacular case of simultaneous invention, Alexander Graham Bell arrived at the patent office to file a patent on the invention of the telephone, and just two hours later, Elisha Gray arrived at the same patent office with an application for the very same thing. In fact, the two had been rivals in the race to develop a telephone, or harmonic telegraph as they called it, for several years, and there was ample evidence that they were snooping on each other's work and each other's negotiations with the patent office. So this is one of those cases where coincidence is not uncanny, just competitive. In fact, we now know that both Bell and Gray were beaten to the telephone by Antonio Mucci, an Italian who emigrated to Cuba, then New York. He was experimenting with a vibrating diaphragm and an electrified magnet, the key ingredients of the telephone receiver, back in 1857 and filed a patent caveat in 1871. He built lots of devices and even used them to communicate between floors in his house in Staten Island. The reason history forgot Mucci is because, unlike the determined Bell, he raised no money to develop the idea or defend his patents, and his candle factory went broke, leaving him in poverty and bankruptcy. He was an inventor, but not an innovator. The Miracle of Wireless Guglielmo Marconi is unusual among innovators in several respects. First, he was upper class using his butler as a research assistant in his laboratory in a family villa. Second, he was good at both the technical invention and the commercial production of his idea, becoming a leading businessman. And third, he really did get some of his ideas from science, from experiments by Heinrich Hertz, whereas most inventors before that date were engineers or technologists, but not scientists. But in one respect, Marconi was entirely typical. He did a huge amount of trial and error. Marconi was born in an apartment in a palace in Bologna and raised at first in a hilltop villa outside the city. He was the son of a wealthy Italian businessman and an Irish mother from the Jameson whiskey distilling family. His family moved to Bedford in England for four years, then to Florence and then Livorno, where the young Marconi was privately tutored in science. His cousin Daisy Prescott remembered that he was always inventing things as a boy and was obsessed with electricity, both parents encouraging his hobby. In 1888, 
Heinrich Hertz published the results of ingenious experiments demonstrating the existence of electromagnetic waves propagating at the speed of light, as predicted by the physicist James Clerk Maxwell. We just have these mysterious electromagnetic waves that we cannot see with the naked eye, but they are there, he wrote. But as for applications, nothing, I guess. Marconi read about this and began to think that there might be applications in wireless telegraphy to signal Morse messages without cables. There were already several ideas about how to do this over very short distances using electrical induction in the ground, water or air, but none had proved practical. There were also claims to have broadcast signals before Marconi without a full understanding of how, most prominently by an American dentist named Marlon Loomis, who in 1872 patented the aerial telegraph using a kite to produce a disturbance in the electrical equilibrium of the atmosphere. He even got Congress to vote a large sum for its development, but it went nowhere. Quite when and how Marconi did his first experiment is uncertain, because his own later account kept changing as he reinvented bits of his biography. But there is little doubt that by the end of 1895, at the Villa Griffoni, he had sent a signal of three taps across the hillside to a receiver where his assistant fired a gun to acknowledge receipt. Marconi, just 22 years old, promptly moved to London to apply for a British patent on his invention, which he was convinced would make him a fortune. In London, he was assisted by his cousin Mary Coleridge, great-niece of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the author of The Ancient Mariner, and herself a notable writer. Mary introduced Marconi to her close friend Henry Newbolt, then a prominent lawyer and later to become a pillar of the literary and political establishment as an author of patriotic poems. Newbolt immediately realised the promise of the invention, and that the contract Marconi was being offered by an interested firm was much to his disadvantage. He advised him to seek an expert patent lawyer, and secured, through his own social connections, an introduction to Alan Campbell Swinton, later president of the Wireless Society who in his turn introduced Marconi to William Preece of the post office, which was trying to develop communications between light ships. Of course it helped that Marconi was respectable with well-connected family in London, but these people did not have to help him. They did so because they saw a fruitful possibility and wished it well. Like the Telegraph's pioneers half a century before, and the Internet's pioneers a century later, Marconi believed that freeing up global communication could only enhance peace and harmony among peoples. This utopianism was catching. The physicist Sir William Crookes had also foreseen the use of Hertzian waves to transmit information. It fitted with his belief in psychic forces. And he once wrote of using them in improving harvests, killing parasites, purifying sewage, eliminating diseases and controlling weather. Had Marconi not lived, radio would still have come to life in the 1890s. Others, such as Jagadish Chandra Bose in India, Oliver Lodge in Britain, and Alexander Popov in Russia, were doing and publishing experiments that used electromagnetic waves to create action at a distance, though not always for communication. Some, such as Edouard Branly in France and Augusto Rigi in Bologna, were inventing better devices for transmitting and receiving such waves. And then there was Nikola Tesla, the restless genius and inventor of the electric motor, the alternating current, and lots of ideas relating to radio. Marconi was just another experimenter, though a very good one. But thanks to Newbolt, he was quick to patent what he had found as broadly as possible, thus demonstrating that it is the system of intellectual property that contributes to the singling out of individual inventors as much as the other way round. Marconi also knew how to take the devices and ideas of others and put them together in simple and practical form. As his biographer Marcus Raboy puts it, working by trial and error over several months in 1895, Marconi perfected the coherer, invented a stable tapper, increased the efficiency of the induction coil, connected a Morse inker and telegraphic relay to the transmitter and receiver, 
and controlled the resulting electrical sparks. He was also more commercially minded than most of his rivals. In 1897, he transmitted signals across nine miles of water in the Bristol Channel and established stations on the Isle of Wight and in Bournemouth to continue developing and demonstrating the technology. By 1899, he had transmitted a message across the English Channel and by 1902 across the Atlantic from Cape Breton in Canada to Poldhu in Cornwall. His claim to have heard a transatlantic transmission in 1901 with weaker receivers was probably true because it might have bounced off the ionosphere, then unknown, but was widely disbelieved at the time. Within a few years, he was embroiled in exhausting legal battles, especially with the American inventors Reginald Fessenden and Leader Forrest. History records that all of them made key improvements in radio, crucial to turning it into a voice system rather than a Morse system, and that the expensive argument in court was a waste of time. Marconi was slow to see the role that broadcasting would play in the story of radio, thinking of it more as a communication medium. But by the 1920s, the possibilities of broadcasting were undeniable. For the first time in the history of the world, man is now able to appeal by means of direct speech to a million of his followers, and there is nothing to prevent an appeal being made to 50 millions of men and women at the same time, wrote Marconi perhaps beginning to see that his invention had a dark side too. On the 12th of February 1931, at Marconi's side, the Pope launched Vatican Radio in a blaze of global publicity. At a reception afterwards, the Pope thanked both Marconi and God for putting such a miraculous instrument as wireless at the service of humanity. Others of a less benign intent took notice of the Vatican example. It would not have been possible for us to take power or to use it in the ways we have without the radio, noted Josef Goebbels in August 1933. A detailed analysis by a group of economists in 2013 shows that in the elections of September 1930, the Nazi vote share rose less in areas where radios were more numerous because broadcasts generally had a mild anti-Nazi slant Heavy pro-Nazi propaganda began on the radio immediately after Adolf Hitler became Chancellor in January 1933, and only five weeks later, in the last proper elections, radio's impact was reversed. The Nazi vote share increased more in places where more people had access to radios. A similar pattern was observed in the Rwanda genocide of 1993. The more people in an area who had access to the hate radio station RTLM the greater the violence against Tutsis. The Nazis used radio massively to influence Austrians and Sudeten Germans as well as domestically. They developed a cheap radio receiver, the Volksempfänger, or People's Radio, costing 76 Reichsmarks, specially to ensure that they could reach more people. All Germany hears the Führer with the People's Radio, boasted a poster advertising it in 1936. Oswald Mosley tried via his wife to get Hitler's support to broadcast to Britain from Germany. Even in the democracies, where Father Charles Coughlin was using radio to ferment anger against bankers and Jews among his 30 million listeners, while Franklin Roosevelt was using it to sell his policies, the impact of radio on the polarisation of society was huge. Shades of what has happened more recently with social media. Have I done the world a good, or have I added a menace? Marconi asked in 1934. Five years earlier, Mussolini had made Marconi a Marquis. For reasons that are not entirely clear, network television had the opposite effect of radio, bringing people back towards a social consensus, sometimes stiflingly so, rather than polarising them. If there was a moment that encapsulates this shift, it was in April 1954 when the American people got their first glimpse of Senator Joe McCarthy via television. They did not like what they saw and McCarthy's bubble burst immediately. The American people have had a look at you for six weeks. You're not fooling anyone, said Senator Stuart Stymington shortly afterwards. It was this 
centripetal effect that has gone into reverse with the arrival of social media, I think, a polarizing force like early radio. Who invented the computer? If the origin of the steam engine is lost in the fog of the early 1700s, when obscure and impoverished men worked without much